Okay, let's begin. Anne, it's yours. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Jerry. So one aspect that Jerry didn't mention is that uh, all the presentations this morning are twelve minutes, uh, followed by two to three minutes of questions. So I will remind the speaker after ten minutes. Um, so there's seven talks in this session before the coffee break, and uh, five of the seven taking data at the LHC experiments at CERN. Then we have our MUMA experiment close to Nikirat in Belgium, and we have a presentation from Bell in uh, Tsukuba, Japan. So I'm pleased to introduce the first speaker today, Caroline Strasser from the University of Namur in Belgium. Caroline will be introducing the MUMA experiment. It's designed to search for neutrino, to, to neutron interbrain transitions in the context of brain world scenarios. And uh, Caroline will share their first results and their perspectives uh, for the future. Okay, so thank you, uh, Caroline. Good morning, you everyone. Your slides. Good morning. Can I share my slide? Yes. Caroline, I will remind you after 10 minutes. Uh, yeah. Okay, Wait. thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I will begin this morning's session by thinking about the normal experiment. Uh, I will begin by introducing and uh, thinking about the context of the research. The general context of this research is ba based on the idea of an hidden sector. Uh, an hidden sector is an extension of both the standard model of particles and the lambda CDM cosmological model. And the purpose of uh, such hypothesis is to address some shortcomings as, for example, questions of dark matter and dark energy. The hidden sector can take uh, two different forms. Uh, the first one is edification of the standard model content. And in this context, each particle of the standard model has uh, mirror partners, which is sterile. And uh, the second form of the hidden sector is a more geometrical meaning, and it is the brain world hypothesis. Uh, the brain world hypothesis is uh, the idea uh, that our universe is a uh, for space time hypersurface embedded in uh, hyperspace, uh, what we call also a bulk, which is a universe with more than four space time dimensions. And so it requires uh, the existence of extra dimensions. And uh, during this presentation, I will uh, focus on a subclass of hidden sector models. And in this uh, subclass, uh, fermions could uh, exist in both the visible and the hidden states. And in particular, a neutron uh, could have a sterile hidden state, and a mixing could exist between the two states and lead to visible hidden neutron transitions. And uh, thanks to this phenomenon, uh, we could uh, constrain uh, brain world models. Brain world models are often considered in the literature. And uh, in 2010, uh, it was shown that neutrons could undergo fast oscillations between uh, two brain worlds. So in particular, if we have a visible neutron here in our universe or in our visible states, uh, it could leap from our brain, reach another one in the bulk, becoming what we call a uh, hidden neutron with a probability P. And after that, the, this neutron, this hidden neutrons could come back into our visible state or our visible universe with the same probability. And this probability is proportional to G, G squared. And G is here uh, the coupling constant between the two states. And so here, uh, we can, uh, thanks to that, uh, it, it leads to a new phenomenological way to prop brain world scenarios with such a transition. And here the parameter of interest is G, the coupling constant. And G is proportional to uh, the square of the mass of the particle, here a quark, for example. And uh, it is also um, inversely proportional to the energy scale of the brain. And the energy scale of the brain is related to Xi, and Xi is uh, in fact related to uh, the thickness of the brain world in comparison with an extra dimension. We don't know the energy scale of the brain if it exists, 
uh, but it could be at the tear scale, but it could be also at the Planck scale. And the idea here is even if uh, the energy scale of the brain, the brain is at the Planck scale, G can reach accessible values for low noise experiments. Uh, such experiments are called neutron passing through wall experiments, and I will focus on it uh, just now. Uh, the disappearance of a visible neutron into a hidden brain world uh, could be induced thanks to uh, nuclei with high elastic cross section. The cross section of transformation of a visible neutron into a hidden one, uh, thanks to such a nucleus, is proportional to the elastic cross section, the usual elastic cross section of the nucleus, and also proportional to P, the swapping probability of the neutron. And the reverse process is also possible. So we can induce uh, the reappearance of a hidden neutron into a visible one, thanks to uh, the same kind of nucleus, of nucleus. Sorry. And thanks to that, uh, to this phenomenon, which could be possible, uh, we could uh, we could uh, propose this kind of uh, experiment setup, and we, we we propose this kind of experiment setup, uh, which is uh, made of several elements. The first element is a high neutron flux because the phenomenon is very rare, so uh, we need a lot of scatterings. The second element is a converter, and uh, which is made of uh, nuclei with high elastic cross section. And uh, this converter uh, could uh, transform a certain pro proportion of the neutron flux uh, into a hidden neutron flux. And uh, for example, the, the two first elements here could be a nuclear reactor. Uh, the nuclear reactor will provide the high neutron flux and the moderator of the reactor acts as a converter. The central element of such experiment is what we call a wall, but it's in fact a shielding. And the role of this shielding is to isolate the rest of the experiment from uh, the visible neutrons background. Just after the wall, so the hidden neutron flux uh, can pass through the wall because it is not in our state. And just after the wall, we have the regenerator, which is also made of nuclei with uh, high elastic cross section. And uh, it is if the phenomenon is possible, the regenerator will um, regenerate a certain part of the hidden neutron flux into a visible neutron flux to be detected thanks to a neutron detector here. And uh, as you can see here, the expression of the hidden neutron flux, which is given here, is proportional to the swapping probability P. I will come back on the swapping probability P just after, but it is very small. And uh, the neutron rate regenerated uh, by the regenerator is also proportional to P. So at the end, we have something which, which is proportional to P squared. And the idea with such experiments is to, uh, we, we, we if we consider a nuclear reactor, is to uh, make uh, measurements uh, during cycle of the core and also measurement uh, during a uh, shutdown peri period of the core and see uh, if we have some extra signal during the cycle of the core. And if we have such extra signal, it could be lead to a new physics. That's the idea. And here uh, at the at the IL in 2015, an experiment like this has been carried out. And in this experiment, the regenerator was in fact a detector. And it, it was an helium-3 uh, proportional counter. And this experiment uh, uh, made possible to uh, to find uh, this, con this constraint on the neutron swapping probability p. And as you can see, it is very small. And here I will focus on a new experiment that we, we call MURMUR, which is an improved uh, detector placed for the moment near the BR2 nuclear core at Mull in Belgium. And it's also a collaboration. And the aim of this collaboration is to constrain brain work cosmological scenarios, thanks uh, to the MURMUR measurements. And the major improvement of uh, this experiment is uh, a no subtraction, uh, thanks to measurements uh, made during shutdown and cycle periods of the core, and also a regenerator which is now separated from uh, the detector and which is made of 50 kilograms of lead. 
and we have also a, a better uh, noise discrimination. Uh, now I will uh, I will describe the murmur detector. So here we have a complete view and a sectional view. Uh, the detector, the neutron detector is here. It's an helium three proportional counter. And the, the neutron detector is surrounded by a LED, a block of LED. And uh, LED is the regenerator. And the hole is surrounded by a shielding, which is a boron carbon shielding. Uh, we, ha we have here uh, all uh, the dimensions of the experiment. And at the top of the detector, we have a plastic uh, sampiator, uh, which acts as a veto because muons could uh, directly inside the LED uh, induce fast neutrons uh, due to spallation, and which is obviously a, a source of background for us. Uh, the experiment is just here, near the BR2 nuclear core, uh, which produce the high neutron flux. And the, the moderator of the core is a, a matrix of beryllium, which acts as converter for us. And uh, at the beginning of, uh, of this experiment, uh, we have an extra signal uh, where uh, when the um, uh, during cycle of the core, but it was simply due to fast neutrons, which was not completely stopped by the, the shielding uh, in the boron carby. So we added uh, an extra shielding here in green, which is paraffin uh, between the core and murmur. And thanks to this extra shielding, uh, Caroline, uh, you have two more minutes. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, and thanks to the extra signal, we, we, we didn't measure uh, extra signal. So thanks to this measurement, we can put uh, a new constraint on the swapping probability. And I will uh, finish uh, by the first result of this experiment. So we can find this, um, this, uh, this constraint on the neutron rate in the detector, which is better than a factor of four than the previous experiment at the ILL. And thanks to these measurements and also thanks to some simulations, we can find a new constraint on the swapping probability P here. And uh, as you can see, it is better than the previous constraint, but it is also not far better. And it is, ex it is explained uh, by the fact that the BR2 efficiency to produce hidden neutrons uh, is weaker than at the IL than a factor seven. But thanks to the lead as a regenerator and also thanks to the noise subtraction, uh, it makes possible to, to give a, a similar constraint than the previous one. And thanks to this kind of, um, of measurement, we can uh, constrain brain world scenario and rule out uh, a certain range of parameters. That's the idea behind. And I will finish by some perspectives. Uh, some improvements of the experimental setup are planned, uh, as for example, uh, the addition of a shielding, extra shieldings, uh, boron um, cadmium and uh, polyethylene, and also the addition of plastic scintillators by the side of the experiment in order to mitigate, mitigate the neutrons background due to muons in the matrix of lead. And why not the test of the detector near the, the nuclear core of the ILL in order to benefit benefit of their high neutron uh, Yes, uh, that's all. And I thank you very much. And I also thank you, the organizer, to give me the opportunity to give this talk. Uh, I don't have a Zoom room. I don't know why it's... Uh... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Caroline. Merci. Okay, super. Thanks for sharing that. Are there any questions for Caroline? Maybe uh, I would like to ask if I can, uh, if the, uh, what is the neutron flux that you have uh, from the reactor? Uh, uh, sorry, neutron flux. Uh, uh, sorry, from, from the reactor, what is the neutron flux? Yes, uh, it is uh, 10 uh, exponent uh, 15 uh, neutrons by centimeter square and sedent. Okay, thanks. And the second question, uh, is this P, the probability, somehow dependent on the energy of, energy of the neutron? Uh, we use here um, thermal neutron, but uh, it is not related to the energy. So, but uh, the calculation was made for the moment for a neutron which have a low energy, but it could be also the case with uh, high, uh, high, high energy neutron. So, but for the moment we only use uh, thermal neutron because it is easier for the moment for us to do the calculations. Okay, thanks.
with scintillator. You will also um, read out those scintillators. Sorry. I don't hear you. Uh, sorry, my connection seems to be unstable. Okay. You hear me now? Yeah. Okay. If you go to your outlook, to your perspectives. Yeah. On uh, the, uh, the addition of the plastic scintillators uh, to the sides of the experiment, you will, you will measure the amount of, um, of background from, from muons as well. You will uh, instrument yeah. those scintillators, yeah. It is an anti-coincidence anti system. So when we measure uh, muons in the scintillator, uh, the, the even the neutron detected in the helium-3 detector are suppressed from our data. Okay. okay, okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so I think more questions can go to the Mattermost channel. And uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Um, Caroline, you can yeah stop sharing. Yeah. Super. Okay, so our next speaker, um, I could call him a, a Czech local, Benedikt Bergman from the Institute of Experiment and Applied Physics uh, in Prague, Czech Technical in University in Prague. And Benedict will present for us Time Picks 3 as a solid state, a time projection chamber in particle and nuclear physics and, and give us also some applications. Okay, thank you, uh, Benedict. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. So as, I, as already said, I will describe the time picks three and uh, how it can be used as solid state time projection chamber. I'm not sure if I will have time for some uh, applications in particular nuclear physics, but uh, I put it in some additional slides. So if you are interested, you can have a look at the slides and uh, contact me through the chat. Okay, so the main protagonist of my talk is the Time Pix 3 detector. It was developed in the Medipix collaboration at CERN. And it basically consists of 256 by 256 pixels with a pixel pitch of 55 microns. So since it's a hybrid pixel detector, you can have different uh, sensor materials with the same readout ASIC. And uh, the most typical materials which are used is silicon, cadmium telluride or cadmium zinc telluride and gallium arsenide. I will show some results later from silicon and from cadmium telluride. The features of this chip are that uh, it features a data-driven readout scheme, which means that only the pixel which sees some event is read out, all other pixels stay active. And this uh, scheme can be used up to 40 mega hits per square centimeters and second. Moreover, in each pixel, we can measure simultaneously the energy, which is the TOT and the time in each pixel. And uh, what is most important for this work which I'm presenting is that we have a time resolution around two nanoseconds or better than two nanoseconds, which finally allows to measure the drift times of charge carriers in the, in the sensor layers. So to, to reconstruct the particle trajectories in 3D, we use a similar principle as it is used in time projection chambers. But whereas uh, time projection chambers are gas filled, um, we have a semiconductor device, which means we actually profit from the speed of operation and also from a higher stopping power. So if we have an ionizing particle passing through the sensor layer, you will create uh, electrons and holes in the depleted area. And uh, these charge carriers finally start to drift through the sensor layer. So that depending on interaction depth, the signal at the pixels is induced at different times. Uh, in order to understand this process, we had a look at the charge carrier drift motion, which is described by the equations given here. So the drift velocity is given by the charge carrier mobility times the electric field. Um, as I said, I used silicon and cadmium telluride detectors. So for silicon, the electric field in the set direction is uh, assumed to be linear in set. And for the cadmium telluride, I simply use kind of constant. Uh, second thing which uh, we should understand is the kind of small pixel effect. So if you look at the Ramos theorem, it tells you that uh, the induced charge at the pixel is given by the uh, difference in the weighting potential from the start point and the end point of the charge carrier times its charge, of course. And uh, here is the weighting potential for a, a exemplary for a two millimeter thick sensor with 55 micron pixel pitch. And what you should see here is that the highest signal is created if the charge carriers have passed through the whole sensor and are close to the, uh, to the pixels, uh, pixel side. Um, using these, uh, these equations, 
I could do a kind of a numerical simulation and create a lookup table which link the measured timestamp and the measured energy to the interaction depth set. Uh, for more information, I would uh, uh, recommend to, to have a look at these uh, papers here or also to contact me, I can explain it. Um, to check if this uh, works as expected, we have done some, some measurements at the SPS at CERN and also just in our lab with cosmic muons. And we had pion beams of 120 GeV and 40 GeV. And the experimental setup is shown here on the uh, picture. So we have the time peaks three and it is irradiated by a pion beam at an angle of, of 60 degrees. Uh, if you look at the output of the data, it, it looks in the 2D projections, which we get. We have the time over threshold, so the energy information, which is shown here on the left. And we have the drift time information on the right. And what you can also already see from this um, drift time is that with increasing distance to the set, you get uh, higher drift time measurements. And these results are for 500 micrometers, six silicon center. Um, now using the a methodology described, I could do the reconstruction of these tracks in 3D. I show some example of the pion tracks here on the left. So uh, you see pion tracks and I selected the ones which had long outgoing delta rays. And uh, since I knew what was the angle of, of impact of the pions, we could also estimate the set resolution, which was around 30 micrometer. And we could see how well the uh, drift time model describes the reality. And here we found out that there is a systematic uncertainty present, which is in the order of 25 micrometers. Uh, here on the right is an example of a cosmic muon, which is measured in our lab. So uh, I did a 3D fit to the, to the reconstructed track. And then you can uh, look at the deviation of the measured points to the fit. And you can see that this is described by a Gaussian with a sigma of around 55 micrometers. This indicates kind of the precision you can get in 3D for each point. Um, in the second measurement, we used a thicker detector, so a two millimeter thick cadmium telluride sensor. And this time the pion beam energy was uh, 40 GeV. Uh, with cadmium telluride, things are not as easy as with the silicon because you also have charge calyosis due to incomplete charge collection. So um, we had to correct uh, this. But uh, luckily, since we measured the set coordinate and the charge collection efficiency simply depends on set, it was possible to correct this. Um, with this two millimeter thick cadmium telluride detector, we were able to achieve a set resolution of, of 60 micrometers. Um, to separate the pion tracks from delta rays, we use this half line detection or half line transformation. So we get the track length and then we can easily calculate the stopping power by energy divided by track length and the density of the cadmium telluride. So this, this uh, half line result is shown here with the blue lines. Uh, if you look at the data from, from the test beam, we do not only see um, pions, but we can also see other particles. So here is an example of what I call electron-positron-like events, which could be, for example, due to gamma rays interacting in the cadmium telluride detector, uh, creating Compton electrons or photoelectrons, which I would say is the upper left one here, or some electrons which are created in front of the sensor, which pass completely through. Or here on the right, what I would think is uh, pair production. So you have... Uh, electron-positron pair created in the sensor layer. And the last event category to show is my favorite one. So we found a fragmentation event. So um, a particle interacting in the sensor induces a breakup of the nucleus so that you can see a kind of shower of secondary particles. Okay, so now I have described methodology and shown some, some tracks we can measure. But what is it used for? So I put here a list of, of uh, applications where I think it's very useful or which are kind of uh, my, it's a very, very uh, subjective list. So <laughs> probably there are more application which can profit from this. And I would like to start with the single layer Compton camera. So this was a nice work, which was described by one colleague from our spin-off company. So especially this cadmium telluride detector can be used uh, in the kind of Compton camera setup to localize gamma radiation sources. Moreover, it was shown that with time peaks detectors, uh, you can measure secondary particles during hadron therapy and that you can even uh, reconstruct the Bragg peak position from this measurement. Um, time peaks detectors, since they are rather lightweight and small and also don't need so much power, 
They are also very good instrument for the use in space. So for example, for space weather analysis, and the most prominent example here is the SATRAM device, which measures the electrons and protons, which are trapped in the Van Allen radiation belts. Of course, if we fly in this low Earth orbit, we also see particles from solar particle event. And uh, finally, as mentioned in the title already, I think it can have impact to, to nuclear and particle physics. So Tantix 3 detectors were recently installed in ATLAS, where they are used for particle tracking and the radiation field characterization. I will show a few slides on this in the following. And I also think it would be good, especially in nuclear physics, for example, for some measurements where you want to reconstruct vertices or do angular correlation measurements. And also during my, uh, when I prepared for this talk, I found a paper which discussed the potential of hybrid pixel detectors for the search of neutrinoless double beta decay in cadmium 116. And the idea there is to use this kind of um, pixel or this 3D information to separate a single beta decay from a double beta decay. Okay, so just as, I, as promised, few slides on ATLAS, so it's very short. So in 2018 and 2017, we installed in total four time peaks 3 detectors to the Atlas cavern. The locations are shown here. This is the first one. This is the second one. The other locations are from the predecessor network, this time peaks network. And uh, we wanted to study how or if they can be used for luminosity measurement. With the time resolution of 1.56 nanoseconds, we should also be able to do it finally bunch by bunch. And uh, to do radiation field characterization, which is then used for benchmarking the Atlas simulation. And moreover, we found out that we can nicely measure induced radioactivity at the positions in the Atlas cavern. And our plan for the uh, run three upgrade is to install 14 Timepix 3 two layer uh, stacks. And here I'll just outline uh, very, very few results uh, related to particle tracking and the measurement of, of uh, MIP, uh, minimum ionizing particle fluxes. So first thing you see here is that is, this is just the unfiltered data set for, for 10 seconds integration time of the detectors which are at the extended barrel. And now from, from this data, we try to select uh, kind of straight straight tracks. And uh, if you do this- Two minutes, you... Benedict. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I have how much? One minute, two, two minutes? minutes? Two, two minutes. minutes, okay, yeah. I will manage this last slide, okay. And uh, then you can reduce it to this uh, smaller set. And from this set, we then calculate the stopping power spectra. Um, yeah, we had two detectors in this position, so you can see here two lines. And these stopping power spectra, they nicely uh, correspond to stopping powers of minimum ionizing particles. And also using the, the uh, tracking or the, the angle reconstruction, we can create a map of the directionalities of these minimum ionizing particles. And what we see is that most of them come from here, and this uh, aligns actually with the interaction point. And uh, then I will just conclude. Um, I have shown that uh, TimePix 3 allows a 3D reconstruction of particle tracks. I have discussed the methodology and I have shown that in two millimeter thick cadmium telluride detector, it's possible to achieve 60 micrometer precision, whereas in a 500 micrometer thick silicon sensor, we can get precisions or resolutions in the order of 30 micrometers. And I have shown only one experiment profiting from this uh, TimePix 3 capabilities. But if we go to additional slides, I put there a second experiment, which is more on the edge of nuclear physics and particle physics. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. Super, thank you very much. Do we have any questions for Benedict? Yes, hello, this is Karol Cheni. Maybe I would have a question, if I may. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you said the the, the, res the time resolution is around one nanosecond, but uh, okay, the, um, that somehow um, corresponds to the res time resolution of the whole sensor, right? The the time res um, because you you may you reconstruct the the tracks from from the time differences be between the pixels, and the, and this must be much much better, no? Uh, yes, yeah, so the time resolution I give there of 1.56, it's maybe, uh, it's, it's related to the clock frequency, which is used to sample the TOA. Uh, so we, we have a 640 megahertz clock, which, which samples the timestamps. So this is this 1.56 nanoseconds. And then what contributes to the, to the resolution, for example, in, in cadmium telluride, you have some, some local variations of drift times due to, uh, due to, um, effects of the crystal. 
So of course, this is why I had only 60 micrometer precision for cadmium telluride because I do it globally for the whole matrix. So probably if you would look locally, you could even improve it a bit. And okay. I'm not okay. sure if I answered this correctly. If, if you consider, some, uh, if you want to measure, for example, gamma ray flashes, then of course the drift time is the limiting factor for resolving these pulses. So if I would, if I would have to say I should give a number of the time resolution of time peaks, let's say with 500 micrometer thick silicon sensor for, for measuring gamma ray pulses, um, I would say it's actually worse than this 1.5 nanoseconds because you have to consider the drift time differences. Okay, okay, I think about it, thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. One last question for Benedict. Um, maybe I would like to ask, uh, you, you need prob very probably need to study the distribution of the electrostatic field in, in your uh, sensors. Uh, how are you doing this? You are using some uh, TCT or transition currents or something like this, some lasers? Uh, to be honest, it's possible to measure the electric field with lasers. Yeah? But uh, what we did, we just used the, like the tracks for, for calibration. So. Uh, if you have particle track going through, you can estimate where it started and where it ends from 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 the pixels actually. So you can you can uh, measure then by looking at the drift times and how it should look like, and then I compare this to my model, and then I can see uh, if it fits or if it doesn't fit. In fact, it would be excellent to, to have an independent measurement of the uh, of the electric field, but uh, for these precisions, it was not necessary to be honest. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Benedict, quickly, in your Atlas measurement, uh, you, you already had a two-layer uh, stack sensors uh, installed in RAN2, or this is something new for RAN3? Uh, in, in fact, we had, we had two layers installed, but they were not aligned properly. So we just put two layers which were synchronized, uh, mm -hmm. in, <laughs> uh, but they were, not, they were not aligned. You would see uh, tracks going from one layer to the second layer. They were only in similar positions because there was some space and there was, we didn't have enough space to put them directly behind each other. So we put them more like next to each other. Okay. Okay. I understand. Okay. Thanks very much. I think we can have more discussions uh, on this topic in the matter most. I think there are probably, probably more questions. Thank you very much. Mindy. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So, um, I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker. So Luca Mizzoni from University of INFN and Ferrara. And uh, we'll switch now to LHCB. And Luca will present the upgrade of the LHCB rich detector. Uh, Luca. Yes, can I share the slides? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, tell me if you see the full screen mode. Perfect. Okay, so just a second. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I am Luca Menzoni from the University of Ferrara, and today we'll talk about the LHCB Rich Upgrade. Uh, at slide two. Okay. Since uh, many other persons have already talked about LHCB, let me skip the general introduction. And let me just say that in this talk, I will focus on the two ring imaging Cherenkov detectors of the experiment, Rich One and Rich Two. Now, at slide three. Rich one is designed to detect particles up to 60 GeV over C, and its angular acceptance is the full uh, LHCV one. Rich two has an angular acceptance of 15, 120 millirad and covers the high momentum region up to 100 GeV over C. Both rich detectors use a gaseous Cherenkov radiator, C4F10 for each one and CF4 for each two. The Cherenkov rings generated in the gas are reflected from a spherical mirror to a flat mirror onto the photon detector plane. The photons are detected using hybrid photon detectors with electronics of readout working at one megahertz embedded in them. On the right hand side plot, you can see the excellent uh, rich particle identification performance on the kaon identification and the pion misidentification efficiency as a function of the particle momentum. For more efficiency plot, uh, I redirect you to the Martina Pili's talk. Now, at slide four. From the end of last year, the LHCB experiment is undergoing a major upgrade, which is enabling it to acquire data at 40 megahertz and to operate at increased luminosity of two times 10 to the 33 centimeters to the minus two seconds to the minus one. And following this increase in luminosity, 
the rich one detector is having its optical system redesigned while the HPDs and their one megahertz limited electronics are being replaced by commercial 64 channels multi-anode photomultiplier tubes read out by the Claro ASIC. The data acquisition will be performed using FPGA-based digital ports transmitting data via gigabit transceiver chip. At slide five, uh, we have uh, the key condition for the rich detectors, uh, we, which have to have a peak occupancy under 30% on the photon detector plate. To satisfy this condition with increased LHB luminosity, the rich one spherical mirror and the focal plane are being moved downstream with respect to the original position to increase the ring size. Having a longer distance to travel inside the rich one gas enclosure, the particles will generate more Cherenkov photons with respect to the actual conditions. Both a new spherical mirror with increased radius of curvature and a larger gas enclosure are needed. Given the little space remaining for the readout electronics, a compact system front-end readout is required. At slide six, the MAPNTs used in the LHCB rich upgrade are produced by MMAX Photonics. Two types of MAPNTs are used in the upgrade, the R13742 model with side of one inch and the R13743 with side of two inches. For the upgrade, a total of 3,100 uh, one-inch PMTs and 450 two-inches PMTs are needed, spares included. They are equipped with the UV glass window and ultra bialkali photocathode with a peaked quantum efficiency on the blue wavelength spectrum, resulting in a reduction in the chromatic error. The minimum guarantee gain is 10 to the 6 with a bias voltage of 1 kilovolt and the maximum pixel-to-pixel -pixel gain spread is guaranteed between a pixel of the same PMT. A constraint on the maximum dark count rate is also applied. Slide 7. The electronics complex system is called elementary cell, and it is the fundamental block of the LHCB rich upgrade. In the elementary cell, the PMTs and the readout electronics are grouped together. Two different types of elementary cells are installed in the upgraded rich detectors, R-type and H-type, depending on the MAPNT model used, which have been validated with a dedicated quality assurance procedure. The H-type elementary cell, used only in the lowest occupancy region of RICH2, has a single two inches MAPNT, while the R-type elementary cell, used in RICH1 and in the highest occupancy region of RICH2, has a two per two array of one inch MAPNTs. These MAPMTs are housed in custom sockets on the so-called baseboard and are read out by the Claro ASIC, soldered on the front end boards. Data are acquired by an FPGA-based digital board and FEBS and digital board are interfaced via the backboard. The elementary cells will be grouped in photon detector modules, PDMs, columns of four elementary cells read out by two digital boards each. Slide eight. The Claro ASIC is an 8-channel amplifier discriminator designed in 0.35 micrometers IMS CMOS technology for single photon counting coupled with the MAPMTs. To operate at 40 MHz, its recovery time is less than 25 nanoseconds, and the low power consumption per channel avoids the need for additional cooling on the front-end electronics. Each channel is equipped with an adjustable threshold to compensate for channel-to-channel -channel gain variation on the MAPMTs. The ASIC radiation hardness has been intensively tested on some of the most advanced European radiation facilities. To prevent register misconfiguration triggered by the incoming radiation, the CLARO is equipped with triple modular redundancy protection system. Slide nine. A prototype of the LHCB rich upgrade detector has been tested in a realistic environment at the beam area of CERN using charged hadrons one PDM with H-type elementary cells and one PDM with R-type elementary cells have been used, read out by digital boards. A borosilicate plano convex lens has been used as a Cherenkov radiator, and the Cherenkov photons produced inside the lens are directed onto the MAPMTs using an internal reflection system. A live monitoring software allows the user to see Cherenkov rings in real time, as you can see in the right-hand side picture where the Cherenkov rings seen on the software have been projected on the PDMs for display purpose. A light-tight polypropylene box 
has been used to ensure total darkness and thermal insulation. And humidity is controlled with nitrogen flow in the box. In the test beam, the elementary cells have been characterized and data have been successfully acquired using the optoelectronic chain, which is used in the reach upgrade. So slide 10. The excellent LHCB reach the time resolution is mainly due to the prompt chunk of radiation and the focusing geometry of the detectors. The signal from a single proton-proton interaction fits within a window of approximately half nanoseconds at full width of maximum. The left-hand side picture shows the simulation in the LHCB framework of the time of arrival of photons at the reach one photon detector plane with an LHC batch crossing time at zero. A time gate of few nanoseconds can be applied to the signal peak, which is named S, to collect all the signal while rejecting out of time background. And in addition to the LHC background, the time gate also reduces MAPMT's dark counts and out of time after pulses. This was studied to, during the beam test on the reach upgrade prototype. And the results can be seen in the right hand side picture, where the signal to noise ratio improves using a 6.25 nanoseconds time gate. Slide 11. Dedicated quality assurance tests have been developed to validate all the components of the LHCB reach upgrade, from the MAPNTs to the support components. But since uh, this was part of my PhD, let me present to you the Claro and the elementary cell quality assurance procedures. For the Claro quality assurance, a pick and place automatic attestation has been developed to validate the ASICs, ensuring the proper functioning and measuring their main parameters. The test station is controlled via PC and the control software has been developed in National Instrument LabVIEW. After passing the quality assurance test, the ASICs have been soldered to the FEPS, which have been then validated using a digital board-based test station controlled via Python scripts on a PC. Uh, slide 12. The ACQA test station is a dark box equipped with air cooling system and temperature and humidity light monitoring. Up to four elementary cells can be tested simultaneously in a box read out by digital boards. An LED driver is used to illuminate the MAPNTs in a controlled way to perform characterization tests on the Claro coupled with the MAPNTs. During the test on the elementary cell, the Claro main parameters are measured again, and a comparison with the results from the Claro QA test is performed to ensure the soldering procedure didn't affect the ASIC performance. The station is PC controlled, and the control software is an automatic finite state machine that has been developed in LabVIEW. The elementary cells passing the quality assurance test have been sent to CERN to be mounted in the upgraded reach detectors. And this CQA has been a challenging task for the great number of channels to be analyzed at the same time. When four elementary cells of the R-type are tested, it means that 1,024 Claro channels have to be analyzed at the same time. Slide 13. The reach to detector commissioning is progressing rapidly, despite the delay introduced by the COVID-19 situation. The elementary cells have been assembled in PDMs, then in columns to form the PD planes of the new reach 2. At the same time, the services, the mechanics, and the readout of the new detector have been assembled. And I also have the pleasure to inform you that one week ago, on the 23rd of July, a test installation has been performed on the A side of the upgraded reach 2 detectors of LHB which means we're almost ready to switch on. Let me also talk about the four scene performances of the upgraded reach detectors. On the table you find in this slide are reported the Cherenkov error contributions for the actual reach detectors and the expected one from simulations for the upgraded reach detectors. Okay, Both two minutes. Yes, thank two you. Yeah. Thank you. Both reach one and reach two will have a lower Cherenkov error thanks to the upgrade operations. On the right hand side of the slide, you can see the rich Pion Miss ID versus the Keon ID plot for three different running conditions. The black line refers to the actual rich detectors at the run to luminosity. The red line represents what we would like to operate the actual riches at the post upgrade LHCB luminosity. That's why an upgrade is needed. And lastly, the green line is the expected performance uh, with upgraded rich detectors in the post upgrade luminosity conditions. And let me just conclude that after the upgrade, the LHCB luminosity will increase by a factor five, and the readout frequency will be of 40 megahertz. To be able to efficiently acquire data, the optical system of reach one needs to be modified to decrease the occupancy on the new photon detectors 
which are the making these Murtiano to photomultiplier tubes, which are installed in the elementary cells and read out by the Claro ASIC. All the rich upgrade components have been tested in the experiments and the laboratory setups, while dedicated quality assurance procedures have been developed to validate all the components to be installed during the upgrade. And almost all the elementary cells have been delivered at CERN for commissioning, and RISC2 commissioning is almost complete. We are very ready to install in the cadre. Thanks. Thanks very much, Luca. Thank you all for listening, uh, for the chance of uh, giving this talk. Thank you. Are there questions for, for Luca? Really a huge amount of work and congratulations on the installation of the, the side A. Thank you very much. That's great. I have actually a very naive question on your slide um, early in the talk where you show just a schematic of the I think slide five. Um, I didn't quite understand the um, slide five. Ah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, no problem. Um, I didn't understand um, the mirrors and how you will monitor the um, efficiency of these mirrors with radiation damage. Um, ah, they have been tested. Uh, yeah. Now, I didn't prepare a backup slide, but uh, the material has been tested for, uh, for uh, not, not quite, uh, uh, not only radiation damage, but also, let's say, radiation transparency. This is yeah. what uh, worries the most. Uh, but uh, this material, which is a uh, glass, uh, I, I can send you the details if you want uh, later on, okay. uh, has been proven to be radiation hard and also radiation transparency. So the, okay. they, they don't contribute to the material budget uh, uh, to be accounted for when talking about uh, uh, secondary radiation caused by particles colliding with the LHCB material, let's say. Okay. Okay, super. Yeah, if you can post on the Metamorphs, that would be great. Yes, for sure. I'd be curious, yeah. Other questions for Luca? Okay, thank you for this very detailed talk and, and congratulations again and, and also for your PhD work. Thank you very much. That's super. Okay, and uh, go to our next speaker. Okay, so we pause uh, for a second from LHC and we go to Bell and um, Oscar uh, Hartbrich will present the time of propagation barrel particle ID detector in the Bell 2 experiment uh, in Japan and uh, Anask is from the University of Hawaii and it's uh, evening for him. So uh, we thank yeah. him for joining. Yeah. Thank Please you very go much. ahead, Asuka. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. I hope you can see the slides well. So this is about the barrel PID system of the Belto experiment. Um, <clears throat> so here on uh, slide two, uh, we have the cross sections of the old Bell one experiment on the lower half and the cross section of the Bell two experiment in the upper half. And you see the first look, not much has changed. It's the still, still the same geometry. It's still the same mechanical structure. But if you look into the rough details, then you will see that, for example, this yellow part, our drift chamber, our main tracking chamber is actually larger than it was before. And for that reason, there is much less space, especially in the barrel region for our dedicated Cherenkov based uh, pion kion or particle identification systems. So uh, something entirely new had to be done. In addition to this, with the expected beam backgrounds, whatever was used previously would not have worked at all. So we needed something entirely new, entirely from scratch. And this is uh, what was developed for this and is now installed and fully operational. And that is our time of propagation detector, the top detector. Um, the working principle is um, fairly straightforward, or maybe not. Um, of course, we use Cherenkov uh, information to, to reconstruct our particle species. And we do this with a fairly highly refractive uh, radiator medium, which is a quartz in our case. So when a particle, a charged particle goes through the quartz, as you can see here in this, in this small uh, diagram uh, at the bottom, um, some or most of the Cherenkov photons can actually be captured inside the quartz. Uh, and be captured by total internal reflection. And in that case, the uh, angular information of these Cherenkov photons is actually conserved if all of the surfaces are smooth. 
finely polished and square with respect to each other, right? Because then the photons will bounce around, but, but they will never lose the angular information, which carries the actual information on the particle species. Now, um, we don't have the space and also it wouldn't work from a background radiation perspective to actually project out these rings so that we get actual rings again. Uh, instead, what we do is uh, we measure the time of propagation of individual Cherenkov photons. So you will also see this here in this diagram again, say the red uh, line here is a hypothetical photon path of a Cherenkov photon generated by a pion and the blue one is well, the one that would be generated by a kaon. You see the pion has a slightly larger opening angle because the pion is a little bit lighter than the kaon. Uh, and thus it has less bounces until it reaches one end of the bar where we can, for example, read this out. Uh, and thus, if it has less bounces, it has a shorter path length and thus a faster propagation time towards one end of the bar where we can read out these photons. So on average, of course, this is very complicated in practice, but on average, earlier arrival time of a photon means it's a higher chance that this was a lighter particle, thus a pion over a kaon, for example. At the same time, we are at a collider machine. We know our collision times very well. Uh, we implicitly, when measuring these arrival times of these individual photons, we fold in the time of flight of the track from the creation all the way until it hits our, our quartz bar. So we always do an integrated time of flight measurement at the same time. If we just if we would just do time of flight uh, or time of propagation measurements of these photons, we wouldn't really get very far because chromatic dispersion is really the fundamental limit of such a time of propagation um, device. I will get to this in one or two more points where this is limiting us. Similar approaches are currently being done by the LHCV Torch uh, project. Also, the Panda Jerk is using this, but I think we are the first people to actually build a device like this and operate it. So in our specific case, we have 16 of these quartz Cherenkov radiator bars arranged, arranged around the IP as you would expect for a sort of barrel geometry. They are about two and a half meters long. One end, the forward facing end has um, a mirror that uh, reflects backwards facing photons back to the front. The mirror actually has a sphericity to it. So it focuses uh, backwards facing photons onto individual points which helps with a chromatic dispersion. And at the same time, it also projects out the thickness of the bar for photons that go backwards. It only helps you for the half of the photons that go backwards, but it helps nevertheless. And then on the backward side, we have a small expansion prism to expand these ring images at least a little bit. And then we have these sensor bars here where we collect photons and measure them with a very fast timing. <clears throat> so to realize a project like this, you can, you can go through these exercises and see what you need in terms of resolution numbers. And it turns out the goal is better than 100 picosecond time resolution on single optical photons. For this, you need, a, need to, you need a sensor that can do this. So of course, it needs to be efficient for single photons. It needs to be a better than, say, 50 picosecond single photon timing resolution. If you want a few millimeters of spatial resolution, you need to be able to operate in a B field. We are inside our solenoid. So all that is clear. And then, of course, you also need some electronics to read all that out at the fairly high luminosities and thus fairly high trigger rates and beam background occupancies that we expect uh, at Bell 2 eventually. So for sensors, we use microchannel plate PMTs. Um, they were developed more or less specifically for our project in a joint venture of Hamamatsu and Nagoya University. They spent many, many years developing these things <clears throat> and ultimately came up with something where the single photon timing resolution is better than 40 picosecond on a test bench. So it's exactly what we're looking for. They are mostly resistant to B fields. You need to adjust the bias voltage a little bit, but, but it works well. They have pixelated anodes of roughly five by five millimeters squared. Um, so we also get some geometric information. Uh, that is great, <clears throat> but they have a fundamental drawback. The fundamental drawback is they do have a sort of lifetime. So they can only see a given amount of integrated charge. They amplify a given number of photoelectrons uh, before they go blind effectively. And uh, during this whole R&D to, to, to get this project going, um, they first managed to converge on what we now call the conventional type, where sadly the lifetime uh, or the integrated charge before they would start to, to lose efficiency was only about one coulomb per square centimeter. They had to start producing these at some point to have sensors at all for the project. So roughly 50% of the current top system is instrumented with this conventional type um, uh, microchannel plate PMTs. But of course, they continued their R&D efforts uh, during the production and then at some point had this breakthrough where they managed to build these life extended types that are using atomic layer deposition uh, to extend the lifetime of these. And then you get more than a magnitude, uh, order of magnitude more 
uh, in lifetime. So you get more than 10 Coulomb per square centimeter. So 10 times higher lifetime. And they switched production to this type in the middle. So the other half of the currently installed top, top system is already equipped with these life extended uh, atomic layer deposition um, PMTs. So <clears throat> how much charge do you see on such a PMT over the lifetime of the experiment? Well, this is entirely dominated by the beam induced backgrounds. Just the luminosity itself, the physics events themselves, they are a minor, uh, a minor contribution to the whole thing. So it's just sort of beam backgrounds and the beam backgrounds can be divided into the irreducible components, which is scales with the luminosity. It's just uh, luminosity backgrounds. Um, which will be up to seven megahertz per PMT at the full luminosity has an angular dependence, which you can get from Monte Carlo, but this is kind of the, the, the range that you're looking at. So this is quite large, obviously, but this will only happen at this full scale at full luminosity of the super KB uh, machine. The other beam backgrounds largely depend on the accelerator conditions and how well the collimation is tuned, etc. cetera. Um, so you have some jiggle room in this, right? You can, ask the machine people to please tune the beams a little bit better to maybe reduce this. Or you can also set limits and say, we, we don't want to run uh, higher than this. So uh, in the bottom right here, this is the projection of the luminosity over the lifetime uh, of, of Super KB and Bell 2. So over the next roughly 10 years, and you will see that the expectation is that the instantaneous, instantaneous luminosity is more or less continually increasing over time. And this you can then translate into how much charge do we expect to see on our PMTs. Um, which is shown here, which for some assumptions say we can keep these other beam backgrounds below 1.2 megahertz per PMT that by over the next 10 years, we will integrate something like six Coulomb per square centimeters on average uh, over, over the various PMTs, which will just fit into the budget of say 10 Coulomb per square centimeter um, uh, that these PMTs will be able to do. So um, if we can reach this and we can, if we can keep within this, then, then these PMTs will be good enough, at least the 50% that are life extended already. But this critically depends on the fact that we can keep to this, say, 1.2 megahertz per PMT of reducible background so that the machine will be tame enough and low background enough to, to keep to these numbers. <clears throat> so um, going from this, you can then see how will your quantum efficiency or your, your PID efficiency actually um, uh, evolve over time. Um, and you will see here, so this is the curve for the conventional PMTs, where half of them are currently conventional PMTs. And you see within the next one to two years, they will start to degrade. And if we would not replace them in 2022, they would basically go down to zero very, very quickly and half of top would be useless. We do have a time window in 2022 because there will be a long shutdown anyway, or a longer shutdown anyway, to replace all of these PMTs so that all of the current conventional PMTs will be replaced with these life extended ones. And then uh, we hope that with these life extended PMTs, we can go all the way to the end of the experiment. Production for these new PMTs and testing is well underway, of course. We will see how COVID will influence this, but we, have to, we think we are on a good track. Okay, in terms of front-end electronics, we do have 8,000 channels of effectively three giga sample per second oscilloscopes on the chips. This is on a chip. This is a custom ASIC developed here at the University of Hawaii. Uh, we have shown the electronics time resolution is better than 50 picoseconds. Um, of course, you do full waveform extraction. That means you get a lot of samples. You cannot transfer them out. You need to do full feature extraction inside the front ends only transfer out the photon timings, everything else is impossible, but we have very powerful processing in the front end. We have more than 300 FPGAs right in the front end, 640 ARM cores. We have plenty of resources available still where we can put more stuff into this to refine our online processing. So it just needs some smart ideas and some implementation to, to, to put more and more things into the front end. Eventually, maybe power budget might be a problem, but uh, this is, it's, very, it's a very interesting thing to do and to work on this. If you're interested in this, there's a link to a, to a whole paper that describes this front-end electronic system. Just for some performance numbers, we managed to get the intrinsic time resolution for most channels, 99% of channels or so, to below than 100 picoseconds. Um, Two minutes, Yeah, okay. We are dominated by some electronic noise in the signal chain because we operate the PMTs at fairly low gain. Fine. Um, recently, we managed to implement or improve our time walk correction by quite a bit. Uh, so now most of the channels are even across the whole amplitude spectrum are better than 100 picoseconds. This is great. Um, the effect on the PID performance is very low because we're limited by chromatic dispersion in the end. 
this is how this actually looks like. Um, this is just a kinematically tagged k on, and this is the black points are the measured photons we get from this. It's like 20 or so. You can compare this to different PDFs that are shown in the background here. You can see the k on one fits best by eye, but also if you do the likelihood, um, if you compare data in Monte Carlo, we are getting closer and closer. The data is getting closer and closer to Monte Carlo, but we are not just there yet. It's a new system. We need to gain a little bit more experience with it. So um, quick word on what we still can improve and what we are working on. The reconstruction of top entirely depends on how you generate these PDFs that are shown here in the background. We do have a very fancy way of generating this analytically as a function of the track parameters, but we know it's not perfect. There are continuous improvements on this. Now we have an analytic uh, treatment of delta rays in there, which is really cool. You can again read this paper here for, for more of the details. It's really fancy. You can do some very detailed studies, which yields beautiful plots, as I sh show here on the right side. But of course, we also try to use modern machine learning techniques. So there is a whole task force of PNNL, University of Hawaii, KIT Nagoya, uh, INF and Torino that work on this, both for simulation of top events as well as reconstruction. So um, we are trying to make use of this as well. The beauty of all of these studies is they have the potential to not only improve data Monte Carlo matching, but also the top performance by itself, right? So even the performance of top in both data and Monte Carlo might improve considerably from these studies. So this is this is quite cool. You must uh, wrap so, up, yeah, Oscar. Yeah, to, to summarize, top detector is a rather novel system, I think. I think it's the first time that this time of propagation principle has been installed. We have quite strong requirements on sensors, et cetera, but we managed to reach them all so far. Top performance is getting very close to Monte Carlo uh, expectations will clearly improve in the future. Um, many Bell 2 analyses that are shown first time uh, at ICHEP here are using the top PID. So it is everybody uses it um, and we need to replace half of our PMTs in 2022. But we are going to do this because there is some time for this anyway. Thanks very much. A super talk. Um, very, very clever detector. Are there any questions for Oscar? Thomas speaking. Uh, I have a question to the uh, slide 11. I raised hand just in case. Uh, so uh, on the scale, it's a time resolution in, not in nanoseconds, but in picoseconds, I think you mentioned, right? In the left plot. Uh, on the left plot, this is the y-axis is nanoseconds. It's nanoseconds, so, but you mentioned picoseconds. Yeah, it's, point, it's point 0.1 nanoseconds, right? Oh, okay. So it's 100 okay. picoseconds. So 100 picoseconds, okay. Yes, so, yes, yes, 100 uh, picoseconds. Yeah, so where, where, when, when you, you talk about the single photon time resolution, how can you go uh, with a very low gain? What does it mean? I mean, what is a gain? That's my question. Ah, the gain is uh, the, the gain of the PMT tube itself. How many electrons? You, what That's is fine. the electron how, signal? How much? I mean, it's 700, 1,000, 10,000. Ah, currently we run at uh, 30,000. Three times ten to the five, I believe. Well, three Let's times ten to, to yeah here four. roughly we we they they, that, uh, they are 30, scattered 000? a little bit around this, but we run at three three ten to the five. Yes, three ten to five. Okay, thank you. And uh, last question, I mean, uh, because sorry, I did not catch it. I mean, a rate. You do not observe any problem with a rate. I mean, uh, that uh, you, you you go to the saturation uh, regime with your MCP PMT. That's no, 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 ne not never. We, we will never, ex we never expect this uh, from, from physics uh, uh, or, or beam backgrounds. Uh, so we, we, they could do very high rates. One recent problem that we have seen is that some PMTs become hot or individual channels of PMTs become hot and start to fire most likely by themselves. Uh, so they, and then they start to basically self-saturate. Uh, but this is not a fundamental problem. This is most likely a thermal problem on individual uh, channels or something okay, like this. Okay, I but don't, just from I don't understand, but it sounds things. interesting. Uh, but I will stop here. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Thanks for your questions, Tam. I think it also this talk deserves some more discussion in the Mattermost uh, channel. Yeah. Yeah, um, I finally managed so to log in. So I'm there and I will try to answer more questions if there are more questions. Okay, perfect. The, the link to the Mattermost channel was in the chat uh, earlier, the video chat. If anybody needs it, we can post it again. Okay, thanks very much. So uh, now we switch from, from Bell to back to the LHC, and we're going to focus on forward detectors. 
uh, for the next uh, three, three talks. And I'm pleased to introduce Jesse Lee Liu from the University of Chicago. And Jesse will present the alignment of the Atlas forward proton detector. Would you like to yeah, share your uh, do a sound check? Yeah, hello. Hello, hi. Okay, Super. so hi everyone. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about the uh, forward proton detectors at Atlas. So this is on behalf of uh, several uh, people's work. And for me, I think what's so uh, interesting is that it's not every day we install and we commission a new class of instrument at the LHC. And today I'm going to focus on the detector performance side of things. Uh, some of the physics will be discussed actually in uh, sessions uh, after my talk in a different track. So I'll focus mainly on the technical aspects, so an overview of the reconstruction and the detector, and uh, focusing on the alignment methods. Uh, and I'll briefly touch on the efficiencies at the end. So I want to flash up this event display from a 70 EV run, which is uh, one of the key targets that we look for in, these, uh, in this detector, which is photon fusion production of uh, two leptons, right, turning light into matter. And if you didn't have the AFP, these forward proton detectors, you could only see these central two leptons here, right? So this is a dielectron event. But with the AFP, we can actually see these uh, forward protons that are uh, going down the beam pipe here. So slide four, uh, you can see the Spiman diagram, I've zoomed into this interaction here, of these two leptons produced via photon fusion. And in these processes, the proton can stay intact, right, because of an electromagnetic interaction. And so they travel along the beam pipe, and they are deflected by the LAC magnets, and you can insert these silicon trackers uh, down to a few millimeters from the beam pipe, which is a bit like what LHCB does, uh, to detect these scattered protons. And the key observable that we measure in this detector is this fractional energy loss of the proton, this XAR here, which I define here. And so these detectors are placed uh, just over 200 meters downstream from the interaction point. So that was the, the cartoon. Here's the more technical diagram with all the different uh, quadrupole and dipole magnets, as well as the, the collimators. And you can see the AFP sits uh, downstream here. Uh, they're installed either side of Atlas. Uh, you can see I've marked the directions towards LHCB and Elise. And each side has two sets of uh, stations, a near and a far station. And each station has four planes of silicon. And the far station actually has these uh, time of flight uh, bars uh, that will actually be discussed by Carell in the next talk. And so the, uh, one of the arms was installed in 2016. And in 2017, we took uh, high luminosity data with both arms uh, installed. So slide six is just a photograph of one of these far stations where you can see the, the nice silicon. Uh, these are pixel, edgeless pixel sensors, 3D pixels, which are uh, very similar technology to the innermost uh, pixel layer that we have in Atlas. And you can see these uh, scintillating time of flight bars on the left. So slide seven, just to give you a sense of what, what is a proton spectrometer, right? So a spectrometer is a device that converts spatial measurements into energy measurements, right? So because the protons, they lose a bit of their energy, the Lorentz force from the LHC dipoles uh, actually bend them slightly less than they otherwise would. And so they get deflected and are displaced by this X uh, position. And from this position, if you calibrated your spectrometer, you can infer how much energy the protons have lost. And so that's what this Xi parameter is. And this is very interesting because you can then infer how much energy uh, is emitted by the proton into these colliding photons. So you have complete determination of the photon-photon system independent of the central detector, which can be very interesting for dark matter searches, for example. 
So one of the first uh, things I just want to show a slide on is the interplane alignment, right? So on the top left, you can see a picture of ideal alignment of the four planes. Right? When a proton goes through, the distance that the proton the, the hits and the clusters that they leave relative to the detector edge uh, is the same in each plane. But in reality, there may be some imperfections and actually you uh, measure different distances with respect to the detector edge. And so this, we apply a, an iterative uh, comparison between the clusters and the tracks and minimizing their the chi-squares. Uh, and we can actually uh, align these clusters uh, with respect to the track. So that's what you can see here in one of the planes in the A near station, uh, the red is after this alignment procedure. And you can see more details in, these, in this link down here. Now slide nine, I want to focus a bit of time onto something which actually has a bigger impact on our physics analysis, which is the global alignment. Right? So the idea of global alignment is that, as you can see here, we're converting a spatial measurement on the vertical axis to this uh, energy momentum measurement on the uh, horizontal axis. And the, these red markers are the simulation of the LHC optics as the protons are transported through the beam pipe. Uh, this is done with the MADX software package, which for accelerator physicists is uh, the standard uh, software simulation package. And you can start to get a sense that if you don't know the zero offset, right, this absolute distance between the detector edge and the beam, you, this uh, parameterized line here, right, the simulation will move up and down because that's a zero offset. And that will have a direct impact on the uh, left to right of what you infer as the measured energy. Right? So this is why we need to calibrate this absolute offset which is essentially an absolute scale on the proton. So one of the most canonical ways uh, to determine what is the absolute position of the beam relative to the detector is beam-based alignment. So this is getting into sort of more uh, technical details related to accelerator physics, right? This is a, a journal article about this method with a very nice picture from an accelerator journal. So just to give you a simplified picture, uh, as many of us are more detector physicists, the, uh, the main idea is to insert these collimators, which usually um, protect the LHC, uh, the, the expensive magnets, for example, from stray particles from the beam. You can insert these collimators into the beam to probe where the beam is. And as soon as it touches and probes the beam, showers will be induced. And you can detect these in these beam loss monitors, right? these ELMs, which are placed at regular uh, intervals along the beam pipe. So it's a fairly intuitive idea, really. You're just probing where the beam is and detecting the showers from the beam. So this is a screenshot from one of these uh, dedicated runs back in 2017 when these detectors were first installed. And on this lower, uh, panel you can see uh, is this position of these collimators and unfortunately the scale is uh, a bit too large to see the variation but this the collimators are changing position and on the upper plot you see this spike which is uh, are the showers from when the collimator touches the beam so this is the kind of this is a way of determining the absolute position of uh, the beam relative to the detectors now, one of the methods that we are developing inside Atlas is a, a novel in situ calibration technique, right? So this is going back to our, our dilepton uh, signal, and we're using this as a standard candle, which is what we might call a JSI of the AFP. So here's the diagram again. So what we want to do is we want to tag these two leptons that we produce. And uh, on this right-hand side, you can see I've marked, uh, I've place the formula, which is very similar to the Bjork and X formula, where if you know the dilepton mass and its rapidity, you can calculate by energy and momentum conservation, the expected energy loss of uh, a proton, right, this Xi LL. And then you can do the inversion of the uh, spectrometry relation and you can determine the expected position in the X. And then you can probe the proton 
uh, this X AFP and see if they are the same. And for the signal, so these are these black points here where the protons uh, arrive uh, from the same vertex as the dileptons, there will be a kinematic uh, correlation. And for the background events here, this is from mixing the data events, uh, the red points here, you can see the, these are when the protons arrive from pileup from a different vertex. They have no correlation. Now on the right, you can see this background subtracted uh, version of the left, so the residuals, and you can see that, already see there's a slight offset, right? So uh, the beam-based alignment techniques were not completely determining the absolute position of the beam. There was some systematic shift. So then you can imagine a, a fairly simple way to correct for this, which is just a, a, an additive correction, shifting this peak back to zero, right? So you're just fitting and shifting the residuals. So Jesse, this is uh, two minutes. Thanks. So this, this is what we've uh, done. And this is only possible because we have enough uh, luminosity to see this uh, dilepton signal peak. Now, just to give you a sense, a slide on the systematic uncertainties, this is a pretty robust method, right? Because as soon as you've seen this peak, there's not really any uh, other way you can uh, constrain this, this peak. And so this, you can change all the, the, the different cuts, uh, the analysis cuts that you use to select the peak, and the peak actually remains fairly robustly centered around zero. And for now, we're assigning quite a conservative 300 micron systematic, but you can see that this is somewhat uh, conservative. and uh, there's a lot of room for improvement. So just to flash up uh, some of the other important ingredients for the physics analysis, which is the data quality and efficiency. So this is uh, a, an estimate of the efficiency of each station using a novel station-based tag and probe technique where you use the near station as to tag a track and see how, uh, what fraction of events have a matching track within two millimeters of X reconstructed in the other station. And so you can see that the near stations have a slightly lower efficiency than the far stations, just purely because of showering effects, right? This is about a 4% effect that we're quantifying here. So I just want to end uh, with this cartoon that uh, many of us might be familiar with of what we can reconstruct inside the Atlas detector, right? There aren't actually many objects we use inside Atlas. And what is so exciting about these forward proton detectors is that we are really expanding our repertoire of what kind of objects we can reconstruct at the LHC, right? This is a genuinely new kind of object that we're probing uh, for the first time. So my last slide, just to summarize, we are developing a lot of innovative and pioneering strategies to align the AFP detector and characterize its performance, which is critical for opening this new kind of program at Atlas. And you can see there's gonna be a wealth of talks, one straight after me, as well as in other tracks today, uh, discussing the, the new physics results that we're uh, exploiting with all this. So thank you. Super, thanks very much. Um, yeah, clearly, very challenging uh, experiment. Yeah, that's an interface with the with the LHC as well. Any questions for for Jesse, uh, Patrick? Yeah. Hi, hello. Uh, on slide eight, please. When you talk about the local alignment, um, so so do I understand that you are using uh, track based alignment, right? Yes, that's right. We're comparing the cluster positions to the track. Reconstructed, yeah. and, and then you said minimizing you use, the residuals. You use an iterative approach, right? Yes. Did you consider using a global approach when you uh, fit both uh, track and uh, alignment parameters in a single fit? That is usually less biased. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Um, I think. Okay, and I then the follow up. Yeah, and then and then I have another question. Do, do you do you observe weak modes? So invariant uh, non-physical distortions. I mean, sorry, non-physical non, non distortion, systematic non-physical distortions. I think right now we're not seeing any evidence of that. Um, okay. I think we only correct the X, Y, and the rotation about the Z position. So I don't know if we're sensitive to those weak modes. Yeah, yeah of course, because your system is uh, symmetric. Yeah, I mean, you, yes. if, you, if you, for instance, uh, move all your 
your um, your modules uh, consistently. Uh, you make a global transformation, for instance, along Z, then uh, your tracks will still look good. They That's will right, still yes. look good in terms of chi square. So so you, you might be sensitive to weak modes. You, you might want to check that. That's a good suggestion. Thanks. I have a question to your question, please. I mean, uh, by this uh, physical distortion, what do you have in mind, please? Yeah, as I said, for instance, if you uh, if you make a global uh, transformation of uh, all the modules along that, so that can affect uh, resolution. So sometimes these weak modes, in the end, they don't really affect the physics, but um, they 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 can. So one one needs to to be careful about them. I mean, you don't want to introduce a non-physical transformation in your alignment. My question was more rather about what is the causing of this, what you have in mind, but I will stop here and uh, we can discuss on uh, Matomos, for example. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so other questions for Jesse? Okay, let's uh, move to the next talk, which is uh, still on uh, from Atlas. Um, okay. And here again, we have a Czech local. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay. So, uh, hello. Uh, can you see the slides in the presentation mode now? Um, we, we don't see full screen. If you can go to full screen, Carol. Okay. Uh, the presentation should be working now, is it? No. Um, I don't okay, see the so screen, I, I, but I, I, I'm sorry. I will do it once more. Sorry. No, nope, no okay. problem. Uh, um, share this one. Okay. Otherwise, we will have to st uh, stay with this presentation. Okay. So. I think it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. We can, it do, okay. We can, okay. Okay. We, we, we can work like this. No, yeah, no problem. Sorry. Thank I don't you, know what happened. Uh, yeah, I don't know what happened okay. uh, when I tested it before. Okay. It's hello. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, I would like to thank you. Uh, thanks uh, the organizer for giving me the opportunity to present the study of, of, of performance of our uh, time of flight detector, which is a part of, of, uh, of the AFP detector. I could not wish to have a better introduction to AFP than uh, it was given in Jesse's talk. And also, uh, in some sense, uh, it's, it's it's nice that uh, that uh, we, we share the same concerns uh, um, in our detectors, which were also presented uh, in Oscar's talk. Um, uh, I have in mind mainly the, the the problems with PMTs and so on. So um, I would like to present the the the. the uh, uh, performance study uh, that that uh, was uh, was done with the time of flight detector uh, in in the in the atlas data that were acquired in, in the in the year 2017 um, uh, I will probably go directly to uh, what we what we have. Uh, the proton tagging, tagging was already already well described by Jesse. What we have is, is the situation that we have reactions where there is a colorless exchange. Uh, uh, it, can, it can be a, a parton in color, colorless exchange, uh, a diffractive one, which we call usually a pomeron. This can be realized by by a, co a collective state of, of partons or 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 to, uh, or, uh, or uh, two gluon exchange. Model, or it can also be the the uh, the the, fo the photon uh, as it was used in, in Jesse's uh, in Jesse's talk. Uh, and the point is that we want to measure the, the leading protons um, um, uh, in dedicated detectors that are usually placed uh, at, at very high rapidities, uh, so very far downstream in, in the direction of, of, of the beams, and they have to uh, approach very closely to, to the nominal beam. So um, uh, for that, we use, use usually the technique of Roman pots uh, because we want to we want to uh, um, uh, preserve the vacuum. So uh, again, the AFP detector is is placed uh, on 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 both uh, on both sides of, of the Atlas interaction regions uh, at around 200 meters. Uh, um, uh, the outermost stations they are equipped with. with uh, I will not speak uh, about, about the silicon tracker, but the outer uh, two outermost stations are equipped with the time of uh, flight uh, detector. Uh, why? Because uh, because when we want to measure me measure the diffractive processes, we very often have the case that where uh, we have a false signal a signature, which which is depicted here in in the top in the top. Uh, uh, 
a plot uh, where we want to uh, we just want to demonstrate what, what is happening. We can have uh, we can have simultaneous uh, signals in in the forward detectors, uh, which are indicated with the red red uh, points uh, and red, uh, red arrows. And uh, then we have the uh, a central system that is measured by the central detector, and this mimics uh, the topology that we want to actually have in the in the in in in, the, in our uh, centrally diff uh, double diffractive uh, processes. Uh, but we can we can use the time of flight met method. To 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 uh, uh, to suppress the, the contribution of such background, and it, it is based on on, on measurement of time in, in the two uh, on the on the two sides. Um, how does this work? Is is actually very easy because uh, if we measure the time of of one of the signals on one side and, and on the uh, opposite side, if they really came from from the from the. Uh, uh, from sing single production vertex, uh, they, the times uh, measured uh, on one side are, are advanced or retarded uh, uh, with respect to, to uh, with respect to uh, uh, nominal time, and uh, uh, we can deduce then what is the position uh, in Z uh, along, along the beam axis of, of that production vertex. Uh, so uh, th this is something that is uh, that is uh, shown in, in this in this space time diagram, which you can see here. Where the bunch crossing is de is depicted uh, being, uh, that it has a dimension in, in the z in the space and also in time. This 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 uh, diagram also shows why it's not possible to measure just one uh, just one uh, 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 the time in one arm uh, or, or on one side uh, to infer the the production vertex. Uh, uh, because uh, then we would need to know also the time of the production vertex it itself. So we would need a uh, central timing. Uh, the time of flight detectors are uh, Cherenkov detectors. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Cherenkov light is uh, is produced in in uh, quartz bars. Uh, we call them LQ bars because they, they are L-shaped. Uh, they are placed just uh, just behind the silicon tracker, and they are segmented in a matrix of four by four four, uh, four by four pieces of the of the, of the LQ bars, and. Uh, Mm, uh, so, so we we uh, we have a um, uh, which you can see on the on the on the on the uh, on the picture on the lower picture. We uh, we have four channels. Uh, we call them A, B, uh, A, B, C, and D, and four trains of channels uh, uh, for which we use the numbering from zero to three. So we have such, such a segmentation of the of the detector, and the detector is mounted to uh, uh, multi anode uh, uh, micro channel P PNT. Uh, Mm. And uh, the, the processing of the or, or, or the or um, yeah the processing of the signal looks uh, as it is indicated in the in the in the diagram above. Uh, so we have we have the protons that are entering the LQ bars, producing Cherenkov photons, which then uh, which then enter the MCP PMT. The signal from the MCP PMT ampli uh, is amplified and goes to a constant fraction discriminator. This element is is there be uh, to 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 provide a timestamp actually, uh, or, or, or yeah the timestamp of the of the signal and uh, constant fraction discriminator is used because uh, the 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 amplitude of the signal can be uh, can, can be very uh, different uh, in, uh, uh, between uh, between events, and then we process the signal in in uh, in a time to digital converter, and then we have the measurement of of time. So uh, uh, the, the first thing to study in the 2017 da data was uh, to measure the efficiency, which is measured uh, in a very straightforward way. We we have a data sample where we required to have tracks uh, in the silicon tracker uh, in the regions uh, in the regions of interest uh, that that are overlapping in acceptance with uh, with the trains of, of the time of flight detector, which is indicated here uh, in in the plot. And we can measure then the the efficiency of of, of registering a signal in each of the uh, in each of the of the uh, uh, of the channels, mm. uh, we we used uh, a few runs, uh, a few runs uh, from the 2017. One one of uh, one was. Uh, uh, mm, uh, uh, with, with some time, time time gap between them also and uh, in different conditions uh, as concerns the uh, the uh, the amount of pile up that we had and i will now present uh, the result from from the from this first run the uh, uh, this Ju july run um, in terms of these plots, so uh, what these plots are showing uh, is the efficiency in single channels uh, uh, in, in the in the far A station and far C station, so the left and right uh, um, side of, uh, from the from the interaction region. 
and uh, then also the the, um, uh, the the plots are shown for uh, for the situations where the track was pointing to actually so the first the first plot the, the the very left and top plot shows shows the efficiency when the track was found to point in uh, to, to the first train and uh, the efficiencies are then, then measured but we can see that we also see uh, some some non negligible efficiencies of or signals in the in the neighboring channels which is mainly due to production of secondaries so this is the um, uh, we can see we can see that the the, the efficiency of the whole train uh, so com uh, the combined efficiency of all four channels uh, in the illuminated uh, in the illuminated uh, 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 trains uh, is around uh, I don't know six six uh, up to nine percent in the far A station and it's a uh, it's a bit lower in, in in the far C station around three or four percent and this was in July if you look. Uh, uh, to uh, September, uh, to to run that was that, that was recorded in September. The efficiencies uh, drop uh, already to five uh, and uh, to 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 two percent, two percent or three percent. So we can we can summarize this uh, uh, in plots where we show then uh, the the train efficiencies uh, from July and from September, September, and we we see a drop between July and September. And what we also uh, see uh, in September, we used another run, which was taken just after after, after the first uh, uh, run in September, uh, which was uh, at higher at higher mu. So we, we see that there was there was a there is a drop uh, between July and September, and there is uh, the efficiency is not sensitive to the level of pileup because the, the last run, which is uh, actually of, of quite low uh, quite low statistics, uh, has considerably uh, higher pileup, but uh, the efficiency is not sensitive uh, to that so uh, and we blame we blame uh, we blame the, the drop in efficiency uh, uh, we blame the PMTs uh, to, to, to degrade uh, uh, proportionally to, to, to the time of exposure of, of, of PMTs so then another another task was to measure measure the single channel uh, resolutions um, uh, time resolutions so for for that we use a topology of events where where we require to to have the signal only in one train uh, of of tof uh, so this is different uh, to to uh, dif different from the previous case where i also allowed to uh, measure measure the efficiency in the in the channels that were neighboring to to the train that had the track pointing to it but now now here we limit this uh, the topology is to have the signal only in one train because um, uh, we learned that uh, the efficiency, uh, the time resolution is then the best. So we have we have a single ten channel time that that looks like this. It, it, it's proportional to, to the arrival time of the proton. Um, there is some constant uh, delay specific uh, to to each channel due to uh, length of the cables, and then there, there is a random uh, random. Uh, Random uh, component uh, that we uh, the width of which we want to measure it's it's, it's this ti smear, and then uh, the, uh, we measure the time with respect to to LHC clock. Uh, what what we use we we use one channel as a reference for another channel. So we need to have at least two two hits in in each train to construct the distributions of time differences. And from the width of the time differences, we then infer uh, on on the values of, of the of the single channel resolutions according to this formula that is minimized. So so we, the measurement is the sigma ij and we want to extract the the, the values of sigma i and sigma j and um, uh, we also have the correlation uh, we may have a correlation between the, between the channel time uh, due to uh, charge sharing but this we treat as a systematics so what are what are the the, the channel resolutions? Carol, you have two minutes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we measure the, the channel resolutions that are that, that are actually very good. They are they are almost always uh, below below 50, 50 picoseconds. Uh, there is a systematic a systematic sh shape um, of of these resolutions, uh, this U shape, and we know that the first the first uh, channel actually has a low photon statistics, so it it's, it can be explained by that. And the the last one, um, the the last channel, is the thing that it, it shares less signal with the neighboring neighboring channels uh, on the PMT and then we can also expect that there, there will be a, a slightly worse uh, worse um, measurement and it, this also applies for for the first channel as well so so we think we understand the shape of this but uh, although although the the efficiency was quite low the time resolutions were very good 
And then last thing was to, was to actually to prove to, to to try to to make a proof of concept of the, of the, of the time of flight measure uh, method. So for that we used uh, another run uh, which had uh, a moderate or uh, quite low low pileup, and uh, we compared the, the the position of the primary vertex uh, with the with the values obtained from from the uh, time of flight system. And uh, uh, you can see you can see the the, the distribution of, of such a of such a observable the difference between uh, between the z positions. Of, of the of the vertices and um, we see an indication for for, for a signal there and uh, we, we also uh, extracted the, the single channel resolutions um, in this run again and we use that uh, to, to to predict what, what the expected resolution should be and within the within the error the the uh, the the width of the of, of the signal is is is, uh, is consistent with the with the expectations. We fixed the the background uh, background fit in, in this low statistic sample quite well by using an event mixing uh, where we mixed events from from under, uh, from from different uh, events uh, to produce the background shape. So uh, conclusions: the efficiency efficiency was rather low caused by by deterioration of the, of the MCP PMT. The resolutions were, were actually measured uh, at very reasonable levels. And the vertex matching analysis uh, showed that uh, what we observe is is uh, is consistent uh, what we what would we uh, expect. Thank you for your attention. Thanks. Super. Thanks very much, Carol. Thank you. Okay, I'm sure you have uh, questions for for him. So for um, this uh, shutdown. Do you plan to do anything to work on the um, yes, efficiency? Yes, uh, yeah, there's a better person to co comment on that. But yes, uh, the main the, the main uh, improvements are concerning the, uh, the 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 PMTs and and also mm -hmm. the optical part is going to be changed. The LQ bars that are used uh, that were used in 2017 were glued together uh, using an optical glue. But now the, um, they are manufactured in, in a new way that uh, no glue is used, so it's, it's a single piece uh, LQ bar and and the new 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 PMTs and also also the PMTs uh, will be placed uh, uh, will be placed in in in, uh, in, in um, uh, not in a secondary vacuum. Uh, so mm -hmm. um, uh, there are many changes that, that are going to be applied. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. But the uh, the actual quartz bars themselves, the the radiators are, are not the limitation at the moment. It's the it's the efficiency of the and the longevity of the PMTs, right? I, I would say yes. Actually, okay. let me comment here very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, when we are using when if we get a Pico TDC, uh, mm -hmm. then uh, the uh, construction of LQ bars is really the most limiting factor because okay. I mean contributing to the resolution. Okay. Okay, thanks very much. And this LQ bar consists of its um, two two materials, if I understand correctly, with this mirror to transition between them. Is that correct? Or it's one material? It's one material. It, it one material. Be, it, it will not only be glued from two pieces, but it's just one single piece. Uh, okay. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Carol? No. Sorry. Okay, no, it's okay. But well, I think we can also take this to, to the matter most. Okay. So now we make a, a switch from, from Atlas to uh, CMS. And I'm pleased to produce, uh, introduce our colleague from Torino, um, Ada, and Ada, Ada Solano. And Ada will present the performance and upgrade of the proton, precision proton spectrometer and the performance of the proton reconstruction uh, for the CMS experiment. Thanks a lot. I will try to keep the video if it stays. Okay. <laughs> okay, sure. There. Okay. Thanks. I hope you see. Perfect. Okay, I only have a problem with that, like this. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for the presentation. I will uh, present you the precision proton spectrometer of CMS, its performance, and the upgrade uh, program for uh, LAC uh, Run 3. Here, um, 
you see uh, the outline of the talk, but let me draw your attention uh, to the sketch below uh, of the um, PPS detector, which is uh, placed on either side of uh, CMS along the LAC tunnel at about 200 meters from the CMS interaction point. Here you see uh, the LAC tunnel with the movable structure called the Roman pots, uh, which allow to insert uh, the detectors very close to the beam inside the LAC uh, beam pipe. Uh, PPS uh, was both worn as a joint project of the CMS and TOTEM collaborations uh, for measuring uh, scattered um, protons uh, at very small angles uh, in uh, standard LAC running conditions uh, at high luminosity. Um, uh, in the PPS uh, physics uh, uh, program focuses on uh, central exclusive production. Uh, which means some processes uh, uh, in which uh, the protons remain uh, intact and can be measured in PPS, and the uh, central system X produced in the interaction uh, can be measured in uh, the central uh, detector of uh, CMS. Um, protons uh, lose only, uh, a scattered protons lose only a small fraction of uh, um, their energy and uh, can be measured with detector very close to the beam. PPS has uh, uh, tracking and timing stations. The tracking detectors uh, uh, are used for measuring the proton fractional momentum uh, loss at C, and in general, the proton kinematics, uh, thanks to the knowledge of the beam optics. Well, the timing detectors, uh, which measure the time of flight of the protons, uh, are used uh, to disentangle uh, the, uh, the pileup in uh, order to um, identify the, uh, the interaction vertex uh, by a by timing uh, technique. The experimental challenge of PPS uh, is to go with the detectors uh, to a few millimeters from uh, the beam, about uh, 1.3, 1.5 millimeters to maximize acceptance. So the detectors must uh, tolerate high levels of non-uniform irradiation. This means for a 100 inverse uh, front bar, which is almost uh, that of run two, a proton fluence uh, of up to 5, 10 to the 15 protons per centimeter uh, square, which corresponds to a dose of uh, around 160 uh, megarad. Challenging are also uh, the spatial uh, resolution uh, uh, required, uh, 10, 30 uh, microns, uh, depending on the coordinate. And our goal for the timing uh, resolution of uh, 20, 30 uh, picoseconds. Uh, PPS uh, took data um, uh, during run two with different configuration depending of the, on the availability of, of uh, the detectors. We started in uh, 2016, one year in advance uh, with the totem uh, detectors um, to uh, prove the feasibility of running a near beam spectrometer uh, uh, in a, uh, in high luminosity uh, conditions. Then in uh, um, 2017 and 18, uh, we've been running in our um, standard um, configuration, uh, very stably, as you can see uh, from the fraction of uh, data collected with respect to CMS, integrating a, a total of about 115 inverse uh, femtobar uh, during uh, run two. Before uh, going uh, to the performance, let me say a few words uh, on the detectors. But since I do not have so much time, uh, please look for more details uh, in the backup slides. For the tracking detectors, uh, our baseline technology is that of uh, 3D silicon uh, uh, pixel sensors, uh, which ensures radiation hardness, high granularity, and uh, slim edges. In run two, we had those with the uh, columns etched uh, from uh, both sides. We have also used uh, the silicon strips uh, from Totem. For the timing detectors, uh, we have been using uh, uh, diamonds, um, single and uh, double diamonds, uh, but also um, in uh, 2017, a plane of ultrafast silicon detector. Ultrafast silicon detectors are also used by Totem in their vertical Roman posts. Uh, vertical Roman pots are not used by CMS, uh, which only uses uh, horizontal pot, but vertical Roman pots are needed for the alignment of uh, the apparatus during special alignment runs uh, a few year, times per year. <coughs> Here you can also see how the um, timing resolution allows to disentangle the primary vertex from um, pileup, and this is needed if you remember that uh, um, during um, 
2018, uh, the mean number of pileup events uh, was about uh, 35, uh, and uh, we we know it will it, it will grow. For introducing uh, the um, performance of the tracking detectors, uh, let me show you the heat distributions uh, in, in the tracker stations to per side uh, of, of the, from the interaction point. In uh, 2017, uh, we had the strips and uh, uh, 3D pixels, while in uh, um, 2018, uh, in both station, uh, there were um, 3D pixel uh, detectors. You can clearly see that uh, uh, the heats are concentrated uh, very uh, close to the beam. Uh, the distribution is uh, uh, very picked, uh, which translates in a, a highly non-uniform uh, irradiation and, and so radiation uh, damage. I'll start with the strip detector. Uh, two major sources of inefficiency have been studied separately, radiation damage and uh, multi-track uh, capability. Um, the first one is here radiation damage. Uh, this detector uh, built for totem uh, were not supposed to stand uh, this uh, high uh, proton fluence. And indeed we have changed them a few times uh, during uh, um, the run in technical uh, stops. Uh, to um, recover the, uh, the efficiency of the detector. You clearly see uh, the degradation close to the beam, and uh, um, this is also shown in uh, this plot, uh, where the efficiency is, uh, is uh, shown as a function of uh, Xi, so uh, it degrades uh, at low values of uh, Xi, and here is computed separately for each of the main LAC uh, crossing angle used in uh, 2017. In the right plot, you see uh, the drop of the efficiency uh, as a function of pileup. Since these uh, detectors are, uh, uh, have not um, the capability of reconstruct uh, multi-tracks, uh, for reconstructing uh, multi-tracks, uh, clearly a, a pixel detector works better. Um, we have uh, chosen uh, um, 3D uh, pixel um, uh, sensors uh, bonded to the PSI46 uh, digital chip uh, of the central CMS uh, tracker. And uh, um, in the, the, um, here you see the evolution of the uh, efficiency maps uh, uh, for the pixel detector as a function of uh, uh, the integrated uh, luminosity. Um, in two stations, uh, one per sector. These are the most far station, and here is plotted only the region uh, of which is most interesting, close to the uh, beam. Um, you see that uh, the uh, in general the efficiency is uh, very high. Um, the degradation is uh, uh, close to the to the beam, very peaked, and. Um, this is not due to the sensor, but is due to the uh, chip, and in particular to the uh, non-uniform irradiation of the chip. Uh, we had studied this problem in a specific uh, irradiation campaign, so we were ready to it. And uh, to uh, mitigate this problem, the um, Roman pots were, uh, were shifted uh, twice in uh, 2018, uh, each time by the 500 microns. and. Uh, um, this is why you see that the, uh, the damage region um, it becomes wider in the vertical uh, position. To, um, to release uh, the, uh, the efficiencies uh, uh, for physics analysis, uh, they have been uh, measured uh, in, for different integrated luminosity in the different run periods. Here you see an example. Uh, of the uh, uh, efficiency at the beginning uh, and at the end of the data taking uh, for uh, um, the FAD uh, pot of sector 5-6. Uh, you see the degradation in C. Uh, let, let, let me uh, say that uh, the interval of the, in C of the PPS detector goes more or less from 0 0.02 to 0. Uh, uh, two, depending on the uh, closest approach uh, of the detector to the beam and on the um, aperture uh, limitations. Uh, to better follow the, um, the 
the efficiency variations uh, in the critical region, a uh, irradiation peak area has been defined for which you see the measurement of the efficiency um, done every uh, one inverse femtobar in the critical region. You see the drop and the recovery of the efficiency uh, due to the vertical movement of the Roman pot during the technical stops. I should say that outside the, the integration peak area, so in all the rest of the detector, the efficiency remains constant and greater than 95% during all uh, data taking. Let me now move to the timing um, system, the timing detectors. We have used um, diamond detectors, um, one station, station on uh, each uh, side uh, of the interaction point, each station with uh, four diamond planes, uh, two uh, single diamond and two double diamonds. Um, double diamonds uh, have been measured to have a, a, a better resolution of uh, a factor 1.7 with respect to single diamonds. Here um, I show you the measurement uh, uh, for the full station. So a lot of work has been done. Two minutes. Thanks. Two minutes yeah. for um, uh, for calibrating the, uh, the detector, and here I only show the the, the final results. So with uh, everything included, so sensor front end, digitization, uh, calibration, and reconstruction procedure. What you see is the um, proton timing resolution in uh, the tooth sector for um, 2018, depending on the sector. Um, and uh, as a function of the integrated luminosity, uh, the resolution uh, goes from about uh, 90 picosecond to about uh, 125 uh, picosecond uh, for a selection in which uh, um, one track in uh, both fixed stations is required and all four diamond planes with one pad uh, each fired. And um, so one can say that uh, uh, timing detectors uh, uh, with this performance can be used for physics uh, and uh, can give uh, an important background uh, reduction. My last slide on uh, our upgrade program for LAC uh, Run 3. Um, PPS will operate as a full CMS subsystem. Uh, the tracker system will uh, uh, still have uh, two Roman posts per side. Uh, with the uh, uh, new 3D uh, silicon pixel sensor, this time uh, uh, producing single-sided technology and bombarded to the PROC 600 chip of the first layer of the CMS central pixel tracker. We know that this chip has the same problem uh, with respect on, to non-uniform uh, irradiation. So um, we are implementing a, a, an internal movement system for the detector package with these piezoelectric uh, uh, motors to better distribute the radiation damage. Um, there will be 12 positions spaced by 500 microns uh, with the possibility of handling more than 50 uh, inverse pentobar without minimal efficiency loss. Also the timing system uh, is undergoing an important pro, uh, upgrade program, both on the electronics and on the sensor. And moreover, uh, we are uh, planning to install uh, a new timing station uh, in each sector. So we will have also two uh, timing uh, station per uh, sector. Each station will have uh, four double diamonds planes, uh, so that we think that with eight double diamond planes uh, in each sector, we will be able to reach our ultimate goal of uh, 30 picoseconds. So conclusions, I hope I've convinced you that uh, PPS has proven the feasibility of uh, uh, continuously uh, operating a near beam proton spectrometer at high luminosity. We have collected the 115 uh, inverse fent of, of good data during uh, run two, and uh, we will go on during uh, um, run three, for which we are, um, a, um, a, a program of, of upgrade. Uh, let me add two more things. Uh, studies of, in the past years of a PPS detector for a, a HLLAC have recently converged into a, an uh, expression of interest draft endorsed by CMS and sent to the uh, LACC. So if you are interested, stay, stay tuned. 
And of course, last but not least, uh, we have a rich program of physics analysis. Uh, I could not say a single word, but uh, let me at least point you out uh, to uh, this talk by uh, Justin Williams uh, uh, last Tuesday. Uh, at this conference uh, um, uh, on a recent and interesting analysis for a search uh, for exclusive diphotons with uh, intact uh, protons, uh, which uh, allow to uh, set limits on the um, four photon anomalous uh, um, quartz gauge couplings. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, and a very, very rich, uh, rich talk. Lots of, lots of uh, details on covering different technologies. Okay, I see already uh, Tom has a raised hand. Uh, if anybody uh, else uh, like to uh, add a, uh, ask a question. Yeah, yeah please. Mm -hmm. uh, Ada, if you go to the slide 10. Yes. And then to slide 11. So here we see the resolution. So do I understand correctly the resolution deteriorate in the time? Is the proton timing resolution for uh, the two arms? Yes. Yes, and uh, it's uh, time dependency. So it deteriorate uh, starting. Yes, from sure. The... It depends uh, on the on the integrated luminosity. Yeah. Um, this is okay. Um, I have something in the backup slides. We also see a slight deterioration of uh, the uh, diamonds with the integrated luminosity. Uh, maybe I can go to it. I don't know if I have time. Um, but anyway, you can have a look at yourself. I, I will have a look. So yeah. I, my yeah. question was. And, yeah. uh, but okay, so it is not uh, that that big, but uh, uh, then uh, it um, is convoluted with also uh, the the electronics and so on. And mm -hmm. so in the end, uh, okay, there is a, a slight degradation. Yes. Okay, and then uh, uh, very. I mean, if you go page eleven, it's a uh, it's a fantastic. I mean, you uh, you would like to have a. Uh, Two timing stations on, on yes. both sides. It's it's really beautiful. I envy you. I would say uh, still a question concerning the uh, resolution. So let's say you have uh, eighty uh, now. You aim yes, for eight better... double diamonds, all double diamonds. So yeah. uh, double diamonds are one point seven better than single diamonds. So we think uh, that, and also there is a. a a very important uh, upgrade program also on the electronics. Uh, okay. This is also this also you find uh, in a, in a backup slides uh, all the uh, single points on the electronics uh, that uh, um, are are, uh, are are subject uh, to to the upgrade uh, and uh, and we think this will allow to go to this uh, res resolution. Thank you. Still in this direction. I mean, so imagine that you have uh, you mentioned that you can use timing detectors with 80 picoseconds for the physics program for the background suppression my simple question is where i f will find any study in this direction showing this effect because sorry here i have some doubts about 80 picoseconds can help you even in round two and not talking about round three. With a better than 30 picoseconds, it can, uh, it's a different story, but I'm interested in, a, in, a, in some physics studies. So can you please give me a hint, even okay, via I, I should say that uh, there are uh, notes on, uh, um, on timing uh, resolution uh, coming out. Uh, I could not show you the, the, yeah. the, the, the final results because they are not yet approved, but uh, uh, you, Get your answer in a while. <laughs> Thank you very much, Adam. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. So we, we, we're out of uh, time, unfortunately. Um, I also have some questions re regarding um, the difference between sector 5, 6 and 4.5 and, 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 and how this improvement in the mechanics will allow you to adjust the, the detector position and and how that will work in an operational sense. So but we can do that on matter most, yeah. Yeah, maybe. but the idea is simple. So instead of just uh, moving the Roman pots uh, during uh, the technical stop, we will move uh, internally the detectors. Yeah. Okay. So you won't need any realignment or anything like that? No, no. Uh, no, because there will be, so, I mean, uh, part of the first alignment, uh, then uh, the, mm -hmm. the movement uh, will, will be internal to the, to the pot. So, we, okay. you, always, you will keep knowing the relative uh, uh, movement. Okay, okay, thanks very much. That, and be calibrated, of course. Okay, thanks very much, that, that makes sense. Thank you very much. Okay, I think uh, we need to unfortunately close this session. Uh, there's the coffee break um, coming up.
and uh, maybe I leave it to to Jerry to let us know when when we we should come back. Yeah, we are unfortunately late, but I think that we still need like five minutes break uh, at least for toilet and these things. So, okay, so we will be back in ten o five. So in five uh, minutes, and and the second part of the session will be chaired by Prafula. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yes. <laughs>
Hello, uh, please, uh, Dr. Uh, Jin Yifan or Yin Yifan. Yes. Yeah, uh, we, I, 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 I still cannot see your presentation uploaded to the Indigo. Yes, that, that's true. I'm actually doing it now. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Thank I you. you. Yes, <laughs> I'll do it now. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, Praful, I think that we can start. Okay. Uh, let me welcome back uh, uh, the session after coffee break. Um, this session, we have uh, six talks and uh, from Atlas, CMS, and again, Bell. So the each uh, speaker uh, allotted 15 minutes. So we'll stick to the same time uh, allocation and 12 minutes for the talk, three minutes for the question and answer. So I will uh, give a reminder at uh, after 10 minutes of the talk and uh, please uh, stick to the time allotted. So uh, let's start the uh, uh, first talk of the session by Sosi Suna from KK. He is going to give us an update on the operational experience on that last pixel detector. Please. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes? Yes, okay. yes. Right, okay, then let me share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Hello? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, I will, I gonna give a report about the operational experience uh, for the Atlas Pixel Detector through the Lanto experiment. Uh, go to the next slide. So maybe I think I, I don't need to introduce uh, uh, about the Atlas detector itself, but uh, uh, for the pixel detector, as you know, this is uh, located on the most inner side. And uh, uh, there was a two uh, uh, naming, um, uh, there are one things uh, we, we need, I, I need to remind you uh, that the, uh, there are two uh, uh, naming scheme uh, about the pixel detector we have uh, two different pixel system. One for the uh, the, the pixel uh, was uh, since used in the LAN one. Then uh, the other pixel was the uh, new pixel detector introduced in the in the uh, uh, since LAN two experiment, which is located in the uh, very very close to the uh, uh, most inner side on the uh, beam pipe. So uh, we have a uh, four uh, barrel four layer system in the barrel and the three and layer system in the end cap disk. Uh, go to the next slide. So first of all, uh, this is the uh, outer pixel detector uh, was used in Sinsla 1. This is the original one. Uh, that uh, spec of this pixel detector uh, is consist of the uh, any uh, sensor uh, with a dimension of the 60 by 60 with the 250 uh, micron thickness then um, with the 60 AFES front end uh, on the sensor. Um, this uh, consists of the uh, about uh, uh, 1744 module surrounding the beam pipe, uh, which consists of the uh, 80 million channels. And this output the uh, eight bit time over uh, threshold. Uh, this was designed for radiation uh, tolerance of the uh, uh, one times 10 to 15 uh, neutrino equivalent. Uh, which correspond to the uh, 50 mega uh, radiation for the electronics. Uh, go to the next slide. Then um, this is a, a new pixel detector uh, installed in the uh, since run two. We call this is the uh, IBL. Uh, this was the uh, named as the uh, insertable B layer. Um, this uh, um, detector was uh, uh, quite new uh, since run two. And, uh, and, uh, and more superior spec, spec uh, from the uh, outer pixel detector. Uh, now uh, this IBL uh, detector itself has the uh, already uh, 20 million uh, channels with the uh, smaller pixel size uh, 
uh, about, about twice smaller than the outer pixel. And uh, it's a uh, more rad radiation hard, five times uh, um, hard than the uh, outer pixels, which is the uh, five times 10 to 15 neutral equivalent, uh, 250 megalab. So uh, as shown in the bottom two plot, this is a performance with and without uh, this new detector. Uh, blue, uh, this uh, left-hand side plot shows the uh, performance of the B tagging. Uh, blue is the uh, without IBL and red is with this new detector. You see that the, uh, in the same efficiency point, almost we got uh, uh, 10 times better uh, rejection power. And also on right-hand side plot is the uh, resolution of the uh, tracking uh, as a function of the uh, momentum. You see visible difference uh, about twice better than before. Uh, go to the next slide. So with two uh, detector in the operation wise point of view, um, we have uh, uh, two different way to manage uh, this operation. So as you see in the LHC LAN2, um, that the accelerator um, makes a, a big effort and to make the a large luminosity, that uh, peak luminosity is already twice higher than the design value. Uh, which is uh, which makes us very difficult uh, for the uh, old leader system in the outer uh, pixel detector. On the other hand, we also have a new detector IBL. This was the first time to operate uh, such a uh, high radiation environment. So uh, we also need to uh, 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 acquire the accumulate the uh, more knowledge to how to operate the new detector. So we need an experience. Then uh, in the end, uh, later of the uh, lung two, uh, radiation damage is more severe, especially for the uh, B layer. This is a second innermost layer, uh, which is old one, uh, was already close to the uh, final, uh, already close to the uh, design uh, radiation hardness, which is a halfway already five times 10 to 40. So uh, this, uh, makes the, uh, some efficiency degradation. Uh, that uh, I will show in the uh, later slide that becoming already uh, visible uh, in the next slide. So uh, here is a, a operation uh, overview. I, can, I cannot explain uh, for the experience through the run to, uh, but uh, uh, typically uh, uh, our pixel detector, our atlas detector operating on the about 100 kilohertz at the hardware level one trigger and recording the one kilohertz at HLT, uh, which with the about 55 pileup interaction per event. Uh, on the other, uh, uh, but the pixel has operated very well, almost achieving the 99.5% uh, uh, data quality efficiency uh, through the uh, LAN2. So uh, here, uh, plot showing the some record uh, uh, our how the uh, a lead out error occurred as a function of the uh, time uh, through the uh, 2015 to 2018 or 2017 in that case. So uh, first of all, uh, beginning of the LAN2, as you see, this is monitored by the uh, synchronization error in the lead out system. If the uh, timestamp is different in the uh, collision data and the pixel detector that makes uh, some uh, synchronization error, we monitor this such an uh, error rate then if that error rate uh, is uh, uh, more than 10%, um, for instance, that is a really quick critical limit, limit, we lose the data. So uh, here uh, we see some profile how the uh, error is controlled. Um, in the beginning of the 2015, and somehow that error rate is about a few percent level, even though luminosity is low, then uh, continuing the, it off. Oh, this is the 2016. Then uh, 2017, uh, in the middle of uh, quarter one, um, after, after quarter one, uh, we introduced the, uh, some um, mechanism how to control the uh, 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 lead out error that makes us the, uh, reduce the uh, down the, the uh, lead out error drastically. Then later, we also improved, uh, improved some detector itself. So uh, in the end, uh, in the end of the uh, run two, even though we have a, a high luminosity, 
uh, we, in the end, we control uh, such an error rate uh, less than 0.1% uh, level. So now I'm going to explain what was done for, for RAN2 as the operation, operational experience. Uh, first of all, uh, we made uh, some leader upgrade in the uh, older pixel system. So as I mentioned, in the outer pixel detector operating on the old leader system, uh, that the a, a new IBL detector, um, which is a, a bit slower uh, to, 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 to read out the uh, current LHC conditions. So, uh, so this table shows the uh, upgrade schedule. Uh, first, uh, we have a serious problem in the layer two, that is uh, only uh, record the uh, data in the 40 megabps. Uh, that was uh, uh, urgently was uh, necessary to upgrade as soon as possible to, to the 80. Then uh, sequentially, we made some upgrade uh, up, up to the uh, 160 uh, uh, megabps. That was a uh, uh, twice faster lead out. Then um, we also uh, introduced the uh, resynchronization uh, machinery, which is the uh, uh, kind of the uh, uh, refresh, refresh of the uh, event counter uh, event counter at the front end level. So uh, right hand side plot uh, shows the uh, how the uh, error rate is uh, uh, reduced or suppressed. So uh, starting point is the uh, black one. Then uh, each upgrade uh, that error uh, error rate is uh, drastically reduced. Then in the end, uh, final, finally, finally we achieved uh, around uh, a red marker point. So uh, this was a, a big uh, upgrade. Uh, uh, this is a, as a function of the uh, uh, trigger rate. So this was a, a big achievement for the uh, hardware side. And also uh, we, we take the uh, same uh, leader firmware system with the uh, IBM new detector so that the uh, older uh, detector is now uh, synchronizedly, coherently use the same software so that that makes it uh, uh, easier to, to debug and maintain uh, the performance. Uh, go to the next slide. So then, uh, so no another, yeah. So yeah, you have two more minutes. Okay, okay. Okay, then the other, the other point is the uh, uh, bilayer slash evolution. As I mentioned, uh, radiation damage is uh, serious, so that the, we also deal to the, uh, sometimes raise up the uh, TL threshold, but at some point we also have to reduce the uh, uh, threshold due to the radiation damage. So first we raise up the uh, threshold. This is due to the lead out problem, lead out limitation, but uh, later in the end of the last, here we um, go lower the uh, uh, threshold uh, down to the uh, 4,000. So here right on the side plot shows the uh, tracking performance. Uh, in the end of the 2017, we have uh, some degradation about 90, 60%, but uh, uh, due the, during the uh, lowering the uh, threshold, uh, that efficiency is recovered. Now, uh, radiation damage is uh, becoming more serious, uh, impact on the uh, depletion voltage. Uh, that was uh, frequently monitored by taking the uh, high voltage scan. And this table shows the evolution of the uh, uh, bias voltage, uh, looking at the IVM starting from the 80 volt, but now we are operating the 400 volt, which is uh, five times higher already. And the uh, right-hand side plot is the uh, uh, high scan as a function of the uh, bias voltage, you see uh, that the uh, plateau uh, is not appeared already, but still we keep the, uh, uh, try to keep the uh, higher operating point. Uh, so uh, this was a probably a serious big issue in the lance three operation. Now, other point is the, uh, we also met this some optimal uh, problem. Uh, since the beginning of the uh, LAN2, uh, this optoboard, this is the optical fiber link from the uh, on, on detector to the off detector. Um, that uh, failure device is uh, uh, broken as a function of the time and at some point increasing. The plot showing the, uh, that uh, failure rate is increasing. So uh, this was, uh, uh, we, we lose the signal 
uh, so that we urgently need to replace uh, this uh, optoboard link uh, that was uh, located uh, located on the uh, surface of the uh, inner detector. Now, uh, next slide. This is a summary of the heat on track efficiencies through the uh, full run to experiment. As I said, the uh, innermost layer and the secondmost layer, uh, the efficiency is degraded as a function of the time, but at some point, this was uh, recovered due to the uh, lowering the threshold or sometimes depressing the uh, hardware uh, fixing. Uh, the uh, uh, leader system. Then uh, on the other hand, layer one, the layer two is a still manageable level, but uh, we already have uh, some experience how to recover the efficiency. Then next slide, uh, some weak structure is still observed uh, from the IBL. This is uh, mostly comes from the single problematic module, uh, likely from the uh, SEU event. So I, I explain in the later slide. Then next slide, 30 is the a, a fraction of the inactive module. Uh, this is uh, correlated to the uh, hardware upgrade and uh, how the uh, synchronization uh, method is implied. Uh, so you, you see some fluctuations here and some improvement in the end. Uh, this is uh, how we have in, in, in the current detector. Then last point, uh, this is uh, probably a more uh, important topics in future. Uh, this is a single event uh, upset, single event effect. We have two effects, uh, one from a set, uh, single event transient, uh, which hits the logic circuit and makes the false uh, signal in the uh, memory. And the uh, SEU is, as you know, the bit flip of the, uh, uh, by the direct interaction in the uh, memory chip. Uh, this was uh, observed in first in the global register in the showing the uh, top right hand side plot. Uh, we see some deep structure here then uh, during the time, but uh, at some point uh, we, uh, after uh, refresh the uh, global memory, uh, the uh, low voltage current is recovered, uh, synchronized the uh, occupancy is also recovered. This is a, a proof uh, uh, we observe the single event upset, a single event effect. Then um, we set the uh, uh, refresh mechanism uh, first reset the global memory every five seconds. Um, then uh, second, uh, we refresh the global memory, I don't know, uh, pixel uh, register uh, every 11 uh, minutes uh, per, uh, uh, cyclically. So uh, bottom plot shows the impact, uh, how the uh, uh, occupancy is uh, uh, recovered uh, from the uh, single event effect. So uh, as a summary, uh, we made a experiment. Uh, we see the exp exp excellent performance over the LAN tool and uh, uh, high granularity, a uh, high quality uh, data quality of uh, more than 99.5%. And uh, we also gained experience how to recover from radiation damage and uh, how to overcome the read out limit limitation issue. For LAN 3, radiation damage will be more severe and we re require some. Um, fine tuning of the operation parameter. And also in the simulation side, we are planning to uh, uh, employ the uh, radiation damage simulation for, for future uh, uh, in Lansley. I think uh, that's all. Thank you, Suna sir. So any questions? Uh, Not maybe... I have. Yes. Uh, sorry, maybe maybe you have mentioned this already, but I would like to ask what is the current situation with the uh, IBL and if the problem with the TID peak that was observed at the beginning is completely off now, or there are still some issues connected with this? Uh, TIE, TID is another issue that the originally we saw, we, we, we thought that the that TID is a, a saturator uh, above uh, one megalab. But uh, we still see some drift future. Uh, I don't know how it still uh, keep going, but uh, still keep grow, um, continuing. Uh, some uh, uh, tuning is still necessary. Okay, but but you are probably very well after the peak, behind of this TID peak, uh, so it should mm -hmm. be better now. Yeah, 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 yeah. It should okay. be better now. Of course, yes, yes. Yeah. No, uh, okay. Of course, we pass away the peak. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sunasan. So we are running out of time. Maybe we can take more questions on the matter most. Thank you, Sunasan, for a nice update. 
and we'll move to the next Thank speaker. Uh, next speaker is uh, Benjamin Natchman from LBNL. And he's going to give us update on the modeling of uh, radiation damage to pixel sensor in Atlas detector. All right, can you hear me and see my slides? Uh, yes. All right, fantastic, thank you. Um, so let me um, go right ahead. Uh, if I can advance, there we go. So you heard there's a talk from, from Soshi right now who gave an excellent introduction to um, the Atlas pixel detector and the operational condition. So, I won't uh, spend basically any time talking about that. Just as a reminder, here's a picture of where our detector sits at the heart of the Atlas detector. And today I'm gonna focus about how we can uh, measure radiation damage effects. So you heard a bit about that uh, radiation damage effects already from, from Soshi. Um, great, so I don't think I need to spend much time with this audience telling you what uh, radiation damage does to, to our detectors. Um, but I wanted to highlight a few things before I get into the the main part of the talk will be, a, which will be about um, leakage current. So just to remind everyone, we're talking about um, hybrid pixel detector where we have focus here will be about um, the sensor damage. And in particular, the non-ionizing energy loss, which will damage the silicon lattice and causes defects, which act as charge uh, traps for charge character carriers. And there are multiple impacts of, of these defects. So in particular, the electric field is deformed inside the sensor bulk. And this plot on the top left shows the electric field as a function of depth. This is a simulation where you can see the different colors correspond to different points in time. And there's a significant um, modification of the electric field as we go from the beginning of run two, for instance, to the end of, of run two for these, uh, or to the end of 2017, at least for the IBL sensors. So in addition to the deformation of the electric field, there's also an increase in the um, depletion voltage and the sensor leakage current. And that's what I'll spend most of the talk um, discussing. But one thing I did want to mention is about um, the collected charge. So these um, uh, traps, they, they, uh, they can reduce the amount of collected charge that's um, deposited by, for instance, a minimum ionizing particle. And this pull on the top left, if you focus just on the red, uh, the dark orange uh, color, this shows the cluster charge on the um, uh, IBL, the innermost pixel layer, is a function of time in run two. And you can see this sort of um, continuous decreasing trend, which corresponds to uh, more and more charge being trapped as the um, uh, more, more non-ionizing non energy uh, loss is accumulated through, um, throughout um, run two. And this, of course, has a broad impact on physics, which I'll maybe briefly touch on at the end um, before concluding. Um, but the radiation environment at, uh, inside our, our detector is, is really extreme. So this plot on the left shows the fluence as a function of Z and radius. So it falls roughly as one over R squared. And the innermost um, uh, layer of the IBL has experienced a significant amount of radiation. And I think everyone's familiar probably with the units that we use to measure um, the fluence, which is the non-ionizing energy loss um, uh, uh, in, in units of um, one EVB neutron equivalent. And um, uh, for, for the pixel detector, most of the damage comes from primary charge hadrons, primary hadrons in particular charge hadrons. As you go further away from the interaction point, the contribution from, from uh, neutrons uh, is, uh, is more prominent. And uh, this plot um, on page eight shows the uh, fluence as a function of time since the start of run two. And the upshot is that we've, we've accumulated something like one, ten, one times 10 to the 15 neutron equivalent per centimeter squared in our innermost layer. And um, the red here is the innermost layer and the other three colors here correspond to the outer layers. Uh, so she noted the innermost layer was inserted uh, in run two. So it starts at zero, the red starts at zero and goes up and it crosses the other layers um, in about in 2016. And sort of being able to, to um, determine the radiation damage is really critical for um, informing many aspects of, of um, uh, our experiment, in particular operations, offline analysis, and of course, designing uh, future detectors. Okay, so we measure the fluence, uh, we can measure the fluence in many ways, but the most common method is to use a leakage current, which is, um, proportional to the, um, the fluence, at least over short time scales. And so here's the, how we model the, the leakage current. So we measure leakage current on the left is delta, delta leakage current. If it starts at zero, then the delta is, is the leakage current at a given time. We want to know, for instance, what the fluence is um, and the relationship for a given uh, integrated luminosity, how much fluence do we measure? Uh, and uh, the, the rest is the V is the depleted volume, which we assume is a constant, um, which I'll come back to in a second. And then the rest models basically the time dependence that's due to um, annealing. 
Okay, so here's a plot that shows for the outer three pixel layers. So the so-called B layer layer one and layer two, the leakage current normalized to zero temperature, zero degrees Celsius as a function of integrated luminosity. And you can see a comparison between the prediction from the um, various uh, uh, models. So um, a model of the, interact the generation of the particles, the interaction with the detector and the damage to the sensors and um, their conversion to leakage current, which is um, using the Hamburg model. You can see um, really excellent agreement across the whole the whole time, um, at least for the for the shape. The overall um, simulation here has been scaled um, in order to to show just the just the shape. Okay, one of the key challenges here is that I, as I mentioned, we're correcting the zero degrees Celsius, so the temperature is not constant as a function of time. And in order to make this comparison, we have to correct for the temperature dependent. We, we correct for the temperature dependence, which is known, and it de depends you know, exponentially in this way. Uh, on the temperatures to go from a given reference temperature, um, it go from a given temperature to a reference temperature. And uh, one of the um, nice measurements we've made recently is we've tried to um, basically determine uh, the most important parameter in that equation, which is E effective. So E effective tells us um, how we can convert um, between for a given reference temperature to, temperature to a given reference temperature. And this is determined using temperature scans. So the left plot here shows the top panel, the, the temperature on a given module is a function of time. And you can see we've basically stepped, stepped the temperature through multiple values. And so um, with, these temp with these data, we can measure the current and we can apply a correction. And basically we can determine the correction to the temperature. So based on this E effective, that makes the corrected current independent of time. And that should be the, the correct E effective that basically allows us to remove the um, temperature dependence. And so this uh, E effective of course is known from the literature but there is quite um, some uncertainty and so we wanted to measure it in situ and the bottom on the right shows the, um, the extracted E effective for all of our layers uh, as a function of Z. And you can see it's you know, roughly consistent across um, the layers, especially the outer layers. And uh, also we have two measurements in different points in time for the IBL. And um, there's a little a systematic uh, shift between the IBL, the innermost layer and the outer layers. And there are a variety of sources of uncertainty that the error bar here comes from the biggest source of uncertainty, which is that there's basically a degeneracy between the measurement of the E effective and the, the temperature on the sensors. Um, and so there's some uh, unknown offset that is hard to determine in situ. And also the black open and closed points, which are a bit hard to see on this plot, but if you zoom in, you can see um, there's a systematic shift there. It's very small between different points in time. And this is something where we're still um, trying to understand to see if there's some, some time dependence. Okay, but given this um, value, we can um, plot forward to then extract the uh, fluence rate for all the layers. So this plot shows uh, as a function of Z, the um, fluence rate. So that is the conversion between integrated luminosity and fluence for all, all four of the, um, the layers, the pixel layers. So the black one is the IBL, the innermost layer. So innermost means more fluence. And uh, the most uh, striking features of this plot are that um, the, if you look at the black, the, the, um, the points have a much stronger Z dependence than the prediction. Um, you know, if you go to say 40 or no, the end, which is between roughly 30, uh, 30 centimeters, you see that the black data points are about a factor of two below the prediction. Uh, and uh, if you look at the outer layers, you can see that the data points are, are systematically above the predictions. And uh, that's not true for the innermost layer, but it's true systematically for the outermost layers. And it's equal zero, the effect is, uh, is not small. So it can be you know, up to 50% or so. So one thing we've, we've been doing recently is try to put this in the context of the full um, inner detector, um, at least the silicon part of the inner detector. And so now what I'm gonna basically spend the rest of the talk discussing is how this, the pixel detector measurement um, sort of fits together with the rest of the um, silicon based inner detector. So now we'll have plots that look like this where you can still see the four layers of our pixel detector, but now you also see the strip detector, the, the SCT um, at the bottom, which is further away and therefore has lower fluence. Um, but uh, the interesting observation is that, as I mentioned before, so at z equals zero, the data in simulation are about the same for the innermost layer. Then it's about 50% higher for data for the outer pixel layers. And then for the strips, it's basically back to being about the same, which is a sort of an interesting, interesting z-dependent um, trend. And you can also see that the our radius-dependent trend, and you can see that the z-dependence also in the strips is, is um, uh, pretty, pretty um, uh, spot on for the, for the predictions. Uh, okay, uh, so here's another way of looking at exactly the same information. So now as a function of rapidity, our super rapidity instead of Z, there's sort of a nice way to see the, um, the fiducial acceptance of the inner detector. You can see basically we have a tracking acceptance up to about 
And uh, in, in, this, in this range, it's kind of a nice way of looking at it because you know, the particle production is roughly constant as a function of superfluidity. And so you might expect something like roughly a constant um, uh, damage, although we can see like from the black points that there's a much stronger Z dependence, which is now um, quite clear at the high rapidity. Hi, Ben. Two yes. more minutes. Thank you. Um, all right, so uh, one, one other uh, way of looking at this, these data is uh, now uh, as a function of radius. So before it was a function of Z um, for a given uh, layer. Now you can see basically for each of our, our layers, there's four pixel layers and four um, strip layers uh, in the barrel. And, and you can see the, the data points and the predictions. So um, each point corresponds to different, for a different for a specific color corresponds to different values of Z. So you see there's a really big spread in Z for the innermost pixel layers. And then the spread gets smaller as you go to further radio, as you go further out because the Z dependence becomes smaller. Um, and you can see roughly this one over R squared trend. Uh, what, was, what you can see sort of nicely in the strips is that the, the, our two simulations here, which correspond to different transport models. So j 4 and Fluca sort of nicely bracket the data, um, which is not so much the case on the, on the innermost layers, um, but, but you can see this sort of nice uh, overall um, uh, coherence between the innermost and outermost layers. Okay, um, so that's basically all I want to say uh, for now about the leakage current and the, and the measurement of the global picture of the radiation damage within our um, silicon-based inner detector. And I want to end um, just by saying that this information is really critical now in, for, for many reasons, but one of the um, uh, uh, most critical inputs is for our offline simulation or to um, make, make various um, predictions for, for physics analysis. And so one thing that Soshi alluded to at the end of his talk is that we've now integrated fluence modeling into Atlas simulation which will be default in run three. And the most important input is the fluence, which we've now measured on all of our um, pixel layers. And this very complicated looking graph basically uh, describes the, uh, the impact of uh, radiation damage on our digitization, where we model the, this charge trapping I mentioned at the beginning and its, its influence on the deformation of the electric field and uh, the resulting loss in, in signal, which I don't have time to discuss in detail, but you can uh, follow the link at the bottom of the slide for more details. Okay, that brings me to the end. So the fluence is really a key ingredient to radiation damage modeling. Uh, we performed a very detailed measurement using leakage current, not only for our pixel detector, but also coherently within the whole um, silicon-based inner detector, including our strips. And this has been integrated um, into the radiation damage, into the simulation of, of Atlas. And uh, this is just one um, teaser plot that shows from Atlas simulation, uh, what is the cluster charge for various points in time. And the, uh, the point is that uh, we have the four pixel layers, and you can see the charge changes as a function of time because of radiation damage in our simulation, which can be partially recovered by changing, for instance, the high voltage. So you can see that the charge drops and then goes up and then drops again. And the jump up is because of uh, increasing the high voltage. And uh, this, this structure will be, of course, uh, very important for improving data analysis in uh, run three and also planning for the high luminosity upgrade. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ben, for the nice uh, detailed uh, result on the radiation damage for the pixel detector Atlas experiment. Any question to Ben? Maybe I would have a question. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, I remember that you are not in the comfortable time zone now. <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> for that. Uh, and uh, my, my question is probably stupid, but you mentioned that the me measurement of the temperature of the sensor is critical for these models. So uh, how actually are you determining the uh, sensor temperature? Because it is definitely not easy to measure it. Right, so uh, we have on module, um, on module NTCs to measure the temperature. And so we have a, a, a very fine in space um, and, and time measurement of the temperature. Um, but uh, there can be an, you know, an offset between the measured, the, the temperature reported in the NTC and the actual relevant sensor uh, temperature. And this, this offset, which we just don't know what it is, it could be um, you know, a couple of degrees, which would explain that the error bar here, I think is two degrees, if I remember correctly. Um, and so you can see kind of what a two degree shift would do um, to this measurement. Okay. Okay. So, so is there, for example, a way how to, how to determine this offset, like uh, in some lab measurement or something like this? Exactly. So this is something we want to follow up on. I mean, in principle, it's one thing we have studied is you could imagine simultaneously extracting the E effective and the temperature offset. In principle, if you look at the, it's, you can't tell from the equation, but they're actually not degenerate. Uh, in principle, one could do it form, you know, formally. Um, 
However, in, in practice, they're basically degenerate. So it's not possible to extract it in situ. Um, uh, but yeah, so, so there's, a common, there's two possibilities. So one is to try to do some simulations to see if we can learn something about what the offset would be. Um, uh, and the other is to do some lab measurements. Even those are a bit difficult, but indeed, this is, this is exactly what we want to do to try to pin down what the value is. OK, perfect. Thank you. OK, so for me, one more question. Uh, th there was some kind of uh, estimation of the depletion depth using Lorentz angle measurement, if you remember. And is it uh, still, uh, you, you monitor the uh, depletion depth as you go on the radiation, and that is how you go with the voltage change, bias voltage, or, or you don't? Right, exactly. So I didn't talk about depletion voltage, so she mentioned it a little bit. Uh -huh, we, okay. We have multiple ways of, of, of monitoring um, the need to change the depletion voltage, but yes, the main one is using these high voltage. We use the high voltage scan, it's not the, not the Lorentz angle. Um, okay. as the primary, the primary way of doing it. But, but yeah, we, we monitor with the um, high voltage scans where we m measure the charge collection efficiency basically and it's, it's saturation. And so on this plot, uh, the reason I picked this plot is because you can see on the bottom panel, the high voltage basically. And so yeah. um, the, 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 all the jumps are because we noticed that the, the, um, we need to increase based on the, the high voltage scans. And in fact, um, in 2016, we noticed that our, our innermost uh, layer was running under depleted actually. Um, and this was noticed um, both in the charge, in the high voltage scan, but also in the leakage current, because if you look at ratios of leakage currents, you can tell that, um, right? So we, we know that um, ratios of leakage currents for the same, the same uh, Z should be constant. And uh, they're, they're not, it wasn't, it wasn't our same radius should be constant. It wasn't constant. And so um, uh, that told us that we were under depleted basically. And so we fixed that and now it's constant. And, and the other rises are because of high voltage scans. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ben, for for nice talk, and uh, and uh, we we'll move to the next next speaker. Next speaker is Patrick from Beji. He is going to talk about the alignment of CMS tracker. Hi, can you hear me? Ah, uh, yes. Please share. Okay, I will share the slides. Yes, fine. Good. Okay. Um... So uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present uh, the work uh, about the, the alignment group of the CMS tracker. Uh, so my name is Patrick. I joined the CMS collaboration end of 2014. And uh, among other activities, um, I'm uh, taking care of the alignment of the CMS tracker. And uh, today I'm very proud to present the, the result of, uh, of our group. Uh, so let me go to a quick introduction, a quick reminder about the CMS tracker and, uh, and the, the concept of the silicon modules where the resolution is uh, around 10 microns. Uh, you can see uh, um, a, a figure representing one quarter of the uh, phase one detector. Uh, you may know that at the end of 2016, the uh, pixel uh, was upgraded uh, from the phase one, zero to phase one, uh, but the strip hasn't changed. So our detector is roughly five meter long and uh, two, two meter of diameter. It's the, the largest uh, silicon detector in the world in uh, size and granularity. And uh, we have uh, around 20,000 modules. So we have uh, two challenges basically with the uh, alignment. So after the mechanical alignments, we have uh, um, a precision on the position of the module, which is one order of magnitude larger than the, the track resolution, the heat resolution, sorry. And then uh, uh, modules and substructures are moving with time and you need to ensure a constant uh, response of the detector over time. Here, I'm only talking about the CMS tracker alignments. There was a presentation by Yun Yong yesterday about the muon chamber alignments, which uh, I point you here. Uh, the, the, the purpose of the alignment is, uh, is illustrated by the two figures on the top of slide three, where you see on the left what you think your tracker is doing and in the center what it really looks like. Um, so in, in basically the alignment consists in determining the position, orientation and surface deformation of the uh, roughly 20,000 uh, sensor of the CMS tracker. And uh, we, we must include uh, the, the, the time variations and then we must uh, perform the alignment during the data taking on short time scale and after the data taking to reach ultimate precision. So that means roughly uh, 200,000 parameters at least if you want to do a, a precise alignment. Uh, so the scope of this presentation is to present the general strategies and the performance of the alignment of the central silicon tracker, especially with relevant data. And, uh, and the techniques presented in this presentation are, are, I think, of large interest, not only for alignment of other types of detector, but as soon as you have a large number of parameters uh, in your problem. Let's go to the general concept of uh, track-based alignment. 
um, slide four. So basically, we minimize the same chi square as when doing tracking, except that uh, we also uh, release the alignment parameters, uh, which are here denoted with p. And uh, at CMS, we, we use two algorithms. One is MillipD, which actually is independent of CMS, but CMS has been a driving user of MillipD, uh, where we release uh, all uh, alignment and track parameters uh, simultaneously. And another uh, algorithm is called HIP, and there the, the procedure is uh, done iteratively, where P and Q are, are treated uh, separately. Uh, of course, we have a few challenges. One is that we have an extremely large amount of parameters. So both algorithms linearize the chi-square, and then we, we utilize uh, tools from linear algebra and numerical analysis to reduce the problem to something achievable in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and then we have uh, several issues. We have, uh, we have uh, potentially non-physical distortions arising uh, from uh, internal symmetries of the problem. This is what we call weak modes, as I mentioned earlier in this session. Uh, so they denote uh, invariance, uh, non-physical transformation of the geometry. Um, and uh, uh, another problem are variations of conditions over time uh, related to, uh, for instance, changes of temperature or magnetic field. And then uh, last, uh, we also have a strong interplay with the local reconstruction. Uh, so we are very sensitive to the aging of the, de of the detector over time of the, of the modules, of the silicon modules. So let me first describe a little bit more the weak modes. Uh, the weak modes correspond to any transformation that uh, don't change significantly the chi square. So it means, in other words, that uh, it it's, uh, changes a set of valid tracks into another set of valid tracks. So a helix will stay a helix, for instance. And that arises, among others, from symmetries of the detectors and the uh, um, uh, symmetry of the collision track topology. Two examples are shown in the middle. On the left hand side, you can see a telescope with mode with uh, are varying proportion to delta z and uh, in the center a uh, twist weak mode. Um, to, to constrain weak modes or to control weak modes you need to use a special track topology and for this we use two types. At CMS we use uh, resonance tracks which allow uh, to constrain modules in different directions instead of only constraining modules in, a, in, a neighboring, in the neighboring of the tracks and another is to use cosmic rays which are vertical tracks just breaking the symmetry of, of the detector. A third possibility would be to use beam halo. They would be analog to cosmic rays, but horizontal. We, we are currently not using them, but uh, we are investigating its feasibility uh, at CMS already for a phase two detector. And then we need to accumulate as much as possible uh, resonances in cosmic rays, and they will play a crucial role in the quality of the alignments. Time variations, uh, there are several causes uh, for, for uh, affecting on, on the alignments. We have magnet cycles and temperature variations. The former mostly affects the large mechanical structures and the latter uh, affects uh, introduce some noise at uh, the module level. And then uh, we also have the aging of the module, which I already mentioned. We are working in the very high, very high radiation environments, and uh, this, uh, the, the change of uh, Lorentz rift inside of the silicon modules uh, should, in principle, be covered by some dedicated calibration, but it's not entirely the case, and part of it is absorbed in the alignment. So we have two solutions to face the time variations. One is to uh, apply, uh, one is applied during data taking, which just consists in realigning as often as possible with, of course, limited statistics of special track topologies. And the second is applied for uh, uh, end of year or, or uh, so what we call legacy reprocessings, where, where we, we can, uh, where we have more time to perform the alignments, uh, where we want to realign the, the whole, the whole uh, year. And there we introduce hierarchy and align separately the absolute position of high level structures which, which can mean different things with time dependence and the relative positions of the modules uh, to the, these high-level structures without time dependence. And that is a compromise to include time dependence while avoiding splitting uh, samples of special tracks. Uh, so the high-level structures can mean different things, but typically they can mean uh, sub-detectors like uh, barrel, pix uh, barrel pixel half barrels, for instance, something like this. Now let me go to uh, the alignment during run two. Um, so we have uh, two things to discuss. First, uh, the alignment as startup and the alignments all along the year. So at the startup, what we do at the beginning of the year is to align just with cosmic tracks. Uh, the top left figure shows uh, the average rates uh, of cosmic tracks at CMS. Uh, effectively, the rates, uh, the track rate is of two hertz. And uh, with cosmic tracks, we try to align high level structures um, before first PP collisions, at least in the pixel detector. Um, each year, roughly half of the cosmics uh, with magnetic fields are taken during commissioning. Um, now we also take some zero Tesla uh, cosmics, and uh, if sometimes uh, we have enough statistics even to perform alignment at the module level in the pixel, and that is, for instance, what we did at the beginning of 2018. 
This is still limited statistics, but this is enough to, to already improve significantly the performance of the alignment. And the uh, bottom left figure is illustrating this case where we compare the, the performance of reconstruction of the subtracts of a cosmic tract traversing the whole detector. And then you can see that using the old geometry from 2017, we got uh, bad results or large differences between the track parameters of, uh, of the subtract. And, uh, and the way with, uh, with the realignment, we get much better performance. Then uh, we, we use first collision tracks. Uh, we must react very quickly in order to avoid time dependent alignments, which means of, of, which also means more delicate configuration. Uh, but then we suddenly have much more statistics so we can improve uh, the, the uh, statistical precision of the alignments. Of course, at this point, we still don't have any uh, um, uh, resonance data. So that that goes into two muons. So full module alignment is still difficult to, to achieve in the, in the whole detector. Along the year, then uh, uh, we, we, we try to avoid having to uh, derive the alignment by hands and we try to set up some uh, automated alignments. So once we are confident in the, in the alignment that is being used to record the data, we, we, uh, we activate the, the automated alignment. This is uh, the, the, what is shown on the right figure uh, in white, um, where we show the, the movements of the half barrels uh, along X in the barrel pixel. And the idea is to align as soon as possible with the most recent data, with a very simple uh, collision track data, so without special track topology. Uh, of course, we can only align high-level structures, so, so, uh, so me mechanical structures, uh, so that we avoid having too large number of parameters, and we only align in a pixel. So that can be derived and applied in less than 48 hours, so at the very high rates. And uh, however, the, there is one limitation, we cannot correct for radiation effects, in which case the custom alignments has to be derived manually and, and deployed manually. This happens, for instance, when we change the, the calibration of, uh, of uh, the local reconstruction of the pixel, which is shown by the dashed vertical lines in the trends. Uh, let me move on and go to the uh, so-called legacy reprocessing, which was uh, the, the last very large campaign that we did to, to uh, uh, rederive the whole alignment constants. Um, slide nine. So uh, you may know that the CMS collaboration decided two years ago to perform a, um, a whole uh, reprocessing of the, of the data covering uh, uh, nearly the whole run two, so from 16 to 18, corresponding to roughly 114 the barns for the alignment group that meant around one year of intense work to ultimate to produce the ultimate run to alignment. Um, so let me give you a few, uh, a few points about this campaign. So uh, what we did is to align each year separately, but in a single and global fit in order to accumulate enough cosmics. Since this is the limiting factor, but uh, in the same time, um, uh, we could not uh, group two years together because differences are too large. Uh, we were able to cope with the residual systematic changes in heat positions due to the radiation thanks to, a, to an appropriate hierarchy of alignment parameters. I will come back to that point in a few slides. And uh, we, we did, uh, in this context, uh, the largest alignment fits to date in terms of number of parameters to align with up to 700,000 parameters. Uh, I think that's, that's our record. Uh, all in all, that means we have around 220 geometries over the three years to cover the significant changes over time. On the right hand side, you can see my, my favorite picture uh, showing the, the successes of the, of the alignment uh, in the legacy reprocessing, where we look at the invariance mass, uh, uh, the, the, yeah, the invariant mass of the, the, the diamond system as a function of the outgoing uh, muon kinematics. Of course, uh, this should not depend on the outgoing muon kinematics, this should just correspond to the mass of the Z. Uh, but if you see some, uh, some systematic pattern, this indicates uh, systematic misalignment, uh, typically weak modes here, the twist weak mode. And then you can see that uh, the, the green curve, the legacy reprocessing is performing way better than the former uh, re uh, realignment. Uh, this figure, of course, doesn't include further momentum scale correction beyond the alignment. This is only uh, showing changes related to the alignment. Patrick, two more minutes. Yes, thank you. Um, then, of course, when you do uh, tracker alignment, what you want to check is, of course, uh, uh, quantities related to tracking and vertexing. This is shown here on this slide. Uh, I show on the top left tracking performance, the bottom left vertexing performance. I, I show here uh, three uh, um, arbitrarily chosen uh, geometries taken from 2017, and I compare them to some Monte Carlo, which uh, we try to derive the, with uh, average performance uh, between the different uh, data geometries. In the top left, what we do is that we, we measure the residual of the hits belonging to a track each time we fit it without the hits under scrutiny. Uh, so you expect here a distribution peaked around zero. Um, let me tell you that will be important for the next slide that we, we can perform this separately for inward and outward pointing modules. Uh, I will come back to that point on the next slide. 
uh, and then you can see that we have nicely peaked distributions. Um, then uh, on the bottom left, here we can see a vertex in performance. Uh, here we'll measure the impact parameter of tracks belonging to a vertex each time we fit it without the track under scrutiny. And here we expect some flat distribution around zero. Um, you can also find such a, such a um, uh, distribution where we compare with former reprocessings in the backup. Um, let me then go to the interplay with local reco. Uh, so I told you that we can do the, the tracking performance, uh, that, that we can measure the tracking performance for inward and outward pointing modules separately. Uh, this is important because uh, the local reco is affected by accumulated uh, radiation. So, so the, the, uh, the radiation corresponds to the gray arrows in the sketch in the middle, and basically the, the, the arrows uh, will, be, uh, will be changing over time. And um, the, the alignment is sensitive to changes in the Lorentz drift induced by the radiation accumulated uh, at a scale of around one inverse femtobarn, while the pixel local reconstruction calibration can only be performed every roughly 10 inverse femtobarns. And for that reason, the alignment needs to absorb residual effects uh, due to the accumulated radiation. So the, the barrel pixel modules are arranged in ladders facing inward and outward. Um, hence, uh, the systematic shift that is implied in the tracking performance will occur in uh, opposite directions. And this is what this figure here is measuring. Delta mu is the difference between the, the two peaks of the, the distribution measuring the tracking performance. And for instance, in the language during data taking in blue, you see that we were not correcting for that. And this delta mu is getting larger and larger uh, over time while uh, the, the uh, green is very close uh, from zero. Um, and that is uh, one of the uh, great successes of the uh, legacy processing. Um, last but one slide, uh, further results. Here, just the selected figure, the, again, the invariant mass, now uh, shown as a function of the, um, uh, of the azimuthal angle of one of the outgoing muons. This is uh, taking only one of the 220 geometries. Uh, at first order, we just fit with a sine curve. Um, uh, and then we show the amplitude of the sign as a function of the process luminosity on the bottom left. And then you can see again, comparing the, the same geometries that while we had uh, strong differences in the, in the alignment during data taking, we managed to reduce them very strongly uh, for the legacy reprocessing. Uh, so this has a direct impact on the reconstruction of muon tracks, especially at high PT. And uh, yeah, we interact a lot, of course, with the, with the a physics group, especially muon physics object group at CMS, and they, they of course, uh, uh, were, were very, very happy to see these improvements and they directly see an impact on, on physics. We have tons of other results, which I uh, put in the backup about movements of modules, overlap of modules, impact parameter trends, alignment errors, BTX Barry Center. We have tons of results, which I invite you to take a look at and uh, to, to ask me questions um, offline. And now let me go to the summary and conclusions. Uh, so I presented the general concept of tracker alignments. Uh, namely track-based alignments, time variations, intrinsic symmetries, and interplay with local reconstruction. Uh, I presented strategies during and after data taking uh, very briefly, uh, and then we, uh, we uh, see very, uh, well, very nice improvement of the alignments uh, performance with the legacy reprocessing, including flattening of the Z-Boson mass distributions, tracked residuals, impact parameter, and so on and so forth. Again, there is an extensive, of, an extensive amount of results in the backup, which I invite you to, to take a look at. And uh, we are preparing a paper with all this material. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Patrick, for our detailed presentation. And uh, we can take a quick one more question, please. Tom? Tom is speaking. If you go to the slide four. So yeah, thank you. So you are saying extremely large amount of parameters. So uh, related question. So how many? But uh, basically, what are these parameters? I mean, uh, uh, this is a position on the sensor or whatsoever. So exactly. what are the parameters? Just to get a feeling. Exactly. So thank you for your question. Uh, we have the position, the orientation, and surface deformation. So that means eight or nine parameters per module, depending on whether you take modules in the pixel detector or in the strip detector. Uh, and if you neglect time variation, that means roughly 200,000 parameters. If you include uh, time variation, um, then we have different cases. I don't enter in details here that can go up to 700,000 parameters. And that is only the alignment parameters. Of course, I'm not talking about the track parameters, so the, the QJ. I'm only talking about the P. Thank you for answering my question and probably also yours question related to TOF presentation because in our case, the number of parameters is uh, 
in uh, orders of smaller. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we can discuss further okay. offline uh, your case on metamask. Ah, yes. So, thank you, so, thank you Tom. So let me uh, thank uh, Patrick for his uh, presentation and for the question we can take up with the matter most. And we're running out of time, so we can move to the next speaker. Let me welcome Subankar for giving a presentation on the material budget uh, in the CMS tractor. Uh, please, Subankar. Hello, can you see the slides? Uh, yes. Uh, maybe I'll go to the presentation mode. So just give me a moment. I think now you should be seeing it in full screen mode. Yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, you'd be presenting a method of uh, estimating the tracker material budget with uh, the triplet method. And the results that I would be showing today is based on, uh, is extracted from the data collected by the CMS experiment. So, uh, so this method is called the method of triplets, and uh, today, uh, it, uh, it uses uh, three consecutive hits along a reconstructed track, and it measures the Sagitta in this uh, system, of, and extracts the radiation length uh, locally from the scattering angle. So, three hits, and hence the name uh, triplets. And uh, this uh, procedure allows for accurate and uh, granular measurement of the material budget of the tracker. And so uh, why do we want to measure the material budget is because that uh, the estimation of the material uh, measurement in the tracking volume is a key ingredient for precisely measuring the momentum, which in turn is required for measuring precision uh, quantities like, for example, if you ongoing effort on, on measuring the mass of the W boson. And so today, uh, the results that I would be showing is uh, using the data collected by the CMS experiment in 2016. And, uh, um, to, and I would be only showing the, re the results from uh, the CMS pixel detector. And uh, we will draw the comparison between uh, the ma material that is measured in data and the one that is uh, in, um, in simulation. And uh, we have used uh, 1 million uh, tracks uh, for uh, for this analysis. A quick overview of the CMS uh, tracker. So this innermost region has the pixel detectors. So this is actually uh, the phase zero uh, CMS uh, tracker. So just a warning that at the end of 2016 and 2017, the CMS pixel uh, detectors were replaced. And so the current CMS pixel tracker has four barrel layers and three end cap disks but uh, we will focus on the phase zero uh, detector. So uh, the more important uh, picture for us uh, for the uh, discussion that is following is on the, the picture on the right. So, uh, so we would uh, be using uh, information uh, from the, for the three pixel layers that is in the, in the barrel and the, uh, and the innermost uh, outer tracker, which is called the tracker inner barrel or TIB. And uh, and uh, for the for the others, uh, the outer tracker is comprised of the TOB and uh, which is the tracker outer barrel, TEC tracker end cap, and TIB. Uh, we would not be discussing uh, results from those uh, today. So uh, the uh, the track selection. So for this analysis, we uh, select tracks between uh, 0.75 GV to 1.5 GV. And uh, the lower threshold is, uh, is to reject tracks that would not uh, traverse the entire uh, radial length of the tracker. Uh, and uh, we require that the tracks uh, should have at least 14 heads because we would like to reuse the same track to build triplets, a uh, combination of triplets for in, in the entire tracking volume. Uh, the relative uncertainty on the transverse momentum uh, for in measurement should be less than 1%. And uh, in, and we do the, this measurement in beans of eta and z for each layer uh, in the barrel. So now coming to uh, the description of the method of triplets. So I'll draw your attention to the figure uh, on, on the right. So here what I'm showing is a, a trajectory of a track that is crossing three layers. And, uh, and it's... And the hits in the three layers are marked by V1, V2, and V3. 
end. What we assume is that the scattering happens in the central uh, in the central layer, and uh, we define a system uh, using these three points, uh, defining the vectors a and v, and uh, with some calculation. Uh, we can show that if you take the radius of curvature rho as rho for this track, and uh, as I said, the scattering angle to be theta, the sagitta multiplied by the transverse momentum can be expressed uh, with the formula that is uh, described uh, here. So we call this quantity, uh, P, uh, which is pt times uh, s, the sagitta as t, and uh, as you can see, this is this comprises. Uh, of two terms. The, the first term on the right, which is pt over 2 rho, is constant for a given system of triplets, uh, while the second term is pt theta by b, which is dependent on this the uh, multiple scattering uh, angle in the, in the central layer, which is uh, the layer n on the figure on the right. Now, uh, the expectation value of uh, theta is zero. So the expectation value of the ter term t will depend on the expectation value of the first term. Okay. So now uh, let us inspect the first term uh, uh, in more detail. So the pt over two rho, in, instead, uh, the pt can be expressed as uh, 0.3b rho over 100, and it would change sign depending on the sign of the track. So if I simply replace the expression of pt in the first term, so it would turn out to be uh, 0.3b over uh, 200. And here b is measured in G, uh, gv, sorry, the pt is measured in gv, v in Tesla, and rho is measured in centimeter. So simply replacing all this and assuming uh, and taking b to be 3.8 Tesla, uh, the the uh, first term turns out to be 5.710 power minus 3 GB per centimeter. And on the right, uh, we show uh, the plot of the quantity T for a system of triplets where the heats are in the barrel pixel layer 1, layer 2, and layer 3. In blue is uh, points are from Monte Carlo, and the red ones is uh, the red line is from uh, data. And uh, as you can see in for uh, both signs of the track, the uh, expectation value is 5.7, uh, 10, uh, 10 power minus 3 GV per centimeter. And uh, today I would be discussing results from two system of triplets where hits are in the pixel layer one, layer two, layer three, uh, which is the, which represents a figure um, on the left and on the figure on the right, this comes from a system of triplets where the hits are in the pixel layer two, uh, BPX layer three and TIB uh, layer one. So uh, what we can see is that in, in both the systems, the expectation value of T is uh, is around 5.710 power minus T GV per centimeter. Uh, only thing to notice is the difference in the overall normalization between uh, the left and the right plot. This is uh, because uh, the distance between uh, on the uh, the distance between the BPX layer two and tip layer one is much larger compared to the distance between BPX layer one and BPX layer three. Hence, the plot on the right has an overall uh, higher, uh, say, Y scale. So, what we are interested actually is now uh, the weight of these peaks. And so, uh, the spread of uh, the distribution of T is governed by uh, the spread in theta and which is, is given by this formula here, where uh, uh, where uh, x over x0 is the thickness of the scattering uh, layer in terms of radiation length. And if we write out the variance of t uh, that I expressed, uh, that I um, explained earlier, it, it can be uh, written out as a combination of four terms. Uh, and uh, we neglect from the contribution from the first two terms because it's uh, they con they, uh, their contribution is about one order of magnitude smaller than the uh, last two terms. And uh, so in, in order to separate the contribution of the third term which uh, and uh, the one from uh, the multiple scattering, which is the fourth term, which is uh, the term we are more interested in, what we do is uh, we plot the variance of t uh, as a function of uh, pt square. 
and uh, we t uh, and at p at p t equals to zero, the only contribution to delta t comes from the uh, the con the variance of uh, theta. Now, from the uh, from the formula above, the variance of uh, p t theta over b can be expressed as a constant uh, 0.0136 over b whole square multiplied by uh, the radiation length in that layer. So now what we do is for each mean of uh, eta, so for example, here it's uh, take, we have taken the beam of eta between 0 and 0 0.2. What we plot is uh, the variance multiplied by b square as a function of pt square. So on, on the left is is a plot coming from data and the one on the right is the one coming from Monte Carlo. And we do a straight line fit to this uh, distribution and we take uh, the intercept at uh, pt equals to zero. And this intercept for each bean would give us the material uh, budget in that uh, particular bean. So now uh, coming to uh, the uh, radiation length that is measured for BPX layer two. So, so bunker, two minutes. Huh? Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, what you see on the left is the traversed uh, uh, material uh, budget for BPX layer two. So you can see that as you move forward in higher eta, the track is traversing a larger uh, amount of material in that particular layer. And so the radiation length uh, increases as you go higher in uh, eta. On, on the right is the same uh, radiation uh, length, but it is weighted with the sign of the polar angle of the track. So essentially you are measuring the radiation length in a direction perpendicular uh, to the beam. And hence, uh, and you see that it becomes uh, flat uh, as a function of eta. Whereas uh, here on the next slide, I'm showing the same results with BPX layer three. And on the left is the traversed uh, uh, material uh, budget, which shows the same feature that was seen uh, before in, in for BPX layer two. So if you go higher in eta, the uh, material budget is increasing. Uh, the interesting feature is in the plot on the right. So if you see that even after waiting with the sign of the angle of the track, uh, the uh, for the innermost part, uh, which is let's say between minus one and one in eta, it becomes flat. However, after that, it starts to increase. So this this is the effect coming from the fact that in this region, the uh, the support structures and and the cables uh, that are present between the uh, barrel pixel layer three and the tip are also contributing to uh, to the measurement, and hence uh, this uh, you see this increase in uh, the radiation length. So uh, this brings me to the conclusion of my talk. So I presented today a new method of estimating the material budget of the CMS tracker uh, with one GV tracks. Uh, and the radiation length was measured in data and simulation for uh, the pixel detector. And what we noticed uh, is that uh, the, the distribution of the material in barrel pixel layer two is almost flat when you wait with the uh, sign of the angle of the track while for BPX layer three, it starts increasing for uh, values of eta greater than one. And as I said, this effect is because in that region, the, uh, the, uh, the approximation of constant material is failing and the material of the cables and cooling adds to the measurement in those beams. Uh, and this is weighted uh, by uh, the distance of that particular material from the central layer. And uh, with, with CMS is aiming for several precision measurements with the full run to data and the precise estimation of material budget can be a key ingredient for uh, momentum calibration and, uh, and, and because, because the momentum measurement is affected by the material budget in the tracking system. So uh, what we are currently, what we are doing is to validate this model also with the strip detectors for the CMS tracker and uh, uh, for the studies are planned for the data collected by the CMS detector in 2017 and 2018, where the geometry is uh, slightly different. And uh, what I would like to point out is that the method can be easily implemented in any silicon tracker with the geometry, which is similar to uh, the CMS tracker. 
And uh, at the end, I have a few references uh, for documentation on this uh, on this method. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Subhankar, for for your detailed presentation. Any question to Subhankar? I would have a question. You certainly plan to use this method also for the new tracker plan uh, built for high luminosity LAT. Uh, so, are you are you already doing some sim some simulations for this uh, new tracker design? Uh, I mean, you you mean that whether we are have done some uh, analysis with the simulated phase two geometries? Uh, no, at, at this point, no. We would like to first uh, concentrate on. Uh, finishing up the studies with the, fix, uh, the phase one uh, CMS tracker uh, because that would be more crucial for the upcoming, uh, let's say, analysis with full run to data. And after that, uh, you will see uh, if we can proceed to phase two as well. Okay, uh, so in that uh, in this case, uh, how the radiation length of the new tracker for Hilume LAT, uh, how it how it is calculated in a different way or because definitely you are calculating the radiation lines. Yes, I mean, for, for that simply, uh, there are tools to com compute the uh, the radiation length using on what the material that is description of uh, of the, in the present in simulation on. So you see yeah. the add up, add up. Uh, if you draw, let's say, tracks along a particular eta or z, you simply add up the amount of material that that uh, track is. Uh, Passing through. Okay, sure. So that would be a probably a nice cross check if you will apply your method. Yeah, yeah, of course, this. of course. Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Subhankar, for your presentation. Uh, so we are running out of time. So maybe I take a few questions on the mattermost. Please uh, follow on the mattermost, and we will be uh, also following all the questions. And let's uh, move to the next speaker. Joshua for giving the um, presentation on the precision luminosity measurement in CMS. Please. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hello, everyone. Let me quickly share. Yes. Okay, do you see it full screen? Yes, we do. Okay, thanks a lot. So hi everyone, my name is Yosha. I'm at DZ and on behalf of the CMS collaboration, I will present our results for the run two luminosity measurements. Uh, for an introduction, uh, as most of you probably know, uh, luminosity is a measure of the collision rate in a collider experiment. So the higher the luminosity, the more uh, collisions we have, and thus the more events for any specific process we have. So if we want to measure the cross-section of a process, we count the number of events and then divide by the luminosity to get the cross-section. And because of this, uh, having a precise luminosity measurement is a crucial input uh, to any cross-section measurement. And uh, I just put here a reference to the target precision for Halumi LHC of a luminosity precision of better than uh, 1%. And there was a, a talk on Tuesday uh, going a bit more in detail about this and how we want to achieve this detector-wise. Now, if we measure luminosity, we can first do that using only beam parameters. So if you look at the sketch on the uh, lower side, uh, you have a number of protons coming in from the left, another number of protons coming in from the right. They cross at a frequency f uh, in a transverse luminous area uh, that I call a luminous here. If you know these properties, then you can calculate the luminosity by the formula given on the upper right-hand side. However, in general data taking conditions at the LHC, the determination especially of the luminous area is not very precise. So to get a precision luminosity measurement, uh, we take a, an alternative route, which is a two-step procedure. Uh, first, we calibrate the detectors that we use for the luminosity measurement, which means we measure a reference cross-section in a special uh, LHC setup where we can determine the luminous area precisely. And then we integrate the rate measurement of this detector over the whole data taking period and normalize it with the calibrated cross-section uh, to get the integrated luminosity. 
So what I'm going to talk about is how we achieve precision both in calibration first and then in integration. But before that, let me give you a quick overview of the luminosity detectors at the CMS experiment. First of all, we have two uh, special luminosity detectors, uh, PLT and BCM1F, which are in the forward regions close to the beam pipe. Then we also use uh, some of the main subdetectors of the CMS experiment. So we use uh, the, the tracker for pixel cluster counting, PCC, and for vertex counting, uh, as well as uh, the muon drift tubes and uh, the forward hadron calorimeters. And finally, uh, we can also use the, the RAMSES radiation monitoring system uh, to, to get an estimate uh, for the luminosity. Okay, so for each of these detectors, we first want to calibrate uh, the rate measurement of these detectors. Uh, and for that, we use the uh, van der Meer or VDM method. Uh, the VDM method relies on special LHC fills with a low pileup in which we perform VDM scans, which, uh, in which we separate the beams uh, transversely and then move them in steps across each other. Uh, we then measure the rate as a function of the beam separation. And this is the plot on the right-hand side. And we do a Gaussian fit to this, uh, uh, to this data. And then we get the width of the distribution uh, called cup sigma x here, which is the width of the luminous region along the scanning direction. And then we repeat a VDM scan in Y as well. And then we have the uh, width in X, the width in Y. And the product of this two gives us essentially the luminous area. Uh, so having this, we know we can compute the luminosity during VDM scans, and then we can use the uh, peak rate, R0 here, to uh, compute uh, the uh, visible cross-section, so the cross-section for the rate measurement in our detector. Now, the question is, what is the precision of this? So we have several ingredients. First of all, we have the proton numbers that we need to know, which we get rather precisely from uh, LHC devices. Uh, and then uh, we need the uh, cup, sigma X, cup sigmas. Uh, so there we need to know the, the rates and the beam separation precisely. So the rates, for example, have to be corrected for backgrounds. And then one important consistency check that we do is that we not only have uh, uh, one pair of VDM scans, but several. So the lower left-hand side, for example, shows the visible cross-section for pixel cluster counting for several successive VDM scan pairs in 2018, where we find a nice agreement. Now, the next two slides are uh, some of the, the main uncertainties here. Uh, the first slide deals with the beam separation. Uh, so with the, with, the, with the X axis on this plot on the right-hand side. So if we go to uh, slide five, uh, the, the beam separation is at first order derived from the magnet uh, settings of the LHC. These are the nominal uh, positions of the beams. And we want to calibrate the length scale of these nominal positions by comparing them to measured vertices with the CMS tracker. Uh, this is called the length scale calibration. The plot is on the uh, upper left-hand side, where we essentially have the, uh, the measured vertex position as a function of the nominal position. And then we get a slope, and this slope is applied as a correction in the VDM fit. In, in addition to this linear behavior, we ha can have uh, that the beams move away uh, from the nominal orbit in a, in a time-dependent fashion. This is an effect that we call orbit drift, which we monitor with uh, LHC beam position monitors. And an example from 2017 is shown in the plot on the lower left-hand side, uh, where all, all uh, data points are at a head-on periods, so where the beams are nominally head-on. And you see that the beams uh, move by something up to 20 microns in such a fill, and we uh, monitor this and then correct the VDM fits for that. And the third effect here are, is the electromagnetic interaction between the two proton beams. These are the beam-beam effects, uh, which we typically apply as uh, one is the beam-beam deflection. So we have an electric repulsion uh, between the two proton beams, which increases the separation uh, depending on the initial separation of the beam. So this is shown on the lower right-hand side. And then we also have a, what we call the dynamic better star effect, uh, where we have a change of the shape of the proton beams from the focusing and defocusing uh, due to electromagnetic interactions. Uh, this is applied as a correction to, to the rates uh, and is currently under re-evaluation because we underestimated some stuff there in the preliminary results that I'm showing today. And uh, finally, we're coming to the most important systematic part of the calibration, which is the factorization bias. In the VDM method, uh, we make scans in X and in Y, and then we multiply them to get the luminous region. This assumes uh, that the uh, beam shapes factorizes in X and Y. However, in general, that is not the case. We have some small X and Y correlations so that this uh, simple product uh, doesn't give the full story and we have a small bias in the calibration result. 
So to, to correct for this bias, we uh, reconstruct the transverse proton beam densities uh, using uh, measured vertices uh, with the so-called beam imaging method. And the results, uh, the UN2 results are shown on the lower left-hand side. These are the estimate, estimates for the factorization bias for the, for the different VM scans. And you can see that the effect can be larger than 1%. And for, for example, in 2018, 13 TV proton-proton collisions uh, uh, our systematic uncertainty is, is 2%. So this is a, a huge uncertainty. And to be able to tackle that better, uh, we are currently developing uh, additional methods uh, to bring down this uncertainty. So one is that we implemented offset scans, uh, which are VDM scans where we additionally separate the beams in the non-scanning direction. So if you look at the plot on the right-hand side, you have in red, uh, VDM scans rate as a function of separation X and in Y. And then in blue, you have offset scans, which are additionally separated in the non-scanning direction, meaning we test a different slice of the numinous region and are thus sensitive for, to the, uh, the XY correlations. And another thing that we are investigating is to look at the beam spot evolution. So we can estimate the, the center and the width and other properties of the, of the beam spots uh, measured with our tracker and uh, 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 analyze the evolution as a function of the beam separation. Okay, once we have done all this and have a precise calibration of uh, for each of the detectors that we're using, uh, we integrate the rate measurements. And there, uh, two effects are important. The first is linearity. Because the VDM scans are done under special uh, conditions with a, with a very low pileup and a large uh, bunch crossing spacing. And we have to extrapolate the visible cross section from these conditions to the regular data taking conditions. This is uh, called linearity. And one, one example of an effect is, is afterglow, uh, which is a spurious signal that we get from the activation of detector material after collisions, which is then measured, measured in, the, in the time slots of the following collisions. So the upper right hand side shows a plot where the, the first half is, is filled bunch crossing. So there's actual collisions and, and the rate measurement. And the, the right hand side uh, shows uh, empty bunches. So there are no collisions, but we still get a rate measurements. And we can use these empty bunches uh, to estimate the af afterglow and derive a correction that we can then apply to, to the filled bunches as well. After correcting linearity effects for different detectors, we can make cross detector comparisons to estimate uh, residual nonlinearity. So the lower left hand side shows an example of the ratio between different detectors as a function of instantaneous luminosity during one example fill in 2018. For example, if you look at the uh, purple dots, these are uh, are uh, two, two, ratio, uh, two, two detectors, so the ratio between two detectors. And this is, is a nice linear uh, curve. So there is some nonlinearity between these two detectors. And we can uh, fit this with a, with a linear function, get a slope. And if we collect all the slopes from all the fields, we get a distribution like in the lower right hand side. And we can use this uh, to estimate the uncertainty due to residual nonlinearity. Then, uh, we have stability, which is uh, which deals with the change of the detector conditions over time. So we have VDM scans once per data taking period. Most of the time means once per year. And uh, if the detector conditions change over the year, uh, then of course you have to take that into account. An example is in, in HF, the forward hydron calorimeter, uh, we have a gain loss from aging in the PMTs and fibers, and this uh, changes uh, the, the response. A powerful tool to estimate this are emittance scans which are short VDM scans. And in 2018 and 2018, we had them at the start of every fill and uh, at the end of many fills uh, in the CMS experiment. And from each of these scans, we can get a rough estimate of the visible cross section and then uh, thus monitor how the efficiency of these detectors changes over time. And the upper right hand side shows the results from the emittance scan analysis uh, for, for HF uh, for 2017 and 2018, when you can clearly see how the uh, efficiency changes. And we use this to derive a uh, correction. And after we corrected uh, all uh, stability issues for all detectors, we can again do cross detector comparisons. So the lower plot shows the ratios between three detectors for 2018, where you can see that there is some evolution in the stability of the different detectors. And again, use this to assign an uncertainty. So we have calibrated and integrated our rate measurements. And then we get the run to luminosity for proton proton collisions at 13 TeV to be 139 inverse femtobahn with a relative uncertainty of 1.8%. Uh, the two parts contributing to the uncertainty are the, the calibration with VDM scans, where the largest uncertainty comes from the factorization bias, where in the future we'll have additional methods uh, to improve the precision. 
And the second part is the integration of the rate measurement, where we have linearity and stability effects, whereas linearity effects are, are slightly larger. Uh, these are all preliminary results. So there we have a lot of improvements already underway. So we can soon expect new results, updated results with uncertainties of better than 2% per year. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you much for the presentation and uh, maybe you can take a few questions. Yes, please. Maybe I will have a question. Uh, so you, you, you just mentioned that uh, there will be some improvements. Uh, so at the moment, this total uncertainty, is it important or like a critical uncertainty for these absolute cross-section measurements? Uh, yes. Uh, and it depends, of course, on the cross-section measurements. Uh, examples uh, are uh, the TT bar cross-section, uh, where all other systematic uncertainties combined in 2016 are 2.5% uh, S is the luminosity uncertainty. And we have uh, in the pipeline a few W and Z cross-section measurements where, uh, where the, the relative impact of the luminosity is even larger. So there are a lot of uh, cross-section measurements which are really looking forward to the improved results. OK, thanks. Okay. If there is no more question, maybe we can move, uh, thank uh, Jose for the uh, for for his presentation, and uh, maybe we can move to the next uh, speaker, uh, EFN Jen, who will speak about the uh, diamond detector in Bell two, uh, of measuring you. the yes, measuring the radiation and uh, beam about. Yes. Uh, so please uh, share your screen. Yes. Let me share it. The first one. Okay, can you see it in full screen? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. So, morning, everyone. This is the talk about the diamond detector on Bell 2. Oh, sorry, next one. Yes. So, first, I will roughly introduce about the whole system of diamond, then, uh, introduce something about its functionalities. So, this is our Bell 2 detector. So, Bell 2 is now the luminosity frontier. And using Bell 2, we're aiming at searching for some physics beyond the standard model. And we hope we can accumulate 50 times the luminosity than Bell. So in order to reach this luminosity, uh, we use the nano beam technology, which uh, here you can see a plot for the nano beam. And uh, then we can reach an instantaneous luminosity at this value. So when we have this much higher, much intense, uh, luminosity, it is also saying that the radiation maybe will be more severe than before. So in order to protect the Bell 2 subdetectors and also to protect some components of the accelerator, we installed the diamond on the, this region on the Bell 2 near the induction point to serve as a beam abort system and the radiation monitor. And this is a picture of our diamond. So the diamond sensor is here, it's very small. You can see the zoom out picture. It just attached here on the beam pipe. And this is the beam pipe, which again is in the center of the Bell 2 detectors. So the diamond detector is actually just a solid state ionization chamber. It measures the current of electrons and holes produced by the particles that uh, uh, those stray beams. So here we call it diamond because the sensors are diamond. And um, it has actually a few very good uh, merits here. The first is those diamonds, they have excellent radiation hardness because, uh, because the Bell 2 is going to have a lifetime of roughly 10 years. So in order to serve for 10 years, radiation hardness is very important. And the second point is diamond has very rapid response to radiations. So if some radiation burst occurs, we can uh, record that immediately increase. And also we don't need a very large crystal. We only need a small piece, as you can see here, it's a small one. And the last point is actually this crystal can measure a very broad range from micron rad per second to tens of kilo rad per second. So for those reasons, we believe our diamond is very reliable and it's also a very stable one for a long-term dose measurement. And if we take a look again on the whole system, this is a picture. So up here is the inner de detector of Bell 2. So in total, we have 10, uh, 28 uh, diamond sensor, and eight of them are installed on the beam pipe, which is here in the center region. And four of them are used for beam aboard. The other four is just monitoring radiations. And we also installed 12 near the 
uh, SVD silicon vertex detector, which is actually at here, here the SVD cone. This part, the pink one, this one is SVD, and uh, the remaining eight is installed here uh, near this brown one, which is the superconducting mechanism. So the so the sensor is installed on bell two. Then we have a thirty meter cable. Uh, connecting, uh, sorry, sending the signals to our diamond control unit. This diamond control unit, which actually the readout electronics, is located in the electronics hut, which is like 10 meters away from Bell 2. So during the experiment, if anything goes wrong, usually uh, the diamond is very solid. The sensor is solid, it should be okay. What if something happened, we just replace the readout electronics. And here we for this picture I show, you can see roughly this is the signal sent to amplifier, then digitized by ADC, then go to our FPGA, and FPGA will ju judge whether it's send a board or not. And the other side is to the computer, uh, through the Ethernet connections. And here also we at the front end, I think I should mention that we have three ranges in order to measure the current of different magnitudes. We offer here different configurations. And if we take a deeper look on this, DCUs, this is show here. So first is the ADC. It had a sampling rate 15 megahertz quite fast. And then uh, there, is, uh, the, the, there is a memory buffer. So every 125 ADC value here are summed and then written in one memory cell here. So this memory buffer is running 400 kilohertz. And uh, every 25 microsecond, let's say for, uh, 400 kilohertz, it is comparing the results in the memory sales. It can be the results of several sales or just one sales. It can be configured. And currently we set two threshold. So for the first threshold, we call it very fast. This is checking uh, in four memory sales, which is 10 microseconds. And we ask uh, the radiation dose to be, uh, the threshold is set at four millirads. And the reason for 10 minutes a microsecond is because this is actually the revolution time for the accelerator. And for those threshold value, we collect information from inner detectors of Bell, Bell 2, uh, like the pixel detector and the SVDs. And uh, then every time we check whether they get damaged or not, and then we lower down again and again. Finally, it evolves here, this value. Although we always lower it down, actually it's still quite high. You can see this is, uh, 100 times larger of the noise. So we are not going to be triggered by fluctuations. This is still quite a safe value. And the second threshold is the so-called fast abort, which is one millisecond for 40 millirad. And the last thing here is uh, on the right side, this is to the computer side, uh, all the data again in memory buffer are summed again and send it to computer at 10 hertz rate. So those, uh, those rates can help us to estimate the long-term integrated dose. And here, the last thing about the system is about its logic. So the about logic is here, we require a handshake. First is the diamond, if cross the threshold, will send here a board signal to accelerator super KKB. Then super KKB receive our board, it will send a bat, a confirmation. So it's here. Of course, we have other beam, uh, beam loss monitors. As you can see here on the right picture, we have a lot of them <laughs> installed among the accelerator. So every time, Initially, the diamond is quiet, then it's TTL high. Then if it fire a boss, it's go TTL low, which active low. Then until it's received back the confirmation from accelerator, then it will reset back to TTL high. And when it received the confirmation, it will uh, start to write down a memory file. And every time, if it's not the fire, fire, a diamond fire a boss, it's other beam loss monitor, diamond will also after receiving back the confirmation, we'll also dump a memory file. Okay, so let's see what the diamond can do. The first thing is here is the interface. This is an online interface. So when machine operators, they are tuned in, uh, they're operating, they always will take a look on these pictures. You can see here, this is the beam pipe. And uh, based on the positions of those diamonds, those values are the dose rate of diamond. And it's easy to infer which beam, or whether it's electron or it's positron that need to be tuned further. So every time if the value gets increased, the color will change and they will pay attention on that. So the second thing is if diamond already fires on boards, then it will dump some memory file. And usually we have two thresholds, so we have two quite typical 
uh, radiation, uh, uh, let's say radiation, uh, radiations. So the first one is very fast. You can see usually it's a rapid narrow spikes. It's like this, a very narrow one and increase very fast. And the second one is those continuous. So it's like a growing tail. It's just gradually increase. And finally the value crest the threshold, then it's fire boards. So those pictures are also uh, generated by the online software. So this is like a real time reference. The machine operators always can check those pictures after there, was, there is an abort. And usually from this picture, we can also see some information it's very interesting, like uh, it usually take like 27, 25 microseconds until it goes to zero, which means there is no more beam in the ring. And among our uh, hundreds memory files, sometimes the memory file also records something very interesting. So the memory file, usually it can record five seconds. And here's the zoom in picture, and we can see there is the first peak, which actually already triggered abort. It crossed the structure here very fast. But during the aborting, when the beam was getting aborted, there is a second huge peak. And this is a quite dangerous one because you can see here the value is 700 millirad and our threshold is only 4 millirad. So this is the case that we should definitely prevent in the future. And of course, uh, also we need to study what is the cause of those kind of uh, quite dangerous situation. And let me show you also the figure about the abort statistics. Uh, this year, in the past six months, in total, the accelerator received 1,500 aborts. And diamond fired 600 of them. And most of the diamond aborts are the first type, very fast aborts. The second type, it exists, but very few, less than 10 times. And there is no force abort due to the more function of firmware or whatever. Everything is fine, all the aborts are genuine. And this is a picture is showing the births per day. So uh, the blue one is per day, the, the orange one is total births number. So during machine studies, usually diamonds are very uh, frequently sending aborts. It's like every hour, there will be around 10 diamond aborts. But during the physics data taking, diamond is very quiet. You can see we only get like one or two every day. That's it also saying the machine operator can offer us very good beam conditions. And the last thing about diamond is uh, we have so many beam loss monitors, but actually if diamond fire boards, our signal Hygiene. is always, yes. Hygiene. Two more minutes. Two minutes, yes. So we are always the first one to reach the accelerator. We are a very fast beam aboard system. So this is a picture about the luminosity water record which Super KKB achieved this year. And in June, this is uh, a new record here. And a few days later, after a great effort of tuning, we get another even higher luminosity. So we are actually a protector. We are fast beam aboard, so we can protect the, the belt tube detectors. And also uh, we have other functionalities, for example, because we are measuring the dose rate. So if you integrate it, you get the dose. So this is a dose. Unfortunately, here this year, we have some uh, damage on one channel, but now it's repaired. So this is an integrated dose. And this integral dose of the superconducting mechanism, which can help us to know whether in the future they will degrade their performance or not. It's always important to ha have an idea about how many doses have they endured. And other functionalities, like um, we can also infer the occupancy of the inner detector, SVD. For example, here you can see uh, the yellow one is measured by SVD data. And here the pink one is the diamond data give this value and they're very close to each other. And their ratio you can see here is the ratio very close to one. So the reason is when during injection there is a veto window. So SVD do not read the data. So at this time we can use the diamond data to, uh, to estimate the occupancy. And of course for our other beam background studies the diamond dose rate is very closely related to the beam loss rate. This also can be used to study the beam condition. So in summary, our diamond system is doing a very good job on protecting bell tube from radiation damages. And we are very sensitive to two kinds. The first kind is those rapidly radiation burst. Also, the second kind is the continuous radiations. And also our abort signal usually is the first one arrive at accelerator. We are very fast. And we also can provide a lot of information to beam tuning and for background studies. And also actually at this moment, we still have a lot of ongoing improvements, both on the hardware and on the software. Okay, thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Ifantin, for your nice uh, detailed presentation on the diamond detector. So let's uh, take a few questions. Uh, I have a question uh, for you, Yifan. Um, the material, the diamond material, who is your supplier uh, for this material? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, yes, I should mention it. Uh, I, sorry, actually, I forget the company's name. Yeah, okay. yeah. But, mm -hmm. but I can uh, later on, on the chat, I can write to you later. Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Maybe we can just discuss it on the Metamorst. Yeah, thanks. Yes, yes. Congratulations for this system. It looks very stable. Yeah. Okay. So I just have one question. This diamond detector is going to last uh, during the um, lifetime of the experiment, or? Yeah, we, we plan to last uh, until the end of Bell 2. We hope we can serve till okay. the end. And, and okay. th this is not a problem because we have already do some R&D, uh, how uh -huh. many those can we endure? And uh, based on the current performance of the accelerator, we, we, we think the dose is still okay. Our hardness can guarantee we can survive to, to the end. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I would have also a question. We had a presentation like two days ago from Felix Miller, and he was showing that there was already some damage of the fat detectors. Uh, uh, so, so was it was it already with these diamond detectors implemented, or or before? Uh, actually, there are several diamond groups at Bell Two. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether he's showing this because also we have other like cross detectors. They also install diamond, and we also have some other diamond just measuring. The luminosity. There are several parts. Our diamond is the SVD diamond parts, so that's why I'm <laughs> on behalf of SVD. And our diamond is both beam abort and the radiation monitor. We do the two jobs. Mm -hmm. mm, okay. Okay. So, so you, you like 100 person believe that it will it will protect the inner tracker against or, or have you already experienced some problem with this? The only problem, like sometimes when there is some quench from the superconducting um, magnets, there will be some quench and we may get a little impaired. Like you can see here, we lost the several channel. And usually the, the quick fix is we have some other spare. We just replace the electronics. But so this year, you know, the situation is a little tough. We don't have enough spare and we're shipping, although we ship there, but it's a little slow. So we still have one unrecover the channel here. But now it's covered. At this moment, everything is fine. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thanks. OK, if uh, no more questions, then let me thank the uh, speaker, uh, Ethan Jin, for, for the presentation. And uh, we think uh, we had a good session, though we had uh, I had of time, actually. I, we spent a bit more time than expected. So we have a coffee break and maybe if there is any announcement, Jiri can take over. Yeah, yeah. F uh, thank you. Thanks a lot for good work, uh, Prafula. So uh, now we should have a coffee break. Uh, it was planned to be like 20 minutes, but definitely we are well a, a bit behind of this. So we will have like five minutes only. So uh, let's see each other at, uh, we have 11.55, yeah? 11.55, then we will be only 15 minutes uh, after the official schedule, yeah? Okay. 11.55. Thank okay. you. Thanks. And the chair will be Stefania. Sure, yes. Thanks.
Hi, this is Stefania speaking. Can you hear me? Maybe you can also, you can also see me here. So if there are any speaker who wants to try sharing and hasn't done this before, maybe Simon, you want to? Yes, if possible, I'd like to yeah. double check. If, if you oh, yeah, thank you. OK, so I'll. Um, so are my slides visible right now? Yes, they are. Very good. And the voice is also clear. It is, indeed. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay. If anyone else wants to try, we are here for you. Hi, hey, Stefania. Yes, I would like to try. I hardly can hear your voice. I don't know if it's that better. Much better, yeah. It's almost changing it. Can you see the slide? Yes, we can. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Can I give you try? Okay, go ahead. Can you try speaking? Cyril, we can see your slides, but I don't hear your voice. Maybe you're not speaking. Yeah, well, actually, when I share the slides, I, I don't see the monitor to unmute myself. I, I will uh, go to the test room to, to be sure that I, I will be able to do that. Okay, anyway, you have time. It's typically on the top, on the top. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, it's 11.55. I think uh, we should uh, start the session with the last uh, seven uh, talks. Uh, they are mostly from Bell 2 and uh, LHCB experiments. Uh, and the first speaker is Kodai Matsuoka uh, from Nagoya University. And he will tell us uh, about the Bell 2 experiment. Okay, I don't know if you can maybe go full screen so we can see better. Is it okay? Yes, now it's perfect. Thank you. Go so ahead. Let me, let me talk about the Bell 2 experiment, status and the prospects. I'm Kodai Matsuoka from Kobayashi Maskawa Institute, Nagoya University. So the Bell 2 experiment is a successor to the Bell experiment at the KKB accelerator, which collected about one inverse advanced data. And Bell to plan to collect uh, much more data, 50 inverse advanced of collisions at and near option for its energy. So uh, we collided 7 GB electron in the uh, so called HR high energy ring and 4 GB positron in LER low energy ring. The uh, key ingredient to uh, achieve the uh, 15 basalt band data is a high luminosity uh, realized by nano beam scheme. So we plan to squeeze the beta wide star or the uh, vertical beam size by a factor of 20. So 0.3 millimeter beta wide star compared to KKP, as well as increasing the uh, beam currents. So our physics motivation is the following. So we uh, we aim to search for new physics in the B sub S D mesons and the tau lepton case. We can also search for directly search for light new particles in the dark sector. Also, precise measurement of standard model and the hadron physics are our also important uh, program. 
in the vector experiment. And the uh, Peretz collaboration is an uh, uh, international collaboration composed of uh, more than 1,000 people from 26 countries and regions. The Peretz detector uh, is a, a hermetic spectrometer upgraded from Bell detector. It was designed to have a better performance even at a higher luminosity. That means a higher beam background and a higher trigger rate up to 30 kilohertz in the L1 trigger. So the detector it consists of uh, the uh, state of the art silicon matrix detector, uh, the drift chamber for the tracking, and the uh, uh, novel particle ident ident identification chain of, chain of detectors called the top time of propagation counter in the battery region and the air gel rich counter in the forward end cap region. And the uh, electromagnetic calorimeters and the k -long and muon detectors. We also adapt grid computing to process a huge amount of data. And uh, uh, the physics data taking with the full detector compo components uh, started in March 2019. So uh, we already identified some major issues in the beam operation. The uh, most critical one is the detector lifetime, in particular top counter. That is because the quantum efficiency of the MCP PMT used for the top counter degrades as a function of the output charge squared as shown in this plot. So we want to keep the PMT QE within an acceptable level that is a relative QE greater than 80% until we collect 80, 50 mass advanced data around 2031. So we need the two shake and the beam gas background. Uh, but the two shake beam gas background, uh, we expect increase with uh, beam current squared. So this has to be kept, but this has to be kept comp constant by collimators, beam tuning, additional shielding, shieldings and so on. So that means the top PMT heat rate could limit the luminosity in future. And uh, we also uh, uh, concern about the permanent damage on the vertex um, de de detectors by accidentally huge beam loss. And we also found the synchrotron radiation uh, uh, from HR beam on illuminated on PX PXD sensor as shown in this uh, right bottom plot. So the uh, synchrotron radiation from HR beam hit on the edge of the beam pipe of the straight detection uh, reflected uh, uh, back uh, to the other side of the sensor and uh, creating this kind of particular specific pattern of the PXD heat rate distribu distribution. So we should be carefully monitor not to irradiate PXD unnecessarily. So in 2020, uh, as you know, we uh, had a, a COVID-19 pandemic, but uh, even under this situation, Super KKB and Bell 2 was operated while minimizing risk of infection. So uh, usually, uh, before that, usually we had a, a operation scheme like as shown in the bottom diagram. So we had a, a two on-site control room shifters to operate the detector and the one so-called BCG, Bell 2 commissioning group, uh, shift uh, stationed on the accelerator control room and uh, uh, who is the uh, interface between the accelerator and the detector and uh, communicate with the uh, accelerator people and uh, control room shifters. Uh, but uh, to minimize the person-to-person -person contact and avoid the so-called 3C, close space crowded spaces and close contact settings, we decided to uh, uh, move one shell shifter from on site to remote, and uh, uh, one BCG shifter from the uh, accelerator control room to another building to reduce uh, person to person contact. And uh, we also had uh, travel restrictions, and uh, we had uh, meetings, every meetings online. We also had uh, some uh, hygiene. 
then uh, we managed the operation in 2020. So here we summarize the uh, operation, accelerator operation uh, since 2019. So the green dots show the uh, luminosity, peak luminosity, and blue uh, HR beam current brown LER beam currents and the black points show the top counter PMT heat rate. So we uh, squeeze the beta Y star uh, step by step uh, down to 1.0 millimeter uh, in June. Then we achieved the, the uh, world record of the luminous, peak luminosity 2.4 times 10 to 34 square centimeter per second, uh, even at the, about a half beam current of the KKB. Uh, at the KKB record. We also adapted the club waste scheme, firstly from LER and then HER. Finally, we achieved 0.8 millimeter beta Y star in the end of the uh, last run. We also succeeded in keeping the top beam background level uh, below the limit. Uh, as you can see, the level was uh, nearly constant, though the luminosity was increasing. And in the next run in autumn, we try to squeeze beta Y star further down to 0 0.3, 0 0.6 millimeter. And uh, uh, in the last run in 2020, uh, we had a 56.7% uh, uh, of the machine time for the physics run. And uh, uh, our uh, major concern issue was uh, data taking efficiency that was uh, only about 50% in 2019, sorry, 2019 autumn run. But uh, we succeeded in improving it to 84% in 2020, thanks to less DAQ errors and a more prompt recovery from the errors by experts' consistent effort, error analysis, and uh, monitor by ELK software and uh, uh, monitor experienced, more experienced shifters and uh, uh, controlled injection beta that time. Uh, the last round, which was about, uh, on average about 5%. This was a result of the injection background studies. So uh, this plot showed the integrated luminosity uh, per day in the uh, blue bars and the wet line represents the integrated luminosity <coughs> since 2019. Then yeah, the uh, run ended on July 1st, and uh, we accumulated this 74 inverse femto bar. And uh, uh, today in this conference, we can uh, in this conference we can show uh, the data uh, accumulated up to uh, mid of May, uh, which corresponds corresponds to 34.6 inverse femtopan bar for on resonance and 3.2 inverse femtopan bar of resonance data. <coughs> so here we summarize the data analysis to be shown in this conference. And uh, uh, in terms of the performance assessment for the flavor physics program, we can show several things like be the lifetime be flavor tagger and the so-called FEI, the full event in Full event reconstruction algorithm, newly introduced in Bell 2, and so on. And we can also show some outset of flavor physics measurement, although we need more statistics for publication. That includes the uh, branching ratio measurement, VUB, VCB, and the uh, branching ratio and the uh, CP asymmetry of charm rest bit decades, and so on. Uh, with a even with the uh, one minute left. Okay, smaller data set, uh, we can publish the, uh, some result in the dark sector, uh, like Z prime to invisible. Uh, and this was our first of our physics paper and the axion like particle such. Uh, this will be a second part physics paper just we submitted recently. And we expect uh, uh, this amount of data until March 2021. And we can uh, prospect, we can have some prospect on the physics publication in the, in the future. 
also for physics, uh, flavor physics, as well as the dark sector uh, in particle search. And uh, uh, around one inverse atom data before long shutdown in 2020, uh, to, uh, we can uh, expect uh, to surpass uh, Barber and Bell's data set. So uh, I would emphasize here, Bell to rejoin uh, in with the uh, hunting for new physics in, in earnest. So, so toward uh, 15 bus advanced, uh, our ultimate goal of 15 bus advanced data. Uh, here we show the, uh, our projection, which was recently updated based on the past results of the beam operation. So in 2022, we will replace the PXD uh, detector to fill the currently missing the second layer. And after that, we, we try to squeeze the beta Y star down to 0.5 meter. And then recently we found that uh, even further squeeze beta Y star uh, down to 0.3 millimeter, we need an upgrade of the two shares, the final focusing magnet system. So we will have another long shutdown in 2026. Then we can uh, increase, we ex expect to increase the lumin peak luminosity above six times 10 to 35. And then uh, we expect to accumulate the uh, 15 bus band data in 2031. In summary, there is plans to collect 15 bus band data to extensively search for new physics in the flavor and the dark sectors, as well as to provide better understanding of the standard model and the hardware physics. The accelerator and the detector operation is in good shape. The world record of the peak luminosity 2.4 times 10 to 34 was achieved while the TKB record was 2.1 times 10 to 34 uh, with the acceptable beam background level. And we uh, corrected 74 in Pacific Bam, and the first physics paper on dark sector was published to be followed by uh, other results on dark sector and flavor physics. So, and in a few years, uh, we we better to rejoin in with the hunting for new physics in earnest. Thank you. Thank you, Kodai. We have the time for a quick question. William. William, you have uh, your hand raised. I think I do. I didn't realize that my hand was raised. Uh, OK. Maybe if I can ask, uh, I would I would have a question. How the missing second pixel layer or, or significantly missing part of this second pixel layer is uh, uh, at the moment affecting the data taking, or or would it be significantly better if it would be complete? No, at this moment, at this uh, uh, event hit rate, uh, we don't the second layer. Uh, without second layer, we can have a bit, uh, good performance, but uh, at the higher occupancy uh, with a higher beam current or higher beam background level, we need a uh, second layer to reduce occupancy and a better uh, vertex resolution. So, so because you are waiting for the long shutdown for this, it looks like it is quite complicated to uh, to complete this uh, this second layer. So you will you will measure another at least one year or maybe more with this being completed. Right. So to reinstall the PXT, we need a complicated procedure, and we need a, mm -hmm. around a 10, 10 months long shutdown. Oh, okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Kodai. Thank you for the questions also. And then we now move to the next talk, again uh, uh, from Bell 2 by Slavomira Stefkova. If you want to share your slides, uh, mm -hmm. stage is yours. Uh, yeah, can you stop sharing the previous presentation, please? Oh, yes. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so talking about the pixel detector, it is my very big pleasure to present uh, on behalf of uh, the Bell 2 PXD collaboration, the performance and the background expectation of our detector at SuperCAG-B. 
So the first talk uh, that covered the pixel detector uh, was already given by uh, Felix Miller on uh, Tuesday. And in his talk, he covered topics such as operational issues and beam losses. So in my presentation, I would like to concentrate on other topics and the long performance, I will uh, concentrate on the background. Uh, just a reminder, um, uh, the PXD is uh, the innermost detector uh, in Bell 2. Uh, and as already discussed, uh, currently we have uh, installed fully the first layer and partially the second layer. So uh, uh, the importance uh, of our detector uh, has already been exploited actually in many analyses shown uh, here at ICHEP. And in particular, these are analyses that are sensitive uh, to the parameters measured in the CP violation, um, but also uh, the analyses that are measuring the lifetimes. In particular, I would like to uh, highlight the result uh, of the uh, charm lifetime measurement, which you can see in the bottom left, uh, where you can observe that the Bell 2 actually uh, measures a factor 2 improvement in proper uh, time resolution uh, as compared to the, our, uh, to the previous P factories. And uh, such an improvement is only possible thanks to an excellent uh, uh, performance of our detector. So in terms of the performance uh, in the PXD, there are generally uh, two metrics that we measure it with. So this is the vertex resolution and the heat efficiency. Thanks to the asymmetric uh, and elliptical shape of the uh, beam spot uh, and a very uh, small uh, size uh, in Y, uh, we can measure the resolution uh, with uh, horizontal tracks uh, from the daimyon events. And you can see uh, the resulting uh, D0 distribution on the plot on the uh, bottom right, uh, where uh, in the blue, you can see the distribution uh, if it was only measured uh, with a CDC and SVD, whereas in the red, uh, you can see the distribution by adding the information from the PXT. And as you will uh, observe, uh, the um, improvement in the width of this distribution is nearly uh, by factor of two by adding the PXT into the game. Uh, I would like to also uh, say that uh, such an excellent uh, resolution is also owned to uh, very good uh, alignment and tracking performance. What concerns the heat efficiency, which is defined as the number of tracks with an associated PXD cluster heat over the total number of sensor intercepting tracks, uh, what we measure is an efficiency that is uh, higher than 99% uh, in regions without a known defect and uh, it is actually very stable. Uh, of course, uh, one limiting uh, aspect uh, for our performance is the amount of the background that we observe in our pixel detector. And actually the uh, limit is set uh, with an occupancy of uh, 3%. Uh, as I have already uh, hinted, uh, this is due to the fact that at actually occupancy of 3%, we, we observe uh, uh, degradation in vertexing performance because uh, we increase significantly the probability to associate uh, wrong hits to the track. Um, also at this occupancy of 3%, uh, we start to observe a significant uh, data loss if we want to take uh, the data at 30 kilohertz trigger rate. Also what is uh, important to monitor for the PXD is uh, the dose. Um, so we expect uh, to have a yearly dose of uh, 20 kilogray in our first layer, uh, given the conditions uh, at the design luminosity. And until now, uh, we have estimated that the dose that we have um, um, gotten uh, is around uh, 20 kilogray, but a more precise measurement is currently in progress. So the exact uh, processes that uh, contribute uh, to the backgrounds are usually uh, split into two categories. So first is the single beam backgrounds, uh, which cover the following processes. So this is the Tushek scattering, which is scattering of the particles uh, within the bunch. And therefore it is, its rate is proportional to the number of particles times the density and therefore have a sensitivity uh, to the vertical size of the beam as well as the number of bunches. Then we have uh, Coulomb uh, or beam gas uh, scattering, 
which is the scattering of the residual gas molecule in the beam pipe. And therefore, the rate is proportional to the number of gas molecules times the number of particles. And therefore, it has a dependence on the pressure and the uh, effective C. Uh, then we have the synchrotron uh, radiation background, which is a consequence of the radial acceleration of the beam's particle achieved in uh, quadruples and bending magnets. Uh, and finally, we have a uh, background uh, due to, uh, to, to the continuous injection scheme, which is known as injection background. All of these single beam uh, backgrounds uh, have one thing in common. They can be uh, mitigated with beam steering, collimators, and vacuum scrubbing. This is not the case for the second class of the background, which are the luminosity backgrounds, uh, where the leading uh, contribution comes from the two photon uh, process, um, which is shown here. <clears throat> so now that uh, we have all these categories of background, uh, we would like to study the composition uh, of them uh, at the PXD. And this is uh, done by performing the following strategy. So in the single beam runs, uh, we observe our occupancy and we decompose it into its component, uh, taking the advantage of the different sensitivity to different uh, beam parameters as shown on the, uh, in the table at the top. Uh, then in the luminosity, uh, to measure the luminosity background, uh, we take luminosity uh, runs and again, we observe the occupancy in the PXT and we uh, subtract the expected single beam uh, component uh, from it. And then the residual occupancy is assigned uh, to the luminosity. So with this uh, strategy in the mind, uh, this is the situation uh, of the composition uh, of the backgrounds in our detector. Uh, it is also pictorially shown on the top right, where you can see the occupancy of the PXT as a function of time in a particular luminosity beam decay run. And you will observe that actually at the moment we are dominated by a uh, LER uh, beam gas background. We also uh, measure uh, the data uh, Monte Carlo agreement to see uh, if our simulation uh, can uh, explain what we see. And this ranges between 0.5 to 5, depending on the component. In terms of the measurement of the luminosity background, uh, which is also shown uh, as a function of phi uh, at the bottom right, uh, what you will observe uh, is that uh, we have measured this uh, luminosity background component, and also it is in uh, excellent agreement uh, with our analytical prediction. And finally, I would like to mention the fact that uh, the injection and synchrotron radiation uh, backgrounds are closely monitored. And what we see now is that the synchrotron radiation is dominated by the effects coming from HER injection. So using our current knowledge uh, what we, and the measured data Monte Carlo factors, what we can do is we can correct the design luminosity to see what will be the situation in the future. And this is what is shown on the plot on the bottom left where you can see the uh, occupancy as a function of PXD layer. And in future, we are expected uh, to be actually dominated by the uh, two photon uh, backgrounds as well as uh, HER 2 shek as you will observe uh, in this extrapolation, we are missing the injection and synchrotron radiation background. However, I would like to uh, assure you that for now, the synchrotron radiation has an uh, acceptable contribution to the PXD. And moreover, as you can see on the plot on the bottom right, uh, where you can see the PXD uh, sensor heat maps uh, in layer one in the phi Z um, plane, the synchrotron radiation is really uh, located in a, only on three uh, modules. In conclusion, uh, with our current understanding, uh, we predict that uh, the occupancy that we should see at the design luminosity is uh, below our occupancy limit. And um, I would like to conclude my talk actually uh, with a toy simulation uh, study. Uh, of the impact of the PXD background on the delta T uh, resolution. So the delta T, uh, just uh, to recap, is the difference in the decay time uh, between the two B mesons. And uh, here, what we have done is we have studied its resolution under uh, one and two layer PXD configuration. And actually on the top right, uh, you can see uh, the a scenario of uh, evolution of our backgrounds as a function of the time uh, within the next two years. And the different backgrounds are uh, shown with a different uh, color. And on the bottom, you can see the corresponding uh, delta T uh, resolution uh, under the one and two layer PXD scenario. 
what you will observe is that uh, the higher the background, we have the higher uh, probability to assign a wrong PXD hit to the track. Uh, and as you see in the um, green and blue color, only with uh, one uh, layer in place, uh, we expect a significant uh, performance degradation uh, within the next two years. On the good side, uh, uh, this performance loss can be recovered by uh, adding a second PXD uh, layer, uh, which is shown with this red and uh, orange line. Uh, and uh, on this topic, uh, as already mentioned before, we plan to install our full uh, two-layer PXD uh, in uh, Bell 2 in 2022. Uh, so to conclude, I have shown you that a very good performance have already led to many physics analyses that uh, are showing the results uh, here at uh, ICEF. And to summarize the situation uh, of the background, uh, data Monte Carlo agreement is uh, reasonably uh, good. So far, we are uh, dominated by a reducible LER uh, beam gas background. And with our current knowledge, uh, we expect that uh, at the design optics, uh, we should be uh, below uh, our uh, limit. Uh, at the future, we are in the future. We are expected to be uh, dominated by uh, two check HCR and two photon backgrounds, uh, and uh, we also closely monitor the synchrotron radiation and injection backgrounds. And uh, finally, I have also shown you a, a toy performance study, which does exactly monitor the impact on the delta T uh, resolution. Uh, and uh, in this uh, toy study, uh, it shows actually the need for our full two-layer detector. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. It was very clear. Are there questions? So in the meantime, just a quick question. I, I think you mentioned this, but I forgot. What's the distance of the first layer from the interaction point? Oh, uh, I think it's, uh, I, I think I haven't mentioned it, but I think it's uh, if, um, in tens of uh, micrometers. <clears throat> okay, that, that was to understand how okay because maybe you can go back to the one of the first slides uh, mm -hmm. okay. you mentioned the re resolution the difference uh, in the point in resolution uh, when you add the, the pixels uh, okay this one so i guess this gain uh, you have because you are adding a layer which is closer to the to the beam and so the exactly is, exactly it's quite clear yeah yeah Okay, so I don't know if there are any other comments or questions. I don't see any raised hands. Thank you very much for your presentation, Slavomira, and uh, I think you can uh, stop sharing and we move uh, to the next uh, speaker, still from the Bell 2 uh, experiment. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. It's Simon Baca. Now starting to share my screen. Do you see? Oh okay, yes. This... Now now we, we see. Yes. Okay, let me just move to the end yeah, to the top. Okay. Uh, hello everybody. This is Szymon Bacher from Krakow, Poland speaking. I'll be talking on behalf of SVD group from Bell2. Um, just let me start from the very brief outline of what I'll show you after a quick introduction about um, what the detector is and where it sits and a little bit of a little bit about some interesting technologies, some of them. I'll give you a short report on our operational experience, and then I'll tell a little bit about the performance. So since there was such a nice introduction by um, previous talks, I will not be going into details of how Bell 2 actually works and what it is. I'll just remind you of several important factors. So as you know, we have an asymmetric collider, so we have we clearly see the front and backward side because we have four and seven GeV respectively for electrons and positrons. Also, we are very interested in having um, good observation for vertices uh, because we are interested in B decays. 
So we want to be having our detector as close as possible to the interaction point. We also want to be able to withstand uh, very high luminosities and integrated instantaneous. You already heard a little bit about that in previous talks, but I'd like to remind you about the accelerator talk by Onishi-san regarding that topic as well. So let's have a look at how we do the vertexing actually in, in Bell 2. Uh, it was already mentioned several times that we have pixel detector, which is the innermost part of our vertexing system. And I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you a little bit more information about silicon vertex detector, which is a strip detector that sits just above uh, the pixel detector. Mm, so there are a few uses for that. Um, one which is very interesting is that actually low PT tracks are uh, sitting entirely within the SVD volume. So SVD has to be able to do uh, inter in identification for them. Also, um, we have to extrapolate the tracks to the PXD region so that the PXD knows which part of the detector to read out. We call that region of interest. And then we are also uh, interested in being able to determine the K-short uh, vertices. So um, how do we do that, actually? I'm not going to give you all the technical details, um, but let me just um, point you to, to some of interesting features. As you can see, we have a slanted part, um, which is um, used for having better um, angle, incident angle in the forward section. So forward meaning the direction that, um, that we have some remaining momentum after the collision. What we find very interesting, and that was very nice challenge to do, we have what we call origami on-chip sensor design which means that we have our front-end electronics sitting directly on the sensors, on the active part of the sensor, and we have very short um, cable length, so to say, the path length, electrical path length, uh, length um, thank you to what we call the origami being the captain folded around the sensor with, um, with the electrical paths. And in total, we have four layers of those marvelous sensors. Those are double-sided silicon strip um, detectors. Um, as you see, the slanted part, um, obviously, it has to be trapezoidal shape. And we have larger and smaller sensors, depending on where they sit, to, to have best in geometrical arrangement of what we, of what we have built. A little bit more about this on-chip um, sensor design. Mm, so we are using APV25 chips. Um, I won't be going to all the details about them right now. Uh, some of you might already know them because they were developed for CMS. Um, and we put them directly on top of our sensors. Uh, and we have to cool them down somehow because one of the, one of the features of them is that each of them uh, dissipates 0 0.4 watts and we have almost 2,000 of them. So we have to dissipate the energy. Mm, so we have this very nice cooling system, which is another, um, in my opinion, very interesting technological challenge that we have covered. Um, this is two-phase CO2 cooling that allows us to run at minus 20 degrees of Celsius. Now, all those things, they, they might not be so interesting at the first glance for a physicist, but they all contribute to us having very nice performance. Um, just before I show you the performance, a quick reminder in case if there would be some questions about that later on of our readout system. I've mentioned the front end electronics being directly next to the on top of the sensor. Mm, we feed out the cables, which is copper twisted pair of cables to our junction boards, in, sitting just outside of the active volume. And then we feed out with, uh, with the cables to FPGA systems sitting on top of the detectors in a racks. Um, to, to make the proper digitization and all the other work that's going to be done there. So let's have a look on how this was all put together. This was fairly large uh, challenge to, to do. The first beam, uh, test beams were performed still in 2004, uh, which was not the final sensor, but it was already investigating in the direction of, of what we want to have. And then in May 2015, there were some first tests uh, done with complete ladder. And then, you know, jumping quickly through the time, even though it, uh, it was a lot of work, in 2019, first half shelves 
of our detector were um, were built and then later on merged with PXT um, and soon later still in 2019 installed in our detector and we are running since March 2019 and we are very satisfied with how it goes let me just try to convince you that we are actually having good reasons to be satisfied so let's start from stability on slide number nine um, you've already heard about diamonds that we use to to investigate the, um, investigate the doses that we that we are having. And so um, we were very interested to see how we perform in time and in dose the our if, if our parameters are within our expectations. So the main part is that um, noise and leakage currents are within expectations and the way how they develop in time and develop in um, function of integrated dose is also within expectations. You can see from that plot that even though dose um, which is being accumulated is uh, rising all the time, uh, our noise is flattening out slowly and this is as we expect. We also don't see in SVD, we don't see any mm, damages that would mm, that would hinder the performance. We see that there are radiation effects, but we don't see the damages that would affect the performance. And just a nice show off, we have very nice and stable efficiency, um, averaging well above 99%. Um, so let's have a look on cluster energy. So and the histograms of, of how much energy is deposited for, uh, for each and every track passing through. We, mm, they are very well within what we were expecting. So in, in, as you see, we have this structure which is having asymmetrical beams. So we have different incident angles uh, depending on which sensors we are looking at. So here we have cluster energy histograms for layer four. Mm, and since most of the particles are traveling in the forward direction, you can see that we have different, uh, different histograms for them. They are also showing a difference between U and D side which comes from the fact that those two sides have different pitch between the strips that we are having. Uh, also, let's have a closer look on our heat efficiency. As I've mentioned, we have heat efficiency well above 99%. Actually, you can see that um, broken down into uh, layers and even the, the very precise map. By the way, if you would be looking at the map, um, the letter number corresponds to phi angle whether within those groups corresponds to layers and within the group you have um, the larger Z um, uh, when you go up. So we don't see any radiation effects on efficiency. Efficiency seems to be very stable in time. And just if you look at the map and you will see some sensors having lower efficiency, this actually comes from the production defects. Um, those sensors just have production defects. Um, which were known uh, upon installation already. Um, so let's also have a look on the signal to noise ratio. Um, so again, this is very well within our expectations. Um, we have 13 to 33 signal to noise ratio. And um, again, we see the difference depending on the incident angle as well as depending on the U and V site. Um, so let's also progress to our spatial resolution which i believe is one of very interesting feature of our features of our detector now contrary to what Swavomila was mentioning we don't look here at the beam spot size instead we look at the resolution of the detector itself so it's slightly different measurement um, but we also use time nuance here on in this investigation and we actually use in on unbiased tracks so uh, what we come up, uh, what comes out with our present um, present um, algorithms is 20 micrometers, which we are already happy with. But we also see uh, see the improvement room for improvements that are being worked on right now. That's being worked on right now. So let's also have a quick look on the time resolution. Um, this is not something that is usually mentioned when you look at the, this type of detectors. Um, I mean, this is mentioned, but not one of the uh, show off points, but we are very happy to have um, with our um, present um, chosen operation mode 2.35 nanoseconds um, time resolution. 
Now, this can be very useful if you look at um, occupancy and data quality when you're trying to reconstruct. I'm showing you here the histogram of times, and you can see two lines, blue and red. And in the blue is for all clusters we see. And so what's the time uh, of for all the clusters we see on the sensor? Whereas red is for those clusters that are having some tracks associated. So you can see that for those without the track associated, you see some structure um, in the negative times. And this comes from the previous event. Um, so this would be associated to the track from the previous event. The more events you are having, the more often they come, the more likely you are to have some previous events leaking into new events um, you are trying to analyze. And now what we are uh, investigating now to use our uh, marvelous time resolution is to reject those off time hits. Uh, actually, I, I should mention to you that we are right now using um, six data samples per one uh, trip per one event. We are investigating other options as well as we have some room for a configuration here. And those six samples right now are, um, are having interval of 31 nanoseconds. And analyzing those uh, those samples uh, gives us 2.35 nanoseconds. Um, yes, so let me just quickly summarize. I mean, there were years of, import in, of, of intense work in, in developing quite a few new technologies and, and tackling several challenges. And it gave us a very nice detector, which is running smoothly since one and a half years. We don't have any major problems with our detectors, a detector at all. Um, and we, are, we already have achieved a very nice resolution of 20 micrometers for spatial resolution and 2.35 nanoseconds of time resolution. We are very happy with our efficiency, which is well above 99%, but we still see room for improvement in how our software analyzes the data. So, so stay tuned for future conferences where we'll be showing off hopefully even nicer numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Zimon. So uh, we have some time for questions. Raise your hand if you're interested. Sorry, I would have maybe a question. Maybe you mentioned probably, but is it a digital or analog readout? Well, um, let me just go back to the slide about how we do the readout. Mm. Yes, here we are. So our sensor is connected to APV chips that are converting um, analog signals to time. And then we fit that to, uh, sorry, yes. And then we fit that to FADC, which is doing the uh, real digitalization um, for our sensors later on. Okay, so you are reading out the full waveform? We are reading out the waveform, yes. We are reading out six. Okay six samples from the waveform. We are also okay. investigating reading different number of samples from the waveform, but right now it's six. Uh, okay, and, and uh, what, what is like, uh, how to call it, uh, the charge, medium charge that you are reading out uh, for the MIP? Um, I don't remember it offhand, uh, off, off top of my head. So if you could please come back to me with that question and offline, I'll provide you with, with informed answer. Okay, I don't know something like a... 3.5 femtocoulomb or something like this? Mm, I might try to have a look on my notes because I don't remember that really. Uh, but okay, I, would, okay. I, I think it would be much more realistic if I tell you offline. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks. Because you, you have 300 micrometers thickness. Um, let me get back to the thicknesses. We have a slide on that here. Mm -hmm. So the thickness of the detector itself, yes, is 220 micrometers. Oh, okay, and, and this is fully depleted, I would expect. Um, I believe so, yes. <clears throat> okay. Okay, thanks. That, then I would expect something uh, around 3.5, something like maybe 4 femtocoulombs. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, we have to move to the next speaker. We thank Simon again. Thank you very much. And we move now to Ina Carli from the Chinese Academy of Science, who is going to talk to us about uh, the silicon strip tracking with the LHCB in the future. Hello. Yeah, okay. thank you. Uh, yeah. Can you see the slides? 
Yes, we do. Yes. Okay. So thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, now, between all the Bell 2, uh, I will jump back to CERN and to the LHCB uh, silicon strip tracking detector. Uh, we call it upstream tracker. Uh, so I'll present the current status and what we are building. Uh, so the LHCB detector uh, at the LHC is a single arm forward spectrometer. Uh, it's mostly focused on the precision, precision beauty and charm physics, uh, but we are also extending other interesting analysis. So QCD, direct searches for new particles, uh, fixed target physics, and so on. Uh, during the previous LHC runs, uh, we collected uh, about nine investment to one of data set. Uh, however, as you would see from some of the uh, presentations from, uh, from the LHCB, a lot of our measurements are statistically limited. That's why we decided to do a large upgrade and uh, a lot of changes to try to uh, collect larger data sets and also cleaner data sets with a uh, higher amount of the interesting rare decays. So uh, for the upgrade uh, from LHC, we are, request, we are going to request higher instantaneous luminosity. Uh, the LHCB is uh, usually running uh, so-called uh, at the constant luminosity. So we will have much higher, uh, it will be about five uh, visible collisions per bunch crossing. Uh, we are completely changing all electronics in, in the whole detector uh, and uh, it will allow us to uh, read out at uh, full, co uh, full collision frequency, so that's 40 megahertz. And we are also changing the trigger to software only. So we will be able to take all the data uh, and then have time to process them uh, with a high quality trigger, very similar to the, online to the offline selection and to the analysis. Uh, for detector, we are completely changing all tracking detectors. I will be speaking about the UT, so that's the tracker before magnet, but also uh, my colleagues already uh, on Tuesday, you heard uh, talk about Velo and uh, uh, about uh, Sci-Fi, uh, that's the tracker after magnet. And also this morning, you heard about other upgrades, for example, Reach uh, and uh, some small, uh, small other changes of the, uh, of the detector. So what's the role of the uh, UT? As I already mentioned, it's the tracker before magnet. Uh, so this greatly improves the PT resolution uh, if we would uh, compare to the tracking which would, uh, which would use only Bello and uh, the sci-fi after magnet. Uh, and also we can suppress the ghost tracks. Uh, the upgrade aim is to try to do all this while keeping the efficiency uh, and also to ideally speed up trigger and do other stuff. So the trigger speed up comes mostly from the fact that we can, uh, while matching the segments on the trigger, uh, we can use the UT hits. Uh, for example, if we take uh, tracks which are from Velo to UT, uh, we can remove the very low PT tracks uh, uh, and we are able to then uh, go on uh, tracking through the magnetic field uh, much, much less tracks. So this significantly speeds up uh, the trigger. Also, we can uh, make the uh, search window in the sci-fi uh, tightened. So you see here uh, on few plots the, uh, the performance. So in blue is tracking without the UT, uh, in green is with, uh, with the UT. So you see the efficiency more or less when we require the hits in UT uh, stay about the same, but the number of ghost tracks is significantly improved. Uh, in orange is the number of uh, expected collisions already. I mentioned five collisions per bunch crossing. So now how to build such a detector. Um, it's, about, it's going to be constructed from four detector planes. Uh, each of them is about two square meters. Uh, two of them, the first and last have uh, vertical strips and two will be rotated by plus and minus uh, five degrees. So sometimes we call it X, U, V, and X. Uh, this uh, comes from simulations from trying to have a good enough resolution, but also uh, from, from the occupancy. Uh, on the UT, we have a finer granularity than on the previous detector, TT, and also we are closer to the beam pipe, so we uh, increase the tracking coverage. So uh, the sensors already mentioned that it's uh, silicon strip sensors. Uh, most of the sensors would be called is type A, uh, so that's the ones in green. Uh, these are uh, standard strip sensor from Hamamatsu, PIN, and 320 uh, micron and the uh, sensors are about 10 by 10 centimeters. Uh, for the inner uh, regions, as there is much higher track coverage, we need something uh, which has finer segmentation, but also uh, which is more radiation hard. 
So we selected uh, sensors, which are NEP, uh, they're a bit thinner. And then uh, in pink, there are also sensors which have half length. Uh, so this will help us uh, with the occupancy. And also, as you see, we need to have a circular cutout around the beam pipe to be able to come uh, much closer to the beam. Uh, some of the features which are not usual for other detectors, uh, you see on this slide. So we have for the A uh, type sensors, which have larger pitch, uh, we have embedded uh, pitch adapters. Uh, we also have top side high voltage biasing because our sensors, as you will see, are, are glued on a support uh, stave and we have cutouts around the beam pipe. Uh, all these features were tested on the test beam. Uh, you see some of the results. These are for minis and uh, it's signal to noise ratio for various configuration. So you see that uh, uh, also the um, different colors are unirradiated nominal dose or the two times uh, expected dose. So you see that the signal to noise ratio is very good and we don't see basically uh, much difference if we do top side or back side biasing. So this worked very well. Uh, to read out the signals, we are going to use a custom developed uh, chip, we call it SALT. So this is 120 H channels uh, of uh, six bit ADC. Uh, as we have both PNN and NMP uh, sensors, we are going to be able to read out both positive and negative pulses. So uh, we have polarity is one of the bits uh, of the data we, we take. And uh, in total, there will be uh, nearly 4,200 chips. Uh, some uh, example of uh, what the chip does. So we have per channel trim and a pedestal correction. Uh, so here you see an example of, of the data uh, as how to read it. It's per one chip. So the uh, X axis is the number of strip or number of channel and the ABC value is on Y axis. So you see the raw data and then after the uh, baseline correction. Uh, the chips are able to do common, nose, uh, common mode noise correction over the whole chip. Uh, we also uh, are planning to use zero separation uh, of about maybe value in between two and four uh, ABC units. So then we will have uh, a rather low amount of data to read out. Uh, then from the sensors and chips, we are going to build modules uh, here you see one of the first modules uh, constructed. So we are using a hybrid circuit with four or eight chips, depending on the number of strips. Uh, and we put it on a stiffener or a support structure, which is under. Uh, you see just the white tabs from it. Uh, here, the hybrid and sensor are thermally decoupled. There is about one millimeter gap in between uh, to try not to heat up the sensors. Uh, in total, there are uh, 968 modules, uh, and these modules will be on support structures we call, uh, we call staves, uh, 68 staves. Uh, so stave is a low mass support structure, uh, basically from which uh, this is the basic uh, components we build the detector from. Uh, it, it has integrated titanium pipe, which is running right under the group of uh, chips, and this is to use uh, the CO2 cooling. Uh, it has also glued uh, captain tape for readout powering and grounding of the modules. And we are, uh, the overlap of sensors is in such a way that they completely cover. Uh, so uh, there's um, sensors both on both sides and they're interleaved. So here you see some of the designs and on the uh, next slide, you see uh, some of the first uh, production components, uh, how they look like. Uh, to read out these detectors, uh, we decided to put uh, uh, readout electronics quite close. So just above and under the, the staves, uh, we will have uh, data control boards. You will see in a while in, in the Kate. So these boards are uh, holding few chips, which are used for data formatting, uh, timing distribution controls, uh, and other functions. And we are using the GPT's uh, chipset developed by CERN. So you see here uh, one of the boards, which has seven uh, GPTX chips and one SCA chip, the, that's the black chip, which is used for uh, slow communication and, and controls of the, of the readout chips on the detector. Uh, each of these boards is then using four transceivers. You see on the left, that's the versatile link transceivers. So in, in total, there are eight optic fibers to read out this card. Uh, six of them are for readout of data and two are bidirectional for uh, controls and, and for trigger and for timing. So then these cards uh, come in a, what we call Pepe crate. Uh, so there will be nearly 250 boards above and uh, under the staves. So here you would imagine at the bottom there are staves. 
Then in blue, there are flex cables, which bring the signals to this big crate. And then we have the, uh, the data control boards uh, to power uh, the staves and to read out. Uh, then we are directly getting the, uh, the signals out uh, with optic fibers and to the surface um, computing center. Uh, what we did uh, already in the previous, uh, this year and last year, we performed uh, a lot of system tests. Uh, so here on the picture, you see, for example, a uh, stave with seven production quality modules here on the front uh, face. Uh, so this is using final version of powering and readout schemes uh, to be able to validate them. Uh, it, we also have a cooling power plant. So we tested uh, the components uh, in a wide range uh, of temperatures. We checked the performance, uh, long-term stability, and other, uh, other properties. So we are uh, quite sure by now that the detector works very well. Also, this setup allows us to do software development, to test the mounting procedures, and to try to debug the, the last few surprising things, uh, if we find any. Uh, some performance from the stave. Uh, what we found and what we measure is that the noise is very similar to the single module tests, uh, which proves that our powering and grounding uh, schemas are, uh, are well designed. And you see an example here of, uh, of the noise uh, measurement. Uh, this is for a, a sensor which is at 400 uh, volt bias. Uh, the depletion voltage is usually around 200 volts. So this is well depleted at five degrees Celsius. Uh, it's a bit warmer. We will be running around minus five degrees. And you see that the measure noise uh, is uh, around 0.88 uh, ADC counts. Uh, we know that the MIP signal uh, or when we do injection is about 13 counts. So signal to noise ratio is, is about uh, 15. And you see uh, with the channel ID, very nice flat distribution of the noise. Uh, so uh, what we are going and what we are working on uh, since a while and this year, uh, there is a lot of work with integration. So when we have these uh, nearly 70 states, uh, they need the box, they need uh, cooling pipes, uh, support structures, alignment, and so on. So all this is being designed and finalized. Uh, and around the box, uh, because uh, UT needs to be open, uh, because of the breakout of B-pipe or maybe for, uh, for fixes during uh, shutdowns. Uh, we need to have the box in two halves and we need to have flexible cable chain and all the powering, all the cables and so on. So all this is uh, prepared and being worked at. Uh, so what's the current status of the project? Uh, as other labs, uh, all our production sites were impacted by the lockdown, some of them uh, longer, some of them uh, sooner, some of them later, uh, but we are slowly coming back and the module and state production is uh, ramping up again. Uh, all the mechanics, cabling, cooling and uh, other stuff are being prepared at CERN, so this is on track and we are aiming for installation underground in the LHC to be covered uh, before fall next year, so just for the LHC uh, startup, hopefully. Uh, so that's uh, the status, thank you for your attention and I'm waiting for questions. Thank you, Ina, for the very nice presentation. So maybe to start the discussion, I have a few questions on your slide 11, mm -hmm. where you describe uh, the assembly of the, yes, of the um, detector with uh, all the other components. So uh, what's the thickness of these uh, Captain flexes that you that you are using? Uh, this is difficult. Uh, I don't have exact numbers, but if I remember well, it's, uh, maybe three, 400 microns, but of that, the copper is uh, around 100 microns. I can check exactly okay. the design document and also- oh, it's copper. Okay, next question. Okay. Uh, the, the, the lines are copper and we did a development with one German company, or well, started with a few companies. So this uh -huh. is made flexes for us. I can send you the details. Okay, thank you. Yes, I'm really interested. Mm. In yeah, this was uh, <laughs> difficult to design. I, I understand because we had similar <laughs> issues with yeah. this. And, and also about the, the support material, you mentioned uh, low mass. Is it carbon fiber? Uh, yes, it's honeycomb. Ah, it's honeycomb. Okay. 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 Then at the end of the stave, uh, it's not visible here, but there is some, uh, I think, epoxy uh, structure to kind of support it more. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions to Ina? Uh, yeah, maybe I, you know, I would like to ask, what is the reason why you are mainly using uh, P in N over N in P? 
just the price or is there some other? Uh, yes, it was for price and because uh, the radiation damage is not so much uh, in the LHCB mm -hmm. is very ununiform. So it's the highest uh, in the middle. Then the green sensors, they will see around 10 to 13, uh, maybe over their lifetime. So. Okay, one, one thing is, is, of course, radiation damage, but also the speed of the signal. So you are fine with the, let's say, uh, slower signal. Yes, uh, it's it's going to be, so uh, it's ADC, but we are going to sample uh, the signal. So if we have it well-timed, what we care about is the then the over uh, spill to the next punch crossing, and that is very low. So the chip okay, is rather and, fast. So you, you have, I, I explain, you have digital readout with some threshold. Uh, no, uh, so it's more complicated. We are uh, we are going to read out the ABC value, uh, but at the given time in the bunch crossing. Oh, okay. Okay, thanks. And this is going to be zero suppressed, but for tests we are able to run also non-zero suppressed. So I have actually in backup, it's a bit complicated. If you see on slide 22, it's some pulse shapes, but these are pulse shapes of all the uh, all the strips and on one chip, so it's 128 strips, and you see the one signal. Uh, but mm -hmm. this we take by literally scanning. So you change offset and you always uh, read out the ADC value. Okay, thank you. Hey, thank you. I think we need now to move to the next speaker. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you for the questions. Thank you very much. So we move to William Sutcliffe who's going to talk us uh, again about BEL2 status, status and future development of the full event interpretation algorithm. So we move to software. Can you see my the slides OK? Yes. Uh, can you make this full screen? Uh, so I made it full screen. Is it so does it not show full screen or? No, not yet. It's clearly visible, but if you manage. Does that work or? Well, to me, it seems always the same. I also had the problem with ocular in presentation mode. So maybe I just quickly try. Uh, if Are I... you sharing the application or the full screen? Because if you have a Mac and uh, you are sharing the application, it doesn't work sometimes. Uh, I don't have a Mac. That's a U. Can you see now? Or Now we just see you. We don't see any slides anymore. Uh, sure. But anyway, it was clear. So, even if, okay, let's see now. Uh, Try either one of those. No, no, this is not the presentation now. Does it work now? Yeah, perfectly. Okay. okay. The... Yeah, okay. So, hopefully, that works now. Okay, so uh, today, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Today, I'm going to be presenting full event interpretation, uh, which is the Bell 2 tech side reconstruction algorithm. So firstly, why do we need this algorithm? Well, it turns out that a lot of interesting physics can be obtained by measuring several challenging decay modes involving missing neutrinos. We see an example of this here on the, on the left, uh, where we have this decay B to lepton neutrino. So you only have one uh, track from the associated lepton to reconstruct this state, or even more challenging here on the right, uh, we've got uh, B to new new bar, so you have no particles to reconstruct this with. So we're effectively in this situation where we're blindfolded, and we'll see that full event interpretation really gives us a fighting chance to, to measure these modes. So now I just want to quickly introduce the, the concept of tag side reconstruction, and what we're really doing here is exploiting our unique to event topology in which we collide an electron with its antiparticle, the positron, to produce epsilon for S particles. Over 96% of the time, these decay onto B plus B minus or B not B not bar. So in tag side reconstruction, we reconstruct one of the, the B mesons uh, 
uh, in certain decay modes, so either hydronically or semi-leptonically. So hydronic is shown here. Now one can uh, uh, study the remaining B in the event decaying to a given signal side. So here's the signal side we saw earlier being a lepton and neutrino. By reconstructing the tag side, we've gained important constraints. For instance, here, the knowledge that we had a B plus tag implies that we have a B minus tag on the signal side. Also, we have the tag side uh, formentum, which combined with our E plus E minus formentum allows us basically to derive the neutrino formentum with this equation here. So now I just want to introduce uh, the, uh, the actual algorithm. So what the algorithm does is it, it employs over 200 BDTs, each char uh, charged with the task of identify or classifying particle decays that occur in uh, B meson decay chains. And in doing so, it's able to reconstruct over 10,000 unique uh, decay chains of B mesons. Here you see the hierarchy of the algorithm. So the algorithm actually starts from tracks and clusters in the event, assigning these to final state particles like electrons, pions, and photons, each with their own dedicated classifiers. Then it goes through several stages of reconstructing intermediate particles like J size, K shorts, D mesons, each again with classifiers for each decay mode. Finally, the algorithm goes on to reconstructing around 80 decay modes of B plus and B naught mesons, uh, again with their own dedicated classifiers. On the right here, you actually see the beam constrained mass distribution of uh, the B plus tag sides and B naught tag sides below in early data. And you see uh, different categories of decay modes. Uh, what you see here is actually that there's uh, the dominating modes are really D pi, D star pi, D n pi, and D star n pi. But there, there are several other categories. And actually recently, uh, modes with baryonic uh, with baryons were added into this hierarchy so with protons and lambda c's in their final states and you see the uh, contribution in light green here so now i want to talk a bit about the role of the uh, tag side uh, classifier uh, so what what this uh, actually does is discriminate between correctly reconstructed tag sides uh, from incorrectly reconstructed tag sides or background from uh, e plus E minus to Q Q bar, which we name continuum. In this plot below, you see a comparison of the shape of this classified distribution between simulation uh, and data. And what you see is to the far right at a, a classified value of one, which in the log of this variable is zero, uh, we get a peak from correctly reconstructed tag sites. By cutting on this variable, so here I, I show two selections, a looser selection and a, a tighter selection. Uh, and on the right, I show the corresponding uh, mis, uh, beam constrained mass distributions. And what you see is by cutting tighter on this variable, you're actually able to re remove a large amount of background, increasing your purity. But obviously you do suffer some loss in efficiency. One thing I also want to mention at this stage is uh, Quite a big caveat of the algorithm is that the efficiency of the algorithm differs significantly between simulation and data due to its complexity. As a result of this, the algorithm requires a careful calibration. So this can be done by measuring a well-known signal site. So uh, we've already done this actually using B to XL new decays given their large uh, branching fraction of 20%. The topology for this selection can be seen here in the diagram below. So we start by reconstructing a tag side heat, and here we've only done this hadronically. We require the beam constrained mass distribution to be above, uh, to have a value above 5.27 GV. Uh, we also cut on the tag side classifier, but we actually have several choices of cuts and derived calibration factors for each. For the signal side, we, we select an lepton using our lepton identification information we require that the momentum of the lepton is greater than one GV in the B rest frame. The calibration factor itself is defined here. So what we're doing is taking the amount of XL new decays observed in data, normalized to what is expected from simulation. We determine the number uh, that we observe in data by fitting the PL star distribution. So here you see fits to this distribution for B plus E minus, uh, B plus mu minus and the corresponding uh, channels for B naught mesons below. In these fits, you can see background from E plus 
E minus to QQ bar in red. Uh, we've got background, uh, background in orange where the leptons will be either state or from the secondary decay of D meson. And all the other components are contributing to XL nu. Here we're including DL nu, D star L nu, D star states, and other XCL nu states, and also XUL nu. The reason we can include actually XUL nu in this fit is you can see here, because if you go high in uh, PL star, the kinematic endpoint of XUL nu is actually a slightly higher than XCL nu. And it's very nice and in, in already in our data, we can see a contribution in data from XUL nu decays using our tagging. So here I, I summarize uh, our results for the calibration factors. So here, for instance, for this channel B plus E minus, you can see the calibration factors for the different choices of cuts on the classifier output. Uh, you can also comp compare the electron channel to the muon channel, and the results are consistent with uncertainties. And here you can just see the average. On the right here, you see the corresponding results for the, the B naught case. So here I ju I, I've just summarized actually the actual calibration results for B plus and, and B naught. In the table below, you see the sources of an uncertainty and percentage for the loose classifier cut choice uh, for the various channels. And uh, just to flag up here, the, the dominating uh, systematic uncertainty at the moment, it comes from the freedom of PDFs uh, in, the, in the PL star uh, fit. So we have some shape freedom in the, for those PDFs, and this is around 3%. The next leading systematic is from uh, the branching fractions of B0 and B plus the XL nu uh, uh, decays, which is around 2.1%. And then for muons, we have quite a, uh, we have a, a, an incentive of around 2.1% uh, from lepton IB. Here below, you can see the impact actually of applying the calibration factors. So what we show is the efficiency of the algorithm as determined in simulation, but corrected for by the calibration factors. And we plot this against purity. So each of the three cut choices correspond to one of these points going from a looser cut, which is lower purity, but a higher efficiency uh, to, a, to a higher purity when you cut tighter on the classifier, but a lower efficiency. And you see this trade-off for B plus in blue and B naught below. Now I want to, to talk about uh, some of the first analyses uh, searching for signal sides uh, with this tag side reconstruction algorithm. So what we've looked at is uh, uh, beta pi L nu here as a signal side, and also shown here below beta D star L nu, where the D star decays with a charged slow pion, a D naught, and the D naught goes to K uh, pion. In both of these cases, we can derive a missing mass squared variable which is actually just the square of the neutrino momentum we introduced earlier. And here on the, on the right, you can actually see the comparison between data and simulation for this missing mass squared variable for beta pi on you above and beta d star on you below. And here I should note the calibration factors are implied and we see quite a good agreement between data and Monte Carlo. One can go a step further and actually fit these distributions. And in doing so, one is able to measure the branching fractions for these two modes. So you see the beta pi on new branching fraction and beta d star on new branch fractions. These are consistent with world averages, but right now we do have quite large uncertainties. One thing I should note, it's very amazing that already in such a small amount of data, we can observe a mode like beta pi on new, which is, is actually quite rare. Uh, and we observe this with six uh, sigma significance. Also, we, you can see that these samples are very pure because of the fact that we use tagging, uh, especially this D style new peak, and we get a very nice uh, resolution already. So going forward to the future, uh, there's a number of developments in the pipeline. So one of these is that we've actually successfully applied the algorithm already to the upsilon five S resonance where one produces BS mesons. Uh, and this is, has been done using the Bell legacy data set, but hopefully Bell 2 will also have an upsilon 5S data set in the near future. We're also exploring deep uh, learning extensions of the algorithm. So here you can imagine feeding in all information from tracks and clusters in the event, such as their kinematics and particle identification, going through several hidden layers in order to predict something like the flavors of your B 
Maison and the form engine. We've also explored more exotic architectures like graph networks, given that they naturally suit particle decays where par particles can be labeled as nodes and mother-daughter relationships are edges in the graph. Going forward uh, to thinking about the full event interpretation in the near future, we can really look forward to the exciting physics results to come from the growing number of VTAGs. This can really be uh, illustrated here by looking in 2018 when we had 0 0.5 femtobarns of data and we had around 400 uh, charged uh, VTAGs observed peaking in MVC. And going forward to now at a similar level of purity with 35 femtobarn, we're seeing around 85,000. And hopefully this number will grow soon. So in conclusion, the full event interpretation is performing well in early Bell 2 data. A first calibration of the algorithm was performed with beta XL new decays. And you can see for a, a loose tag side classifier selection, the calibration factors for B plus and B naught. The, the decays beta pi L nu and beta d star of nu have been rediscovered with the algorithm and their branching fractions measured. And at the moment, we're exploring several deep learning extensions of the current algorithm, and we're looking forward to more physics with tagging to come soon. Thank you very much, William, for the nice presentation. Indeed, uh, really complex, uh, this, uh, this algorithm. It uh, must have taken a lot of time to get to the results. Uh, um, I don't know if there are other questions. Maybe I have one about the training of your algorithm. Are you training on, on, on simulations only or on data as well? Yeah, so it's, it's in, it's, the training is entirely on simulation and that's in part why we have to have this uh, calibration, why it's so essential because we have so many classifiers uh, that essentially you're, you're bound to get mismatches because you can imagine all the different features that go in there. There's gonna be different differences in data and simulation. Uh, and yeah, the, the training process is also, as you say, it's quite complicated. Uh, generally takes around five days running on 2000 nodes. So I can imagine, yeah. We produce essentially all the training data sets for these different uh, sub modes and train them all. Okay, thank you. So if there are no other questions, uh, we thank you again. Thank you very much. And uh, we move to the next speaker. Again, from Bell 2, we have Laura Zani, who is going to talk us about track reconstruction efficiency using E plus minus events. Hello, everybody. Can you continue? You can see my slides and hear me well? Y yes. Okay. We see and we can hear you. Okay, perfect. So, um, hello. This is Laura Zani from Marseille on behalf of the Bell2 collaboration. And in this presentation, I would like to talk about the track reconstruction efficiency measurement, uh, which exploits the E plus and minus annihilation into tau pairs at Bell2. So briefly, this is the outline of my talk. I will first give you the motivation for this kind of measurement and introduce you the experimental context before going to the details of the analysis strategy. And I will explain how we select the event and suppress the background, how this compares to simulation and the calibration procedure we devised before giving you the results. So let me start here with this uh, statement that uh, um, the track reconstruction efficiency for belt of physics is a real key performance driver. And the reason is simple. Uh, it's because our real detector is different from what we simulated. So the goal here is to measure the track reconstruction efficiency on both data and simulation and quantify the discrepancy this delta star here. And based on this measurement, we want to assess the systematic uncertainty which we have to assign in every physics analysis related to the track performance. So the key quantity we, um, we are going to measure here is this discrepancy delta star, which is defined as one minus the ratio of the efficiency on data and on simulation. And before going on, let me very briefly recap about, about Bell 2 physics. We have heard already in this session. So let me just say that Bell 2 belongs to the B factory families. Um, family which uh, are dedicated experiment at the plus and minus asymmetric energy colliders was a center of mass energy is tuned at the Y4S 10.58 uh, GD. 
which mainly decays into BB bar pairs, but actually at the same center of mass energy, we also have comparable production cross section for CC bar and tau pairs. So um, the advantage here we, um, with respect to Hadron Collider um, are many. First of all, uh, let, me, let me mention that we can build a metric detector with excellent fit capability and especially the possibility to have high efficiency for neutral reconstruction and to close the kinematic of an event and therefore dealing with missing energy final state. So the future of B factory now belongs to the Super CACB Collider, which is the major upgrade of CACB, as we have already heard in the previous talks. So it's installed at CAC laboratory in Tsukuba, Japan, and it will provide the world highest luminosity by applying the large crossing angle nanobeam scheme technique which is uh, um, sketched here in this drawing. So the, uh, the goal is to squeeze the vertical sides of the beam and interaction point by reducing of a factor of 20, uh, what is called the vertical beta function, this beta y star. And at the same time, we will double the beam currents. So these two parameters, as you can see from the um, bottom left formula, are the main handles to increase luminosity. Uh, and super cat B will reach uh, 30 times the cat B uh, uh, peak luminosity, which means uh, six times 10 to the 35 per centimeter square per second. And I think this plot has already been shown today, this session. So this is the uh, breaking news from last June 24th, when we over to the um, world uh, um, luminosity record uh, and uh, um, we reached 2.4 times 10 to the 44 per centimeter square per second of instantaneous luminosity. So let me come back now to the belt to detector. Here's a sketch of our detector, which has a cylindrical symmetry around the interaction point uh, where it is installed at belt two, uh, at uh, super CACP collider. And uh, it partially reuses uh, uh, parts of the bell detector, but it has been upgraded to cope with higher backgrounds and ensuring at the same time, excellent performances. So from the inside to the outside, we have a completely new vertex detector, which is based on two layers of uh, uh, silicon pixel detectors, only one fully installed. The second one is going to be uh, finalized next year. And then four layers of silicon strip det detectors. And together with the central drift chamber, the CDC, they provide the tracking volume for the belt to detector. Then we have devices which exploit the principle of uh, uh, charging of light detection in the barrel and end cap region for particle identification. And then for the identification of electrons, photons, and neutrons, we um, use the electromagnetic color emitter, this ECL. And outside the return yoke for the superconducting magnet, we have the outermost sub detector, the K long and muon detector. As you can see from the uh, left plot here, uh, from the integrated uh, luminosity curves. So in red is shown the total integrated luminosity, which we collected since the beginning of phase three last March, 2019. And now we achieved uh, uh, more than 74 inverse pentoban of data with the final goal at the end of phase three to collect 50 times the data set that was collected by Bell, which means 50 inverse aptoban of data. And now let me come back to the um, strategy for this measurement. So the idea is to exploit the tag and prop method, which targets the um, E plus E minus annihilation in the tau pair, where one tau decays leptonically and the other one decays electronically to three charged pions. So according to the geometry of the charge tracks in the final state, as you can see from this drawing, we refer to this event as the three by one prong event, since we have three charge in one hemisphere and just one charge tracks in the opposite one. And the idea is to reconstruct these events by tagging just uh, uh, three out of four tracks that we expect in the final state with a total charge equal to plus minus one. And then because of charge conservation, the fourth track, which is our probe in blue here in the, in the drawing has to be there. So we count the number of events where the fourth track is found and they belong to the the, the N4 category, and uh, the events where we cannot find the uh, probe track, um, we assign them to the N3 category. And then we compute the uh, track reconstruction efficiency convoluted with the acceptance of our detector as the ratio of the event where the probe track uh, is found, N4, to the total number of uh, um, reconstructed events. For this measurement, we exploited uh, the full 2019 data sets, which means an integrated luminosity of 8.8 .8 inverse pentobarn and the equivalent of uh, 100 inverse pentobarn of um, Monte Carlo simulation 
officially produced. And for the signal sample, we simulated tau pairs event for backgrounds, mainly plus and minus annihilation into uh, QQ bar pairs and low multiplicity events, um, which means um, radiative by lepton and four lepton final states. And let me uh, remark here that despite this is a low multiplicity event, actually it's really boosted in, uh, um, in our detector and it deals with the high uh, density of trucks. So it's quite challenging for the trucking. And also it allows to investigate a um, wide uh, medium momentum range between 0.2 and 3.5 GB over C. And again, if we consider the production cross-section for tau pairs at Y4S, which is almost one nanobar, and we multiply by the useful branching fraction to obtain the desired topology and for the integrated luminosity available from 2019 data, we end up with quite a, a large statistics for this measurement. So more than 1.2 million events. And let's see how we select the event here. So first of all, we require on data that ECL triggers are fired and we do not use any trigger uh, fired by the uh, tracking devices in order not to bias our measurement. Then we define our track selection thanks to four different track lists, which all start from the good quality tracks, which are coming from the interaction point. Then on the loose final list, where we look for the probe, we do not apply any further selection not to bias the, the measurement of the efficiency. Instead, we tighten the selection on the uh, other track list. And specifically, we define the tight pions list, um, which is a subset of the loose pions. And then on the leptonic track in the opposite hemisphere, we apply particle identification selection to distinguish between the muon and electron channel, which are made orthogonal thanks to this selection. And the event is finally selected by constraining the number of candidates per each track, but not the total track in the event in order not to lose statistic. Again, we can have also two different charges for the, uh, our samples according to the relative sign of the charge of the tag pions here. We can have, have opposite sign samples and same sign samples. And now let's see how we suppress the background. So first of all, we explore our topology and we require an angular isolation for each of the uh, um, tag in the three prong hemisphere to be larger than 120 degree with respect to the um, one prong track in the opposite hemisphere. And also we require a good uh, results of the fit to the vertex of the two tag pions here displayed in, uh, in yellow. And then we reject uh, the radiative QED contamination and uh, also the uh, continuum QQ bar background by requiring that the transverse momentum of the one prong track is within 20 and 80% of the uh, beam energy. And also we require a minimum opening angle between the two tag pions in order to reject relative VAB events, which are much more jet-like and squeezed, and we constrain the number of neutral pions and photons in the event. Finally, the last selection is applied to the invariant mass of the uh, three tag drugs um, candidates. And also, uh, since we observe some contamination uh, from two photons events, which are not simulated in our Monte Carlo samples, we devise a specific data-driven veto for uh, the electron channel, just for opposite sign uh, charges. Uh, since uh, these kind of events can mimic our signal topology when one of the two electron in the final state is out of acceptance and the virtual photon here decays to electron pair. So let me show you now the comparison between data, black dots in these uh, uh, plots and uh, uh, simulation represented by the uh, color stack histograms, which is scaled to data luminosity, 8.18 inverse femtobarn, and weighted bin by bin for the measured trigger efficiency on data. And for more details uh, about this measurement, you have some uh, uh, information in the backup, but you can also have a look at yesterday's talk from uh, Peter Rados. And uh, you can see in the lower panels here, that uh, our agreement is very nice and the data to Monte Carlo ratio is consistently within uncertainty uh, um, um, picking at one. So before giving you the results, let me mention our calibration procedure to calibrate uh, the estimator of our discrepancy to represent the true value of the difference we want to measure. So we fully exploit uh, our simulation here and we modify the signal samples, so the tau pair uh, event samples by introducing a known per track inefficiency. And we do this for different inefficiency points. 
Then we apply exactly the same analysis chain and we uh, reconstruct the discrepancy with our estimator, this uh, um, delta measured uh, plotted on the y-axis as a function of the uh, known um, artificial inefficiency, which is introduced in the Monte Carlo sample. And by fitting the slope of these curves, we extract this calibration K factor that are shown here in this uh, top right box uh, are used for calibrating uh, the discrepancy estimator. And now let me show you the results. So what is shown in these plots, respectively on the left as a function of the one prong transverse momentum and on the right as a function of its azimuthal angle are the reconstruction track reconstruction efficiency convoluted with the detector acceptance um, in blue for data and in orange for uh, the um, simulation. And data yields have been subtracted by the remaining background, which is estimated from simulation. And again, this estimator plotted on the y-axis comes from the uh, ratio we defined previously. And in the lower panels, you have the uh, distribution for the calibrated discrepancy as a, a function of these two kin kinematic variables. So now let me summarize the results for the calibrated discrepancy, uh, which are plotted here in this, uh, in this uh, uh, plot on the right. So you have uh, the discrepancy measured for different channels and uh, uh, charge samples for different data taking periods of 2019 uh, data set. And finally, the last four entries of this plot show you the um, combined results on all the um, samples, charges, and on all data set periods. And uh, here the systematic uncertainties are taken into account and the dominating contribution comes from the charge dependence. Um, and this is expected to be largely improved when uh, we will uh, measure the charge asymmetry effect on the tracking performance. So this is a measurement that we already plan to do, and we expect to further reduce the systematic uncertainty, which is now uh, dominated by this effect. So here you have the final results on, for the overall calibrated discrepancy, which is measured to be 0.28%. And you see here the dominating uncertainty is the systematic one coming from this uh, uh, charge asymmetry effect. And before concluding, let me just mention another measurement we were able to perform on Bell 2019 data exploiting a similar technique, which is the measurement of the fake rate uh, for which we mean the probability to reconstruct a fake track, which uh, come, may come from the uh, combina random combination of mainly beam induced uh, background hits, but also from low momentum particles that curl inside the detector without pin merge. It's what we call the clone tracks. Here uh, we exploit the um, similar tag and probe technique, but we fully reconstruct a three by one prong event by asking for four charge tracks in the event. And then we look for the fifth one that has to be a fake since it doesn't conserve charge. And uh, mm, again, we count the events where we find the fifth track and the events where the fifth track is not found. And then we compute the fake rate as the ratio of the N5 events to the total reconstructed uh, events. In this case, since we can reconstruct the full event, we can exploit event shape variables to improve signal purity, which is measured on simulation and used to scale data yields before computing this uh, um, fake rate, which is measured to be 0.97%. And here the uh, uncertainty is just statistical since we just started to evaluate the systematic uncertainty for this measurement. And this brings me already to my conclusion. So let me uh, summarize, summarize here that uh, uh, Bell 2 uh, was successfully taking data since the beginning of phase three and during all the 2020 run periods. So on the almost nine inverse pentagon of data that we collected during 2019, we were able to devise a strategy to measure the track reconstruction efficiency convoluted with the acceptance of the detector by analyzing the three by one prong tau pair decays. And based on this uh, uh, measured discrepancy, we could uh, um, provide analyst prescription on how to assess systematic uncertainties for their analysis for um, tracks dealing with transverse momentum in the range between 0.2 and 3.5 GV over C. And uh, um, with uh, an analog technique, uh, we could also measure the fake rate in the two data, which is uh, uh, found to be consistent with what we expected from our simulation. So that's basically all I wanted to tell you and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Laura, for uh, the very clear presentation. I'm afraid that we are running out of time. So is there quick questions to, to Laura? 
So maybe I have one in slide 13. I've seen about your systematics that combining the samples, you can already reduce these systematic effects a little bit. Yeah, that's true. And another in from the fact that the systematic is uh, mainly dominated by the, this charge dependence. So when we combine all the samples, we are somehow also average on this effect, which is mitigated then. Ah, okay. I see. Mm, any other comment uh, or, uh, or questions? So if not, thank you, Laura, again. And uh, now we come to our last talk of this session, it's, uh, Cyril Pras from DAISY, about the Be Light Lifetimes, uh, again at Bell 2. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, and we also can see you. Right, uh, sharing the slides. Sorry. Yes, do you see the slides? Yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, I'm here today to talk to you about a measurement of the Vmeson lifetime at Bell 2. Most of the things that I will cover today are summarized in our conference note that you can uh, uh, find on uh, archive. So after a short introduction, I will explain you the measurement strategy that we used and then the different components that enter into our probability density model. A quick note on the systematic studies and finally the results that we obtained. So sorry if I repeat uh, some information already uh, uh, said by the, by the previous speakers, but in case the people are joining now, so the Bell 2 detector is uh, located along the the super KP accelerator, which is a E plus E minus collider working at an energy of 10.6 GeV, which is close to the mass of the Epsilon 4S resonance. And we use this resonance because we know that it decays nearly all the time in a pair of V mesons. That's the reason why we call this a, a B factory. And you can see here the, the road map um, for, the, for, the next, uh, for the next years, and we, we still, uh, uh, with, our goal is still to, to reach an integrated luminosity of about 50 inverse Antoban by the beginning of next decade. So here you have a side view of the, the Bell 2 detector and for, for the measurement that, uh, that I present today, the tracking system is uh, absolutely crucial. So it's made of a vertex detector and uh, a drift chamber, the, the, the CDC, and the vertex detector is made of two layers of uh, silicon pixel uh, detectors and four layers here uh, the SVD of uh, silicon strip detectors. And as already mentioned, the, the second layer of the PXD is not yet fully installed, but uh, it will be around uh, 2022. And um, around that, we have uh, one calorimeter and uh, a few modules for particular identification. So for this measurement, we used the 2019 Bell 2 data. Uh, so an integrated luminosity of 8.7 inverse Amtoban. And one important note for, for, for this study is that Bell 2 has a smaller boost uh, compared to, to Bell. Uh, so we have to compensate. Uh, so the boost of Bell 2 is about 0.28 to be compared with 0.42 for Bell. We compensate with a better impact parameter resolution of about a fact, uh, factor of about 1.5 to 2, thanks to the, this uh, pixel detector. And of course, a good vertex separation is crucial for this kind of uh, studies. If you, if you are interested in the CP violation results, please have a look at uh, the presentation by Nick Harharut uh, at the following link. And just to illustrate the, the capabilities of the, of, the, of the Bell 2 tracking, here you see a measurement of the X sites of the beam spot. This is given in uh, micrometers as a function of the run number. So in red, you have uh, what, we can, um, what we have from the machine parameters or so from the beam optics. And in black, you have a measurement uh, made from the, from the tracking system of Bell 2. And you can see that we can, uh, that we can really measure these uh, beam spots sites only uh, with the, tr uh, the tracking uh, of Bell 2. So to enter in more details of the measurement strategy, um, we reconstruct uh, the hadronic decays of uh, B0 uh, meson, the, the signal side here, uh, we call it like this. 
And the other B uh, vertex is reconstructed from the remaining tracks in the event. So here called the rest of event tracks. And we use the fact that the B mesons are produced nearly at rest in the epsilon 4s frame because of their mass. So we can neglect the, the flight distance and estimate the, the decay time difference from the vertex separation that we measure here and correcting for the boost. And to give you an idea, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, delta Z is of the order of uh, 100 micrometers. And then uh, a naive model for this uh, decay time difference is simply given by taking the joint probability. Uh, and this would be a function uh, without taking into account the resolution of the detector. Here I'm listing the different decays that uh, we reconstruct. So it's B2D uh, plus hadron, and then also the list of the D uh, decays that uh, we reconstruct. And uh, for the constraints that, uh, that we impose, we use uh, two very nice variables that, uh, that we have at Bell2 because of our knowledge of the, of the full events. So you have the beam constraint mass, which is built from the, the energy of the beam and the momentum of the beam meson, and the energy difference between the energy of the beam meson and the energy of the beam in the center of mass frame. So here I'm showing the, um, the probability density model that we use for this uh, decay time difference. Uh, so it's made of three components, the signal, uh, which is simply uh, our uh, naive model convoluted with uh, a resolution uh, density, resolution density that is taken to be the sum of three Gaussians. Then we have the B background density, so other uh, B meson uh, decays that are wrongly reconstructed. So we take the same uh, functional as uh, the one for the signal, but this time instead of the decay time of uh, the, 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 the lifetime of the B meson, we, we, we take an effective lifetime uh, for these uh, B mesons. And finally, a continuum density is uh, continuum density that is again taken as uh, the sum of uh, three Gaussians. So in the next slide, uh, I will show you how we extract the different parameters that enter into this uh, function. So to extract the yields, we do a 2D um, fit on the unbeam uh, beam, uh, beam constraint mass and uh, this energy difference that you can see here for, for, for data. And uh, from this uh, 2D fit, we can extract number of signal, BB bar, and continuum, continuum events. Then for the continuum shape, we uh, look into the sidebands uh, of uh, our sideband events that are defined with respect to, uh, to uh, the beam construct mass and the energy difference. Here you can see the uh, this, uh, this time difference uh, in simulation and in data. And here uh, we extract most of the parameters from, uh, from simulation, but to take into account a difference between simulation and data, the, the common mean and, uh, and variance are taken from, uh, from data. For the resolution this time, uh, we, we look into the delta T residual. So what we do is that we compare the time difference uh, after reconstruction in simulation with the true time difference that we know because uh, its simulation. And from that, we can extract the resolution uh, parameters. And so once the resolution function is uh, fixed, then we can uh, measure the effective lifetime for, for the BB bar uh, background. Sorry. Um, yeah. After that, uh, we have, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I'm listing here the, the list of the sources of systematic uncertainties that are uh, considered. So we expect, of course, uh, uh, some systematic from the fit parametrization. So we, we reproduce the fit on 10,000 simulated bootstrap samples, which uh, gave us a systematic of about 0.05 picoseconds. Also, we checked what happens when this effective lifetime is left free. And finally, in data, we, we rely on calibration and alignment constants so we reproduce the full study on a subsample uh, to, to, to check the, the difference with a different uh, calibration and alignment constants. Um, so at the end, uh, taking all of this into account, we can fit this uh, time difference for all the B to D hadron of the selected decay candidates. So you can see here, actually it's the same plot once in a log scale and once in a linear scale. 
And in this fit, uh, the only uh, three parameters are the lifetime of the B-meson and the domain mean and variance of the resolution function. And this is the results that, uh, that we obtained, 1.48 picoseconds. And you can see here that uh, given the, the, the sample that we used, we are highly dominated by the statistical uncertainty. So as a conclusion, uh, we measured the B0 uh, lifetime with the PEL2 data, giving this result, which is uh, in good agreement with the world average. Of course, for now, we, we are still dominated by the statistic uh, uncertainty, but uh, this measurement assesses the accuracy of the text fitting tools, time resolution modeling, and detector al alignment uh, at PEL2, because of course, if you don't control your alignment, you have no chance to, to measure such uh, such a quantity. And once again, the conference note is available uh, online. And I would highly recommend you, if it's not uh, done, to have a look at uh, a talk by Julia uh, on, the, on a D0 lifetime measurement, uh, which was done with a larger data sample and found that time resolution uh, two times better than what was observed at Bell and Baba. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cyril, for this nice presentation. So are there questions uh, to Cyril? If, it, if not, so maybe I can, I can ask you about your slide 10. Yes. Where you were talking about the extraction of uh, the parameters. Mm -hmm. And some come from simulation, come some from, from data. So could you, maybe you mentioned, but I missed, uh, uh, is use of data uh, for, for extracting parameters limited by statistics, essentially? Or if there is another reason why you don't extract all the, the parameters from the data? Oh, yeah, actually, uh, so actually, you can already see on, on this plot that uh, the, the statistic, uh, uh, here we are, we are really uh, dominated by, by, by the statistic. I <laughs> guess that with a larger sample, we could be more uh, precise in our choices. Uh, okay. yeah. And yeah, yeah, that, that was my guess. So yeah, yeah, I was right. Okay. Any other question to, to Cyril? So if not, we thank you for the nice presentation and we thank uh, all the speakers of, of the session, of today's session. And uh, we close now because uh, the post session is going to start uh, immediately after this one. So I let Giri comment uh, on the timing. I don't know if we have five minutes uh, of stop yeah. between the two. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this very nice session. It was a dense program, but wonderful presentations. Thanks. Thanks also, Stefania, for very nice sharing. Good work. OK, I think that now uh, we should uh, almost immediately start with the posters. But I think that, uh, let's say, five minutes as a break uh, would be nice. So let's say that we can start in uh, 1 150 PM Prague time which is like in six minutes. I think that the posters will be presented in this uh, Zoom meeting room. Uh, so, uh, but now I would like to ask the Martin, who is the Zoom technical assistant, how it will be with the recording, because now uh, the recording should be stopped. And- uh, Yeah, I, I, will, be... I will stop the recording and uh, we will change with uh, wow. another person, uh, another chair of this okay. session. So I need- this this five minutes for for uh, the conversion to of the recording. Okay, but my question is: uh, yeah. should, do, do, it, when you will leave the meeting, uh, the conversion will start, so we can stay in the meeting. Yeah, you yeah, go. yeah. You can yeah? stay. Okay, perfect. So yeah, it is not necessary to go anywhere. Uh, everybody is of course certainly invited for to this uh, poster session. Uh, more people, of course, better discussion. So. Please stay here.